You might have heard of several cyber attack cases where companies have lost their crucial data, money, reputation, and customer trust. These attacks are carried out by hackers who exploit weaknesses in a computer network to gain unauthorized access to vital information. However, hacking is not always bad, as there are hackers who work with different motives. White hat hackers, also known as ethical hackers, hack with permission to defend an organization. This form of hacking is legal, it is known as ethical hacking. Ethical hacking is distributed into six different phases. The first phase is reconnaissance, where you collect all the required information. Next is the scanning phase, where you try to spot any system vulnerability. Following this is the gaining access phase, where the spotted vulnerabilities are exploited. In the next stage, known as maintaining access, you try to maintain your access for future attacks by installing backdoors. The fifth phase is clearing tracks, where you clear all the evidence of the hack, and finally, in the reporting phase, you document the summary of the entire attack. There is and there will always be high demand for ethical hackers who can safeguard organizations from cyber attacks. So what are you waiting for? Get certified with Simply Learn and become an ethical hacker and put an end to the cyber attacks in the world. This was ethical hacking in short. When most people hear the expression hacking, they see someone attacking their computer with a virus, crashing a network and stealing money, or enslaving a firm with ransomware. Most people are unaware that ethical hackers are paid to think like a hacker or bad actors. They methodically explore a company's system for flaws and bring them to the notice of the management before the bad actors use them. Ethical hacking is an investment that modern businesses cannot afford to ignore. Hackers will spend countless hours understanding every bit and byte to circumvent and breach systems. They become specialists in the business systems, gathering all the information they can discover and utilizing all they learn to construct a complex assault based on a series of activities. These activities then inflict significant harm to the company's systems and overall organizations. All of these acts cannot be replicated by automated technologies on their own. In contrast to humans who can watch, recognize, learn and adjust, an automated forensics tool cannot discover a scenario that it has not been designed to locate. This makes the ethical hacking industry an absolute necessity. Today we are going to take you through the field of ethical hacking, teaching the inside out mechanism of this profession. We start by learning about the basics of ethical hacking and the multiple applications of penetration testing in the IT sector. We take a look at the most infamous hacks and hackers that made headlines on a global scale due to their criminal activities in the cyber world. Next, we learn about the best tools and programming languages being used by professional ethical hackers on a daily basis. These are the same tools being used by the malicious actors when trying to breach confidential barriers and firewalls. Moving on, we read about a couple of operating systems that are catered specifically to ethical hackers or penetration testers. Linux-based distributions by nature, these operating systems come with all major ethical hacking tools and scripts pre-installed, making everyday work easier for the professionals. In the next section, we learn about the most well-known cyber attacks like ransomware and DDoS attack being employed on a daily basis by malicious hackers. These attacks affect the general consumer in order to steal private information. To battle these threats, we are going to have a look at some tools which can do the same for users like VPNs and the Tor network. Finally, we go over the multiple roles in a cybersecurity team and some popular certifications along with the relevant study materials with regards to beginners in ethical hacking. We humans are highly tech savvy in today's times. With the extensive use of the internet and modern technologies, there is a massive challenge in protecting all our digital data, such as net banking information, account credentials, and medical reports, to name a few. Have you heard about the deadly WannaCry ransomware attack? The attack happened in May 2017 in Asia, and then it spread across the world. Within a day, more than 230,000 computers were infected across 150 countries. The WannaCry crypto worm encrypted the data and locked the users out of their systems. For decryption of the data, the users were asked for a ransom of $300 to $600 in Bitcoin. 
The users who used the unsupported version of Microsoft Windows and those who hadn't installed the security update of April 2017 were targeted in this attack. The WannaCry attack took a toll on every sector. Top-tier organizations like Hitachi, Nissan, and FedEx had to put their businesses on hold as their systems were affected too. Now, this is what you call a cyber attack. To prevent such attacks, cybersecurity is implemented. We can define cybersecurity as the practice of protecting networks, programs, computer systems, and their components from unauthorized digital attacks. These illegal attacks are often referred to as hacking. Hacking refers to exploiting weaknesses in a computer network to obtain unauthorized access to information. A hacker is a person who tries to hack into computer systems. This is a misconception that hacking is always wrong. There are hackers who work with different motives. Let's have a look at three different types of hackers. Black hat hackers are individuals who illegally hack into a system for a monetary gain. On the contrary, we have white hat hackers who exploit the vulnerabilities in a system by hacking into it with permission in order to defend the organization. This form of hacking is absolutely legal and ethical. Hence, they are also often referred to as ethical hackers. In addition to these hackers, we also have the gray hat hackers. As the name suggests, the color gray is a blend of both white and black. These hackers discover vulnerabilities in a system and report it to the system's owner, which is a good act. But they do this without seeking the owner's approval. Sometimes gray hat hackers also ask for money in return for the spotted vulnerabilities. Now that you have seen the different types of hackers, let's understand more about the hacking that is legal and valid, ethical hacking, through an interesting story. Dan runs a trading company. He does online training with the money his customers invest. Everything was going well and Dan's business was booming until a hacker decided to hack the company's servers. The hacker stole the credentials of various trading accounts. He asked for a lump sum ransom in exchange for the stolen credentials. Dan took the hacker's words lightly and didn't pay the hacker. As a result, the hacker withdrew money from various customers' accounts and Dan was liable to pay back the customers. Dan lost a lot of money and also the trust of his customers. After this incident, Dan gave a lot of thought as to what could have gone wrong with the security infrastructure in his company. He wished there was someone from his company who could have run a test attack to see how vulnerable his systems were before the hacker penetrated into the network. This was when he realized he needed an employee who thinks like a hacker and identifies the vulnerabilities in his network before an outsider does. To do this job, he hired an ethical hacker, John. John was a skilled professional who worked precisely like a hacker. In no time, he spotted several vulnerabilities in Dan's organization and closed all the loopholes. Hiring an ethical hacker helped Dan protect his customers from further attacks in the future. This, in turn, increased the company's productivity and guarded the company's reputation. So, now you know hacking is not always bad. John, in this scenario, exposed the vulnerabilities in the existing network, and such hacking is known as ethical hacking. Ethical hacking is distributed into six different phases. Let us look at these phases step by step with respect to how John, our ethical hacker, will act. Before launching an attack, the first step John takes is to gather all the necessary information about the organization's system that he intends to attack. This step is called reconnaissance. He uses tools like Nmap and HPing for this purpose. John then tries to spot the vulnerabilities, if any, in the target system using tools like Nmap and Nexpos. This is the scanning phase. Now that he has located the vulnerabilities, he then tries to exploit them. This step is known as gaining access. After John makes his way through the organization's networks, he tries to maintain his access for future attacks by installing back doors in the target system. The Metasploit tool helps him with this. This phase is called maintaining access. John is a brilliant hacker. Hence, he tries his best not to leave any evidence of his attack. This is the fifth phase, clearing tracks. We now have the last phase that is reporting. In this phase, John documents a summary of his entire attack, the vulnerabilities he spotted, the tools he used, and the success rate of the attack. Looking into the report, 
Dan is now able to take a call and see how to protect his organization from any external cyber attacks. Don't you all think John is an asset to any organization? If you want to become an ethical hacker like John, then there are a few skills that you need to acquire. First and foremost, you need to have a good knowledge of operating environments such as Windows, Linux, Unix, and Macintosh. You must have reasonably good knowledge of programming languages such as HTML, PHP, Python, SQL, and JavaScript. Networking is the base of ethical hacking, hence you should be good at it. Ethical hackers should be well aware of security laws so that they don't misuse their skills. Finally, you must have a global certification on ethical hacking to successfully bag a position of an ethical hacker like John. Few examples of ethical hacking certification are Certified Ethical Hacker Certification CEH, CompTIA Pentest Plus, and Licensed Penetration Tester Certification, to name a few. Simply Learn provides a cybersecurity expert master's program that will equip you with all the skills required by a cybersecurity expert. You could have a look at it by clicking the link in the description. So, here's a question for you. In which phase of ethical hacking will you install backdoors in the target system? A. Scanning B. Maintaining access C. Clearing tracks D. Reconnaissance Give it a thought and leave your answers in the comments section below. The endless growth of technologies in this area is directly proportional to the number of cyber crimes. Cyber crimes are estimated to cost $6 trillion in 2021. Hence, to tackle these cyber crimes, organizations are continuously on the lookout for cybersecurity professionals. The average annual salary of a certified ethical hacker is $91,000 in the US and approximately rupees 7 lakhs in India. So, what are you waiting for? Get certified and become an ethical hacker like John and put an end to the cyber attacks in the world. Computers have made our lives more effortless than ever. However, computer viruses have been trouble since day one. On that note, hey guys, welcome to yet another exciting video by Simply Learn. This video brings you the top six most dangerous computer viruses of all time. But before we begin, if you're new here and haven't subscribed already, make sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon for interesting tech videos every day. So moving on, here's a list of the most dangerous computer virus. Let's see what we have at number one. At number one, we have MyDoom. MyDoom was one of the worst computer virus outbreaks in history in 2004. This malware is technically a worm spread by mass emailing. It broke previous marks set by the So Big Worm and I Love You to become the fastest spreading email worm ever. Email spammers appear to have hired MyDoom to spread spam via compromised PCs. Users will open an attachment named Mail Transaction Failed that will be sent to the victim. Its objective was to take down popular websites like Google and Lycos. MyDoom caused estimated damage of $38 billion in 2004, but its inflation adjusted cost is $52.2 billion. US dollars. By that figure, MyDoom has taken on a life of its own, infecting enough poorly protected machines to send 1.2 billion copies of itself per year, 16 years after its creation. MyDoom, one of the most widely distributed viruses, infected one out of every 12 emails at its height. MyDoom hit companies like Google, SEO Group, and Microsoft with a distributed denial of service attack. In 2004, 16 to 25 percent of all emails had been infected by MyDoom. On that note, here's a question for you. Which is the latest deadly computer virus you have heard of? Do let us know in the comment section below. At number 2, we have I Love You. The I Love You virus of 2000 spread by delivering a fake love letter that appeared to be a harmless text file. This attacker, like MyDoom, sends copies of itself to all of the email addresses on the infected machine's contact list. It had spread to over 10 million PCs within a few days after its May 4 release. Arnold D. Guzman, a college student from the Philippines, invented the virus. He created the virus to collect credentials to log into internet sites he wanted to utilize for free since he was short on cash. According to reports, he had no clue how far his work would travel. Love Letter is another name for this virus. At number 3 on the list of dangerous computer viruses, we have Code Red. Code Red was a computer worm that emerged in July 2001 and infected computers running Microsoft's IIS web server. 
The code red worm had been released on July 13th, but on July 19th, 2001, another variant of the worm spread rapidly and was reported to infect over 250,000 computers in just nine hours. On that day, the total number of infected hosts reached 359,000. The worm defaced the affected websites to display the hacked by Chinese text string. It was the first large-scale threat that could successfully target enterprise networks. In August 2001, The Guardian reported that the FBI had issued serious warnings to organizations asking them to safeguard themselves against this worm. At number 4, we have CryptoLocker. The crypto virus, popularly known as CryptoLocker, is a ransomware virus that encrypts files on a computer and demands a ransom in return for a decryption code. The CryptoLocker malware spread between early September 2013 and late May 2014. The primary means of infection was via phishing emails with malicious attachments. It was identified as a Trojan virus that targeted computers running different versions of the Windows operating system. Once the crypto locker is launched, it encrypts many files on a user's computer or hard drives, servers and other storage devices throughout the organization. Crypto virus attacks are rising, with over 4,000 attacks each day. As per the US government estimates, more than $1 billion is paid in ransom each year. At number 5, we have Melissa. The Melissa virus was one of the biggest and earliest cyber threats in history. Released in March 1999, Melissa started spreading via email, infecting thousands of computers within hours. The virus was sent in a file called list.doc which contained passwords to censored websites. So when users downloaded the file and opened it in Microsoft Word, a macro inside the document was executed and emailed the list doc file to 50 people listed in the user's email alias file. Email servers at more than 300 companies and government agencies worldwide became overloaded, and some had to be shut down entirely. As per the US FBI report, the estimated cost for cleaning and repairing affected computer systems was $80 million. And finally, at number 6 on the list of most dangerous computer viruses, we have Slammer. On Saturday, January 25, 2003, the internet was hit by a vicious computer worm known as SQL Slammer. It brought down most of the world's SQL servers and slowed down internet traffic. Bank ATMs were down. Slammer was 376 bytes of malicious code that attempted to connect to every computer it could find over MS SQL UDP port 1434 causing heavy network traffic. It is believed to have infected over 75,000 systems within 10 minutes. SQL Slammer was the fastest spreading computer worm in history. The New York Times reported that Microsoft admitted that some of its machines had gone unpatched and that its MSN internet service also had significant slowdowns due to the Slammer worm. According to Cybersecurity Ventures, the global cybercrime cost is expected to grow and reach. 10.5 trillion US dollars by 2025. That's the cost we have to pay for cyber crimes. In this video, we bring you the top 10 dangerous computer hackers of all the time. At number 10, we have Johnson James Ancheta. In the year 2006, Johnson James Ancheta of Downey, California was charged for controlling huge number of botnets. In other words, hijacked computers. This was the first time that a hacker was sent to prison for the use of botnet technology. Anchita used botnets to compromise more than 400,000 computers. Advertising companies paid him to install adware or bots on specified systems. It is also noted that Anchita advertised the sale of his botnets to those interested in sending spam or launching DDoS attacks without being identified. He was also pleaded guilty for infecting machines at two US military sites, which earned him more than $61,000. Jawson James Ancheta was captured in a well-planned and elaborate sting operation when FBI agents coaxed him in their office on the pretext of collecting computer equipment. He was sentenced to nearly 60 months of imprisonment and was ordered to pay 15,000 US dollars to the US federal government for hacking their military computers. At number 9, we have Andron Lamo. Lamo began his hacking journey by hacking games. He was more likely a grey hat hacker who wanted people to understand the importance of internet security. However, it went far ahead when he hacked the New York Times intranet in 2002. He was called the homeless hacker for his transient lifestyle and he often had no fixed address. 
He used to hack top-notch accounts by sitting in cafeterias, libraries, and so on. He was convicted for compromising security at the New York Times, Microsoft, and Yahoo, to name a few. He later gained the badge of an American threat analyst. He also appeared on Good Morning America, Fox News, Democracy Now, etc. as an expert on net-centric crime and incidents. Lamo died in the year 2018 at the age of 37. At number 8, we have Kevin Paulson, a former American black hat hacker. In the hacker community, he is better known as Dark Dante. At the age of 17, he hacked the US Department of Defense, but he was left with a warning as he was a minor. Later in 1990, he propelled to stardom for infiltrating a radio show call-in contest and guaranteeing that he will be the 102nd caller to win the brand new Porsche 944 S2. The FBI stated pursuing Paulson and was soon arrested and sentenced to a five years of imprisonment. He was also barred from using a computer or internet for three years post his release. Later, he took into white hat hacking and journalism. In the year 2005, he became a senior editor of Wired News. At number 7, we have the famous American hacker, Jonathan James, better known as Comrade. He was the first juvenile in the United States to be sent to prison for hacking. This famous hack was his intrusion into the Defense Threat Reduction Agency or DTRA Computers, a division of the United States Department of Defense. He installed a backdoor on its servers. This enabled him to access over 3,000 messages from government employees, various usernames, passwords, and other confidential data. This helped James steal a piece of NASA software and this forced NASA to shut down computers for three weeks to fix the issue at an estimated cost of 41,000 American dollars. He was sentenced to six months arrest in 2000. He carried out his hacking using the alias Comrade. He specialized in hacking high-profile government systems. However, he had a bitter ending in 2008. Moving on to our hacker at number six. At number six, we have Anonymous. The Anonymous group is an international decentralized hacktivist movement that is widely known for its cyber attacks against several governments, its agencies, and the Church of Scientology. This group is focused on the concept of social justice. The members of this group, known as Anons, are recognized in public by wearing Guy Fox masks. However, some members cover their face without using the well-known masks as well. They are known as being the digital Robin Hood amongst its supporters. One of the noted incidents was in the year 2008 when the group took up issue with the Church of Scientology and began to disable their websites. They are also known for hacking Vatican, the FBI, PayPal, Sony, the CIA, Mastercard, Visa, the Israeli, Chinese, Tunisian, and Ugandan governments. While the law enforcement agencies and FBI have tracked down a few of the group's members, the lack of any proper hierarchy makes it almost impossible to distinguish or eliminate the anonymous groups as a whole. At number 5, we have the British Dio. Matthew Baven and Richard Price. In 1994, the DO hacked into multiple US military systems including the Defense Information System Agency, Griffiths Air Force Base, and the Korean Atomic Research Institute. They infiltrated into foreign systems by transferring critical data of Korean Atomic Research Institute into the United States Air Force system. In 1996, Baven was arrested for hacking incidents related to US Air Force defense manufacturer Lockheed, NASA, and NATO. The Pentagon described Baven as the number one threat to US security and possibly the single biggest threat to world peace since Adolf Hitler. However, Baven claims he was looking to prove a UFO conspiracy theory. In 1997, Price was fined £1,200 after pleading guilty to 12 offenses of gaining unauthorized access to computer systems in March and April 1994. Having malicious purposes or not, Beaven and Price displayed that even military networks are vulnerable. Now, moving on to a hacker at number 4. At number 4, we have Astra. This hacker is a tad bit different from the others on this list as he has never been publicly identified. The pen name of this hacker, Astra, is a Sanskrit word for a weapon. In 2008, it was reported that the authorities apprehended him. 
at that time, he was known as a 58-year-old Greek mathematician. He hacked into France's distort group systems and got his hands on vulnerable weapons technology data and then sold it to different countries for a long period. Astra was reported to have sold the data to nearly 250 people from across the world. This, in turn, caused Dassault 360 million US dollars of damage. While the Astra's real identity was never discovered, officials have said that he had been wanted since the year 2002. At number 3, we have the famous American computer hacker Albert Gonzalez. He was responsible for carrying out multiple hacks. He is accused of masterminding the biggest fraud in history, that is, the combined credit card theft and reselling of nearly 170 million card and ATM numbers from the year 2005 to 2007. This shows how unsafe internet banking can be at times. This was recorded to be one of the biggest credit card thefts in history. He carried out this by installing a sniffer. Albert Gonzalez is also said to have been the mastermind of the TJX company's hack wherein 45.6 million debit and credit numbers were stolen. Later in 2010, he was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison. Moving on to a hacker at number 2. At number 2, we have Gary McKinson. He is a Scottish systems administrator and hacker accused of carrying out the biggest military computer hack of all time. In 2002, he identified himself as Solo through a note message on a US Army computer. It was later found to be Gary McKinson. He was accused of infiltrating 97 United States military and NASA computers by installing wires and deleting a few files over 13 months between February 2001 and March 2002. This was the biggest military computer attack of all time. This shut down the US military's Washington network for 24 hours. What is fascinating is his reason that much of his hacking was in search of information on UFOs that he believed the US government was hiding in its military computers. And finally, let's see who we have at number one. At number one, we have Kevin Mitnick. The now affluent American entrepreneur was one of the most wanted cyber criminal of US once upon a time. Kevin, who is currently a security consultant, was once convicted of hacking Motorola, Nokia and Pentagon. Kevin mastered computer hacking and social engineering early and got his start as a teen. In 1982, he hacked the North American Defense Command. This achievement inspired the 1983 film War Games. In 1989, he hacked Digital Equipment Corporation's network and made copies of their software. It's largely believed that he once obtained full control of Pacific Bell's network to merely prove that it could be done. He never exploited the data he obtained. According to reports, Mitnick gained unauthorized access to a dozens of computer networks while he was a fugitive. After five years of imprisonment, Mitnick started afresh and became a security consultant. His knack with computers is still remembered. All of these hackers were unbelievably skilled in cyber code. Few of them faced jail in time, a few of others ever since put their cyber skills to better use by becoming security advisors and helping humankind. Hacking skills aren't a form of criminal behavior if it is put to good use. So with that, we have come to an end of this video on top 10 dangerous hackers of all time. In this video, we bring you the top 10 computer hacks of all time. Let's see what we have at number 10. From April 27, 2007, Estonia, the European country, faced a series of cyber attacks that lasted for weeks. This happened when the Estonian government decided to move the bronze soldier from Tallinn center to a less prominent military cemetery located on the city's outskirts. Unprecedented levels of internet traffic took down Estonian banks, online services, media outlets, broadcasters and government bodies. Botnet sent massive waves of spam and vast amounts of automated online requests. According to researchers, the public faced DDoS attacks. There were conflicts to edit the English language version of the Bronze Soldiers Wikipedia page as well. Although there is no confirmation, Russia is believed to be behind these cyber attacks that largely crippled the Estonian society. Let's now move on to the next attack. On December 23, 2015, several parts of Ukraine witnessed a power outage. And this was not a typical blackout, it was indeed the result of a cyber attack. Information systems of three energy distribution companies in Ukraine were compromised. It is the first known victorious cyber attack on a power grid. It is said that here hackers sent out phishing emails to the power companies. 
30 substations were switched off and about 230,000 people were left in the dark for about one to six hours. US investigators believed that Russia-based hackers were responsible for this. Experts have warned that other countries could also be vulnerable to such attacks. Let's see what we have at number 8. In the year 1999, a cyber attack caused a 21-day shutdown of NASA computers. Unbelievable, isn't it? The hacker was none other than the then 15-year-old Jonathan James. He first penetrated US Department of Defense Division's computers and installed a backdoor on its servers. This allowed him to intercept more than a thousand government emails, including the ones containing usernames and passwords. This helped James steal a piece of NASA software and crack the NASA computers that support the International Space Station, which cost the space exploration agencies $41,000 as systems were shut down for three weeks. He was the first person to carry out a computer hack against the American Space Agency. Let's now move on to the next attack. In late November 2014, there was a leak of confidential data from the film studio of Sony Pictures. Information about Sony Pictures employees, their emails, copies of the then-unreleased Sony films, future propositions and other crucial data were leaked. This cyber attack was carried out by a hacker group named Guardians of Peace. So what did the hackers want? Well, they demanded that Sony withdraw its then-upcoming movie, The Interview. This movie was a comedy storyline to assassinate the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Sony then decided to cancel the film's theatrical release due to the threats at cinema screening the movie. It is indeed hard to trace the roots of a cyber attack. In this case, after evaluation, the US intelligence officials arrived at the theory that the attack was in a way related to the government of North Korea. However, North Korea had denied the same. Moving on to our number 6. In December 2006, TJX, the US retailer company, identified that 45.6 million debit and credit card details were stolen. This happened from one of its systems over 18 months by an unknown number of intruders. It was one of the first, largest ever cyber attacks involving the loss of personal data. As a result, banks in the affected regions had to reissue and block thousands of payment cards. A group of hackers did this, Albert Gonzalez being the mastermind. The group was from Miami, the place where the TJX heist was believed to have originated. Reports said that the TJX data breach occurred because of weak web encryption at two of its Marshall stores in Miami. Next, moving on to our top 5, let us see what we have at number 5. The year 2010 witnessed the discovery of the deadly computer worm Stuxnet. This malware's motive was unlike any other usual cyber attacks. It aimed at destructing the equipment the computers controlled. Stuxnet came for the deadly purpose of damaging Iran's nuclear infrastructure. It infected more than 200,000 computers, including 14 industrial sites and a uranium enrichment plant in Iran. Stuxnet initially spread via Microsoft Windows and targeted Siemens industrial control systems. Although it was discovered only in 2010, it is believed to have been silently sabotaging Iran's nuclear facilities. It was one of the first discovered malware that was capable of hampering hardware systems. It largely damaged the centrifuges of the Iranian reactors. This is believed to be a cyber weapon created by the US and the Israeli intelligence, although there is no documented evidence or acceptance by either of the countries for the same. Moving on to number 4. In the year 2014, Home Depot was the victim of one of the deadliest cyber attacks. 56 million payment cards were compromised along with 53 million customer email addresses stolen. This security breach happened from April to September 2014. Criminals were believed to have used a third-party vendor's username and password to enter the perimeter of Home Depot's network. The attackers were then able to deploy custom-built malware on its self-checkout systems in the US and Canada. Moving on to our top three. As you might be aware, the PlayStation gaming system is one of Sony's most popular products. Unfortunately, in April 2011, Sony executives witnessed abnormal activity on the PlayStation network. This resulted in the compromise of approximately 77 million PlayStation users' accounts and prevented users of PlayStation 3 and PlayStation Portable consoles from accessing the service. This forced Sony to turn off the PlayStation network on April 20th. On May 4th, Sony confirmed that personally identifiable information from each of the 77 million accounts had been exposed. The outage lasted for 23 days. 
Sony released almost daily announcements concerning the system outage. In the end, Sony is believed to have invested approximately $170 million to improve the network's security, to investigate the attack and to cover the expenses of caring for the consumers that had been affected. Let's now move on to the next attack at number 2. In May 2017, one of the most dangerous cyber attacks took place. It was known as the WannaCry ransomware attack caused by the WannaCry crypto worm. The victims were the users that used the unsupported version of Microsoft Windows and those who hadn't installed the new security update. This did not take place through phishing like other attacks but through an exposed vulnerable SMB port. The attack originated in Asia and then eventually spread across the globe. In a day, more than 200,000 computers were infected across 150 countries. The WannaCry crypto worm locked the users out of the targeted systems and encrypted their data. The users were asked for a ransom of $300 to $600 which had to be paid via Bitcoin in exchange for their data. This attack took a toll on both private and government organizations. It resulted in damages from hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. In a matter of few days, the emergency patches released by Microsoft halted the attack. Also, the discovery of a kill switch prevented the infected computers from spreading the crypto worm. Security experts in a few countries believed that North Korea was behind this attack. And finally, let's see what we have at number 1. More than two decades ago, in March 1999, the Melissa virus, a mass-mailing macrovirus, was released. It targeted Microsoft Word and Outlook-based systems and created considerable network traffic. Melissa virus infected computers via emails. The email would look like an important message? Well, yes, it was fake. If the recipient opens the attachments in the mail and downloads the document and then opens it with Microsoft Word, a virus was released on their computers. This would then mass mail itself to the first 50 people in the victim's contact list and then disable multiple safeguard features on Microsoft Word and Microsoft Outlook. This began spreading like a wildfire across the internet. David L. Smith released the virus. The virus caused nearly 80 million worth of damages. It did not steal data or money, however, it caused a havoc. Almost 1 million email accounts were disrupted worldwide, agencies were overloaded, and some had to be shut down entirely and internet traffic in some locations was slowed down. So with that, we come to the end of this video on the top 10 computer hacks of all time. Do you agree with our list? If you're aware of any other great interesting computer hacks in history, do let us know in the comment section below. Hey everyone. Welcome to this video where we look into the rampant spyware program that is the Pegasus service. Before we learn about the Pegasus platform, let us understand what spyware is and its working. Spyware is a category of malware that can gather information regarding a user or a device straight from the host machine. It is mostly spread by malicious links via email or chat applications. When a link with the malware is received, clicking on this link will activate the spyware which allows the hacker to spy on all our user information. With some spyware systems, even clicking on the link isn't necessary to trigger the malicious payload. This can ultimately cause security complications and further loss of privacy. One such spyware system that is making the rounds in the tech industry today is Pegasus. The Pegasus is a spyware system developed by an Israeli company known as the NSO Group. It runs on mainly mobile devices spanning across the major operating systems like the Apple's iOS on iPhone and the standard Android versions. This is not a newly developed platform since Pegasus has existed since as early as 2016. A highly intricate spyware program that can track user location, read text messages, scan through mobile files, access device camera and microphone to record voice and video. Pegasus has all the tools necessary to enforce surveillance for any client that wishes to buy its services. Initially, the NSO group had designed the software to be used against terrorist factions of the world. With more and more encrypted communication channels coming to the forefront, Pegasus was designed to maintain control over the data transmission that can be a threat to national security. Unfortunately, the people who bought the software had complete control over who, how and up to what level they can put surveillance limits on. Eventually, the primary clients became sovereign nations. Spying on public information that is supposed to stay private became really easy with this service. Multiple devices can be affected with the same spyware system to create a network information. This network keeps feeding data to the host. 
To understand how a network can be created, let's know how a mobile device can be affected by Pegasus. We all communicate with friends and family over instant messaging applications and email in some instances. If you check your inbox on a regular basis, you must have noticed that we receive some spam emails that the mail providers like Gmail and Yahoo can just filter into the spam folder. Some of these messages bypass this filter and make their way into a person's inbox. They look like generic emails which are supposed to be safe. The Pegasus spyware targets such occurrences, bypassing malicious messages and links which install the necessary spy software on the user's mobile device, be it Android or an iPhone. This isn't unique to the email ecosystem since it's equally likely to be targeted via SMS texts, WhatsApp, Instagram or even the most secure messaging apps like Signal and Threema. Once the malicious links are clicked, a spyware package is downloaded and installed on the device. After the spyware is successfully installed, the perpetrator who sent the payload to the victim can monitor everything the user does. Pegasus can collect private emails, passwords, images, videos and every other piece of information that passes through the device network. All this data is transmitted back to the central server where the primary spying organization can monitor the activities at a granular level. This is not even surface level since complex spyware software like Pegasus can access the root files on our mobiles. These root files hold information that is crucial to the working of the Android and iOS operating systems. Leaking such private information is a massive blow to the security and the privacy of an individual. The information that may seem trivial, like the name of your Wi-Fi connection or the last time you ordered an item from Amazon, are indeed all valuable information. This exploitation is primarily possible due to the zero-day vulnerabilities known as bugs in the software development process. The zero-day bugs are the ones that have just been discovered by some independent security company or a researcher. Once they are found, reporting these vulnerabilities to the developer of the platform which would be either Google for Android or Apple for iOS is the right thing to do. However, many such critical bugs make their way onto the dark web where hackers can use them to create exploits. These exploits are then sent to innocent users with a link or a message like we had discussed before. Pegasus was able to affect the latest devices with the, all the security patches installed but some bugs are not reported to the developers or just cannot be fixed without breaking some core functionality. These become the gateway for spyware to enter into the system. You can never be 100% safe but you sure can give it all in protecting yourself. The one thing where Pegasus stands out is its zero-click action feature. Usually in spam emails, the malicious code is activated when the user clicks the malware link. A user doesn't need to click the link in the new version of the Pegasus and a few other spyware programs. Once the message arrives in the inbox of WhatsApp, Gmail or any other chat applications, the spyware gets activated and everything can be recorded and sent back to the central server. The primary issue with being affected by spyware as a victim is detection. Unlike crypto miners and trojans, spying services usually do not demand many system resources which makes them tough to detect after they have been activated. Since many devices slow down after a couple of years, any kind of performance hit due to such spyware is often attributed to poor software longevity by the users. They do not check meticulously for any other causes that is causing the slowdown. When left unchecked, these devices can capture voice and video from the mobile sensors while keeping the owner in the dark. Let's take a moment to check if we are well aware of the causes of such attacks. How do users fall prey to such spyware programs? A. By installing untested software. B. By clicking on the third-party links from email and messages. C. By not keeping their apps and phones updated. Or D. All of the above. Let us know your answers in the comment section below and we will reveal the correct answer next week. But what about the unaffected devices, the vulnerable ones? While we cannot be certain of our security, there are a few things we can do to boost our device, be it against Pegasus or the next big spyware on the market. Let's say we are safe now and we have the time to take the necessary steps to prevent a spyware attack. What are the things we can go for? Our primary goal must always be to keep our apps and the operating system updated with the latest security patches. The vulnerabilities that the exploits target are often discovered by developers from Google and Apple which send the security patches quickly. This can be done for individual apps as well, so keeping them updated is of utmost importance. 
While the most secure devices have fallen prey to Pegasus as well, a security patch from developers may help in minimizing the damage at a later stage or maybe negate the entire spyware platform altogether. Another big factor is the spread of malware is the trend of sideloading Android applications using .apk files. Downloading such apps from a third-party website have no security checks involved and are mostly responsible for adware and spyware invasions on user devices. Avoiding the sideloading of apps would be a major step in protecting yourself. We often receive spam emails or texts from people we may not know on social media. They are accompanied with links that allow malware to creep into our device. We should try to follow the trusted websites and not click on any links that redirect us to unknown domains. Spyware is a controversial segment in governance. While the ramifications are pretty extreme in theory, it severely impacts user privacy against authoritarian regimes. Sufficient resources and a contingent plan can alter the false veil of democracy altogether. Even if our daily life is rather simplistic, we must understand that privacy is not about what we have to hide. Instead, it portrays the things we have to protect. It stands for everything we have to share with the outside world, both rhetorically and literally. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. In this video, we are going to discuss what is ethical hacking. Now take this as an example. There is an organization that keeps on getting compromised or keeps on getting attacked repeatedly every month. And they're at a loss of why exactly this is happening. So an employee comes up with a brilliant idea of hiring an ethical hacking or uh, hiring an ethical hacker to test the security systems. The bosses agree and the company ends up hiring an ethical hacker. Now, what this hacker does is they try to test all the security controls that the organization has implemented, all the applications, uh, maybe even the databases, and then they start giving a report. So here you can see that they are trying to test the firewall, uh, maybe fire viruses, malicious queries towards the firewall, hack the company's website, test the company's websites, any applications that the company is utilizing, and try to analyze the responses that they're going to get. So they're trying to emulate a hacker scenario where a hacker is trying to attack and trying to figure out the vulnerabilities and the areas for compromise uh, to the organization's infrastructure. So once the report is ready, they would be submitting the report to the organization and they would then give recommendations of how to enhance the security posture of the organization. Once the security posture is enhanced, the likelihood of the organization getting compromised reduces drastically, thus the organization becomes a lot more secure than it was before. And this is what we are going to discuss in this video. So first and foremost, we are going to discuss uh, what is ethical hacking. We are going to talk about the types of hackers. We are looking at phases of ethical hacking, common types of attacks that are possible on networks and other systems. And then we are talk talking about certification and job roles in the cybersecurity space as well. So what exactly is ethical hacking? Ethical hacking is locating weaknesses or vulnerabilities of computers and information system using the intent and actions of a malicious hacker. Now the difference here is the intent. A malicious hacker will try to gain something for their own uh, personal gains or try to cause damage to the other organization. Here, the intent of the ethical hacker is to identify possible flaws and vulnerabilities, weaknesses, and then try to enhance the security on those weaknesses by mitigating those weaknesses, thus preventing malicious hackers from getting access. So the intent is the complete other way around, where a malicious hacker may be looking at gaining personally from these attacks, where an ethical hacker would prevent the vulnerability does prevent the hack from happening in the first place. An ethical hacker is an expert who penetrates a computer system or network on behalf of its owners to find security vulnerabilities that the hacker can exploit. So the difference between the hacker and ethical hacker here is that the hacker is not authorized by the organization, whereas in case of ethical hacker, it's the organization themselves who have hired the services of the ethical hacker to test the security controls, to test the network, to test applications and find out flaws within them so that they can be fixed. Ethical hacker is also known as a penetration tester. So the job role here is to find vulnerabilities and to fix them so that malicious hackers may not be able to misuse them. What are the advantages of hiring an ethical hacker in an organization? First and foremost, ethical hackers can emulate or simulate the scenarios that a hacker would. They have the same knowledge, might use the same tools, except for the intent. So they will be able to identify the security threats for the organization. 
once the th security threats have been mitigated the organization can actually focus on their business and increase productivity once the attacks have been mitigated and the compromises have been minimized the organization can full fledged work towards their goals their objectives of the business and be more productive the reputation of the company can be safeguarded we obviously don't want to deal with organizations that keep on repeatedly getting hacked and compromise our data we wouldn't trust those organizations with our private and personal data in the first place which means that this is going to inspire customer confidence the customer would feel that if the organization is secure and is able to protect themselves they would be able to protect the customer's data and customer's uh, private information as well which is the protection for your customers or clients so this can be advertised as by the organization saying we have ethical hackers we do proactive approach towards our security measures we have uh, integrated security mechanisms in place we are safe we have been tested and we can prove that we are security compliant once the customers come to know about this customers would feel a lot more safer to deal with such organizations after discussing the advantages of hiring an ethical hacker let's discuss the types of hackers the first classification is of a black hat hacker these people are individuals with extraordinary computing skills which means they are very intelligent they can program quite a bit uh, they know everything about hacking and these guys are experts however their intent is malicious or destructive in nature they would want to harm the victim and gain possibly monetarily from these kind of activities some of these people would do it for fun and ego boost if you will the second classification is of a gray hat hacker these are individuals who work offensively as well as defensively so at times they can uh, for an agenda become a black hat hacker gain out of it hack without authorization and at times they can actually accept a contract from an organization to help them enhance the security of that organization and then there are white hat hackers these are individuals professing the same skills that of a black hat or a gray hat they might use the same tools possess the same knowledge except for the intent their intent is not to cause harm but to protect the organization and enhance their security skills these are people like us these are ethical hackers who essentially uh, try to emulate or simulate the attacks from a black hat hacker's perspective to find out the flaws and then try to mitigate them uh, try to enhance the security posture of the organization to prevent that organization from getting hacked and then there are suicide hackers these are individuals who bring down critical infrastructure for a cause the main difference between the black hat hackers and suicide hackers is that black hat hackers will try to hide their identity suicide hackers do not in fact they will claim responsibility for the attacks that they have done then we have script kiddies these are unskilled hackers they have no idea what they're doing they may not be technically very adept but they rely on tools already created by black hat hackers and then try to use those tools and leverage them to try to hack an organization a cyber terrorist would be any organization or individual who are motivated by religious or political beliefs and they try to create fear by large scale disruption of computer networks so they might attack countries they might attack organizations to promote their political or religious causes and might create harm to the population at large state sponsored hackers are individuals who are employed by the government to spy on neighboring countries or uh, their enemies the attempt is to gain top secret information that would be damaging to other governments which would enhance the security posture of one own, one's own country now this is not an official job profile but uh, it's a known fact that most of the governments have hired uh, hackers to spy on other countries and other organizations then there are hacktivists individuals who want to promote a political agenda by hacking and defacing websites these guys do not cripple infrastructure they just hack websites deface them put their own propaganda on the face of the website uh, to promote whatever political messages that they want to uh, promote now let's talk about the phases of ethical hacking ethical hacking is di distributed into five different phases they are the reconnaissance phase scanning gaining access maintaining access and covering tracks the first phase the reconnaissance phase is all about information gathering here you are trying to identify the target trying to get to know the target gathering information about the target could be digital in nature could be any personal information or organizational information that you can leverage later on for social engineering attacks as well here you might try to find out from a technical perspective the ip addresses domain names subdomains uh, email addresses phone numbers of uh, people uh, working in the organization once you have all this information you would then proceed to the scanning phase we are going to actively scan for devices that are live and can, you can interact with 
then you are going to scan those live devices to identify ports protocols and services running on those systems now these ports or protocols these would be your entry points to try to gain access to that system it is here where those flaws would exist so in this phase you are basically identifying which ports are open which services are running on top of them what protocols are being utilized by the machine once you have identified this you might want to enumerate them by gathering more information from a specific protocol and then you might want to go into the vulnerability scanning phase where you are going to scan these services protocols for vulnerabilities trying to create a list of all the possible vulnerabilities in that system once you have the list of possible vulnerabilities you are going to move on to the gaining access phase where you are going to attack those vulnerabilities try to exploit them and try to gain access or embed a trojan virus keylogger or any software that can spy on the victim once you have hacked into this machine you are going to try to maintain access maintaining an access is you trying to retain those access for a longer period of time so you can spy on the uh, device spy on the user uh, try to collect more information as time goes on you are not going to rely on the hack forever because the hack may no longer work after a period of time especially if the system gets patched up or somebody runs an antivirus scan or figures out something is wrong maintaining access is where you are going to install a backdoor an unauthorized backdoor obviously uh, without the knowledge of the victim which will allow you to interact with the machine or gather information from the machine without any hindrance once you have installed these kind of softwares you don't want them to be discovered that's where the covering tracks come into the picture when you have installed a rootkit a trojan a spyware it will create directories it will create files in this phase the covering tracks you're going to try to erase the trace of the creation of these files when you are accessing something while maintaining access or gaining access there would be logs that would be created uh, by the applications which would announce what you've been doing in the covering covering tracks phase you will be trying to delete those logs and try to erase the traces of your activity as well so in these five phases the entire gambit of ethical hacking is covered let's move on to discuss the common types of attacks the first and foremost and the most common attack in today's world is a denial of service attack or a distributed denial of service attack this attack is launched by a attacker not to not for personal gain but to harm the other organization by crashing those services or making the services unavailable for legitimate users thus causing monetary harm and reputational harm to the organization they actually try to restrict the access to these resources for legitimate users by consuming all the bandwidth or the resources made available then there are password attacks these attacks are essentially where you're trying to crack the password of a user so that you can get access to their account and through their access you can then uh, leverage those access and capture data that you wouldn't have otherwise gotten access to then man in the middle attack is where you are trying to capture data packets over the network uh, that are flying between the victim and the target server so you're essentially placing yourself between the communication channel that has been opened between the victim and the targeted server and you're trying to capture the data packets you're trying to analyze those data packets and capture any secret information like username passwords any other transactions that the user might be doing then you have email attacks the attacker sends bait often in the form of an email so these would be a phishing attacks that would come under the gambit of so social engineering phishing attacks are nothing but fake mails that look very genuine to the end user and thus persuade them to click on links that lead to malicious servers thus compromising the device of the victim sql injection attacks are normally targeted to websites or web applications that have a, that have a database connected to them the database and the application interact e with each other using sql language or structured query language if not configured properly and uh, if there are no firewalls watching a user can cra craft malicious sql queries which can then dump data or uh, give out unwanted information to the hacker that should have been protected in the first place and then if you have the eavesdropping attack where the attacker observes the traffic on the system and works and the work you are doing on your computer eavesdropping could be where you're tra uh, you're tracking voip calls or you have installed a trojan on somebody's mobile phones and you're trying looking at all that information let's look at the certifications that are available in this field the foundational knowledge that you would require is a graduate in computer science or any it security related field most of the univers universities nowadays provide this kind of certifications you should have solid grounds in it fundamentals that means you should be technically very adept you should understand how protocols work how networking works you should be uh, 
somewhat conversant with some scripting languages and should be able to understand programming. Knowing networking and mastering networking is a very fundamental requirement. Even if you later on decide to go into application security and you're looking at programming languages, applications still work over the network and you need to know how these networks are going to be configured and how data is going to be transmitted over this network. Coding skills. Like I said, programming, not from a developer's perspective, but at least good enough to understand how the program functions, what the flaws may be in the programming code that has been given and how you can break that particular code. That is what is required. A few scripting languages like PHP, Perl, Python, Ruby, uh, they would be a lot helpful at this point in time. Maybe bash scripting or PowerShell scripting as well. And then our understanding of the architecture of an operating system. We just don't want to know how the operating system works and how it functions. We should be able to troubleshoot the operating system to recover from errors, flaws, and we should know how the operating system works, stores data, and interacts with the hardware in, at the first place. With everything, there is now cloud, and cloud is gaining traction a lot. We got public clouds like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. We got private clouds like VMware, uh, My Microsoft again, Citrix, and so on and so forth. Most of the organizations in today's world World have a hybrid environment where they've got a part physical IT infra and part cloud infrastructure. So learning what cloud is, the nuances of cloud, the services that a cloud can provide, software as a service, infrastructure as a service, and platform as a service, understanding them, and then knowing how you can secure these or what the vulnerabilities are in the first place, and then trying to secure them is of very much a sense in today's world. Over a period of time, you will have to learn cloud security to be relevant in today's world, especially with IoT, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, picking up pace. And then malware analysis and reverse engineering. So let's say there's a new virus that has been released and there's an antivirus company who's working to figure out how the virus works, what are the signatures that are created by the virus, and this is where those malware analysis skills come into the picture. Even in real terms or in normal terms, if you're working in an organization and if a machine has been infected or is suspected of an infect infection, you need to investigate the machine to identify whether it was a worm, virus or a trojan and need to take effective action to prevent further compromise from happening. And that is why uh, mal malware analysis is of importance as well. The certifications that you have, certified ethical hacker, it will train you in reverse engineering. So this is where you basically look at offensive security. This is where you're looking at hacking and you're looking at how uh, the methodologies, the five steps that we have talked about. And this course deals with each and every one of those five steps and helps you analyze and understand the tool sets and the skills that are required for each of that particular step. Salaries may range between 71,000 US dollars and above in the US market and around, around 5 lakh rupees and more in the Indian market. After CEH, we have got the ECSA slash LPT course. ECSA is the EC Council Certified Security Analyst course. Once you get certified on that, you can then apply for the LPT, which is the License Penetration Tester. So it's for CEH, then ECSA, EC Council Certified Security Analyst, and then LPT, License Penetration Tester. This gives certified penetration testers the opportunity to practice their skills and gives you a license where you have uh, and a certificate that proves that you have understood the methodology and are very adept at the skills of hacking. When we hear the term hacker, we may picture a dangerous cyber criminal. However, not all hackers are inherently bad. They are powerful individuals who use their technical skills to break into computer networks and bypass security measures. Hacking is not always bad and it is to be noted that the world of computers is actually safer to an extent because of a particular type of hacker. A hacker is deemed to be good or bad depending on their motive and whether or not they are breaking the law. In this video, we will acquaint you with the differences between a white hat hacker, black hat hacker and a grey hat hacker through a short story. Hackers are basically categorized by the type of metaphorical hat they don't white hat, grey hat and black hat. Hackers can either be a black hat or a white hat or a grey hat. Hackers can be good or bad depending on which colour hat they decide to wear and by this we mean their hacking motives and obviously not in the sense of creating a fashion statement here. Let's have a look at our story. Our story here revolves around Dan who is the owner of a company that provides a platform for video conferencing. His platform enables online communication for video meetings, audio meetings, and webinars. 
Just like other video conferencing platforms, his platform too has built-in features like chat, recording, screen sharing and so on. Everything went well and his business increased tremendously with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 accelerated the rise of the worldwide digital economy and it made people rapidly adopt video conferencing tools and apps. In a contactless world, starting from employee interactions to family get-togethers to virtual workout classes, everything happened virtually. Dan's video conferencing platform enabled long-distance communication and enhanced collaboration. So now you might be wondering what could have gone wrong. Well, there are many risks involved when it comes to the safety of these online platforms. Online meeting rooms are susceptible to a number of digital threats. Dan received complaints from his customers that his platform was insecure and safe anymore. Little did Dan know that the popularity of his video conferencing platform made hackers eager to disrupt the virtual meetings and hijack the conferences. His platform witnessed complaints like the addition of an unknown participant in every meeting room, someone covering up information that is being presented, and also unknown screen recording of a meeting to name a few. These intruders were sneaky hackers who tried to gain access to sensitive information and who tried to disrupt meetings. And how did these hackers manage to do all this? Well, this was done by exploiting weaknesses in Dan's computer network in order to obtain unauthorized access to crucial data and sensitive information. This is known as hacking and the individuals who carry this out are known as hackers. In this form of hacking that Dan witnessed, hackers exploited Dan's company's security posture by identifying weaknesses in it in order to intrude into the meetings and gain access to business data or personal data. And this form of hacking is definitely bad and unethical. The hackers who carried this against Dan's company are known as black hat hackers. These hackers are cyber criminals who carry out cyber attacks with a negative intention. These attacks can be in the form of Trojan virus, malware attacks, phishing attacks, DDoS attacks, man in the middle attacks, SQL injection attacks, and so on. So who exactly is a black hat hacker? Like in the case of Dan's organization's cyber attack, black hat hackers are highly skilled cyber criminals who break into computer systems and networks with malicious intent. They illegally hack into a system and this is obviously without the system owner's approval. Such hackers do not abide by the laws, they violate laws and disrupt networks. The motive behind these attacks vary from monetary gains to personal profit. Usually they are for monetary gains. Black hat hackers may violate the confidentiality, integrity or availability of a company's systems and data. They may also use malware to destroy files or steal passwords, credit card numbers and other confidential information. Black hat hackers are also sometimes called crackers. So this is who a black hat hacker is. Moving back to Dan's story. Black hat hackers disrupted his business and he lost his customers as nobody wished to communicate on an unsecure platform. It is but true, right? Would you be okay to use a platform that is unsafe? None of us want to have unknown people in our meetings, right? This is how Dan's customers felt too, and this news spread and his company's reputation took a bad hit. That is when Ted approached Dan. So who is Ted? Let's have a look at that now. Ted, who was unknown to Dan, explained to him that he found Dan's network to be weak. Ted told Dan that he has identified vulnerabilities in Dan's systems and networks and he will fix them provided Dan pays him well. Dan had nothing to lose and without any further delay, he paid Ted a good amount of money to fix the vulnerabilities in Dan's networks. On receiving the money, Ted began his work and he fixed all the issues and vulnerabilities in Dan's network. He made sure that nobody can exploit Dan's network vulnerabilities again and this way he safeguarded Dan's network for the time being. So who is Ted? Well, he's called a grey hat hacker. As they say, not all things are black and white. So is the concept of grey hat hackers. As fascinating as the name sounds, let us dive deep into understanding the role of a grey hat hacker. A grey hat is a security expert who may at times violate the laws or the ethical standards. However, they do not carry a malicious intent unlike a black hat hacker. Hence, they are known to work both defensively and offensively. They land between the good and the bad. 
Grey hat hackers look for vulnerabilities in a system without permission, but with good intentions. Just like how Ted informed Dan about how he could exploit Dan's system vulnerabilities, Grey hat hackers inform an organization the same and in return ask for a fee to fix it. In some cases, when the organization doesn't comply, grey hat hackers may become black hat hackers. Although a grey hat hacker's intention might not be bad, what they do is still illegal since they do not have permission to break into another system. Back to our story. Although Dan's issue was sorted by Ted for the time being, he had a few concerns. His first concern was history repeating itself. Yes, he was worried about what if black hat hackers hack into his systems again. Although his system vulnerabilities are fixed at the moment, it was a matter of time before they could be exploited again with new hacking techniques. His next thought was to have a professional who could constantly keep a tab on his networks and protect it from hackers. Don't you think his concerns were justified? Yes, it was, as this was the only way he could provide a safe and secure video conferencing platform in the long run. That is when Dan's friend came to his rescue and introduced Anne, the ethical hacker, to him. Anne, being an ethical hacker, assured Dan that she would scan and identify his network for system vulnerabilities before an outsider exploits it, and she would fix those vulnerabilities on a regular basis. Such ethical hackers like Anne are called white hat hackers. Now that we saw who black hat hackers and grey hat hackers were, it is time we learn about our third type of hacker who is a white hat hacker. A white hat hacker gains access to networks with an intention to fix the identified weaknesses. They also perform penetration testing and vulnerability assessments and break into systems with permission. They search for loopholes or vulnerabilities in any given piece of technology just like how a black hat hacker would do. However, white hat hackers harden their organization system before the bad guy can get in. Their goal is to spot system and network vulnerabilities in order to improve system security. White hat hackers are also known as ethical hackers since they obey the law of the land and follow a code of ethics. Many companies and government organizations employ white hat hackers to help them secure their systems. These hackers are typically hired by organizations to look for vulnerabilities in a system like other hackers. The only difference being they are given permission to break in. Once Dan spots the vulnerabilities, she documents her findings and gives Dan advice on how to fix them or she'll even take it up to fix them so that an outsider cannot spot it in the future. Anne does this on a regular basis as system updates happen regularly and it is imperative to be on track with it and fix new vulnerabilities. This made sure Dan's network is now safe and secure. Gradually, he regained his customers' trust and his platform got back to being one of the best and safest platforms for video conferencing. This resulted in a huge business growth and Dan was very happy. Just like how Anne put an end to Dan's business problems, there are many white hat hackers out there who are in grave demand by organizations to safeguard their networks from cyber attacks. And if you are interested in a career in ethical hacking, then Simply Learn can help you fulfill your dreams. Simply Learn CH version 11 certification provides you the hands-on training required to master the techniques hackers use to penetrate network systems and fortify your system against it. This ethical hacking course is aligned with the latest CH version 11 by EC Council and will adequately prepare you to increase your blue team skills. So what are you waiting for? Get certified with Simply Learn and become a certified ethical hacker and put an end to the cyber crimes in the world. Remember, the more active white hat hackers are, the fewer opportunities black hat hackers have for system exploitation. Cybersecurity has become a struggle for organizations in 2021. Recent trends, the side effects of a global pandemic, and cybersecurity statistics reveal a huge increase in hacked and breached data for increasingly common sources in the workplace like mobiles and IoT devices. On top of this, the COVID-19 has ramped up remote workforces, making inroads for cyber attacks. This kind of growth would not have been possible if not for several reliable tools and services, from scripts that find intricate details of companies to software that can brute force servers with a single command. Today's lesson is all about such tools that make an ethical hacker effective. Let's learn about what is ethical hacking. Ethical hacking involves an authorized attempt to gain unauthorized access to a computer system, application, or data. 
Carrying out an ethical hack involves duplicating strategies and actions of malicious attackers. Often carried out in the form of security audits, ethical hacking is extremely beneficial to organizations who are looking to secure the data from falling in the wrong hands. There are three variants of hackers. While a black hat hacker is notorious for criminal activities, a white hat is an ethical hacker or a computer security expert who specializes in penetration testing and other testing methodologies that ensure the security of an organization's system. There are a few that fall under the gray hat hacker umbrella where the hacker occasionally have not authenticated themselves before attempting to hack an organization while sometimes requiring a small fee to report the vulnerability to the developers directly. The purpose of ethical hacking is to improve the security of the network or the systems by fixing the vulnerabilities found during testing. Ethical hackers may use the same methods and tools used by the malicious hackers but with the permission of the authorized person for the purpose of improving the security and defending the systems from attacks. Ethical hackers are expected to report all the vulnerabilities and weaknesses found during the process to the management directly. Ethical hacking has proven itself to be quite a productive career option for many ambitious individuals. The demand for its courses today is at an all-time high and rightfully so. It provides you with an engaging job that never gets tedious. Some certifications like the CompTIA+, CEH and Cisco CCNA are highly acclaimed and will teach a learner all there is to know before dipping their toes in the industry. When it comes to web app hacking, it generally refers to the exploitation of applications via HTTP which can be done by manipulating the applications via its graphical user interface. This is done by tampering with the uniform resource identifier also known as a URI or tampering with the HTTP elements directly which are not a part of the URI. The hacker can send a link via an email or a chat and may trick the users of a web application into executing actions. In case the attack is on an administrator account, the entire web application can be compromised. Anyone who uses a computer connected to the internet is susceptible to the threats that computer hackers and online predators pose. These online villains typically use phishing scams, spam email or instant messages and bogus websites to deliver dangerous malware to your computer and compromise your computer security. Computer hackers can also try to access your computer and private information directly if you are not protected by a firewall. They can monitor your conversations or peruse the back end of your personal website. Usually disguised with a bogus identity, predators can lure you into revealing sensitive personal and financial information. A web server, which can be referred to as the hardware, the computer or the software which helps to deliver content that can be accessed through the internet. The primary function of a web server is to deliver these web pages on the request to clients using the hypertext transfer protocol or HTTP. So hackers attack the web server to steal credential information, passwords and business information by using different types of attacks like DDoS attacks, SYN flooding, ping flood, port scan and social engineering attacks. In the area of web security, despite strong encryption on the browser server channel, web users still have no assurance about what happens at the other end. Although wireless networks offer great flexibility, they have their own security problems. A hacker can sniff the network packets without having to be in the same building where the network is located. As wireless networks communicate through radio waves, a hacker can easily sniff the network from a nearby location. Most attackers use network sniffing to find the SSID and hack a wireless network. An attacker can attack a network from a distance and therefore it is sometimes difficult to collect evidence against the main hacker. Social engineering is the art of manipulating users of a computing system into revealing confidential information which can be later used to gain unauthorized access to a computer system. The term can also include activities such as exploiting human kindness, greed and curiosity to gain access to restricted access buildings or getting the users to installing backdoor software. Knowing the tricks used by hackers to trick users into releasing vital login information is fundamental in protecting computer systems. Coming to our main focus for today, let us have a look at the top 5 most essential ethical hacking tools to be used in 2021. At the top of the chain lies Nmap. 
NMAP, which stands for Network Mapper, is a free and open source utility for network discovery and security auditing. Many systems and network administrators also find it useful for tasks such as network inventory, managing service upgrade schedules, and monitoring host or service uptime. It is most beneficial in the early stages of ethical hacking, where a hacker must figure the possible entry point to a system before running the necessary exploits, thus allowing the hackers to leverage any insecure openings and thus breach the device. Nmap uses raw IP packets in novel ways to determine what hosts are available on the network, what service they are running, what operating systems are installed, what type of packet filters and firewalls are in use, and dozens other characteristics. It was designed to rapidly scan large networks, but works fine against single hosts as well. Since every application that connects to a network needs to do so via a port, the wrong port or a server configuration can open a can of worms which lead to a thorough breach of the system and ultimately a fully hacked device. Next on our list we have Metasploit. The Metasploit framework is a very powerful tool that can be used by cyber criminals as well as ethical hackers to probe systematic vulnerabilities on both networks and servers. Because it's an open source framework, it can be easily customized and used with most operating systems. With Metasploit, the ethical hacking team can use ready-made or custom code and introduce it into a network to probe for weak spots. As another flavor of threat hunting, once the flaws are identified and documented, the information can be used to address systemic weaknesses and prioritize solutions. Once a particular vulnerability is identified and the necessary exploit is fed into the system, there are a host of options for the hacker. Depending on the vulnerability, hackers can even run root commands from the terminal, allowing complete control over the activities of the compromised system as well as all the personal data stored on the device. A big advantage of Metasploit is the ability to run full-fledged scans on the target system, which gives a detailed picture of the security index of the system along with the necessary exploits that can be used to bypass the antivirus software. Having a single solution to gather almost all the necessary points of attack is very useful for ethical hackers and penetration testers as denoted by its high rank in the list. Moving on, we have the Acunetics framework. Acunetics is an end-to-end -end web security scanner which offers a 360 degree view of an organization's security. It is an application security testing tool that helps the company address vulnerability across all their critical web assets. The need to be able to test application in depth and further than traditional vulnerability management tools has created a market with several players in the application security space. Acunetics can detect over 7000 vulnerabilities including SQL injections, cross-site scripting, misconfigurations, weak passwords, exposed database and other out-of-band vulnerabilities. It can scan all pages, web apps and complex web applications running HTML5 and JavaScript as well. It also lets you scan complex multi-level forms and even password protected areas of the site. Acunetics is a dynamic application security testing package, which has definite perks over status application security testing frameworks, which are also known as SAST scanners. SAST tools only work during development and only for specific languages and have a history of reporting a lot of false positives, whereas dynamic testing tools, also known as DAST, have the ability to streamline testing from development to deployment with minimal issues. Next on our list, we have Ergaden. This is a multi-use bash script used for Linux systems to hack and audit wireless networks like our everyday Wi-Fi router and its counterparts. Along with being able to launch denial-of-service attacks on compromised networks, this multi-purpose Wi-Fi hacking tool has very rich features which support multiple methods for Wi-Fi hacking including WPS hacking modes, WP attacks, handshake captures, evil twin and so much more. It usually needs an external network adapter that supports monitor mode, which is necessary to be able to capture wireless traffic that traverse the air channels. Thanks to its open source nature, AirGarden can be used with multiple community plugins and add-ons, thereby increasing its effectiveness against a wide variety of routers, both in the 2.4 GHz and the 5 GHz band. Finally, at number 5, we have John the Ripper. 
John the Ripper is an open source password security auditing and the password recovery tool which is available for many operating systems. John the Ripper Jumbo supports hundreds of hash and cipher types including for user passwords of operating systems, web apps, database servers, encrypted keys and document files. Some of the key features of the tool include offering multiple modes to speed up the password cracking, automatically deselecting the hashing algorithm used by the passwords and the ease of running and configuring the tool to make it password cracking easier. It can use dictionary attacks along with regular brute forcing to speed up the process of cracking the correct password without wasting additional resources. The word list being used in these dictionary attacks can be used by the user's end, allowing for a completely customizable process. We also have a few honorary mentions in our list that just missed the cut. NetSparker, for instance, is an automated yet fully configurable web application security scanner that enables you to scan websites, web applications, and web services. The scanning technology is designed to help you secure web applications easily without any fuss, so you can focus on fixing the reported vulnerabilities. The Burp Suit Professional is one of the most popular penetration testing and vulnerability finder tools and is used for checking web application security. The term Burp, as it is commonly known, is a proxy-based tool which is used to evaluate the security of web-based application and to do hands-on testing. Moving away from websites and applications, Wireshark is a free and open source packet analyzer which was launched in 2006. It is used for network troubleshooting, analysis, software and communications protocol development and education. It captures network traffic on the local network and stores data for offline analysis. Wireshark captures network traffic from Ethernet, Bluetooth, wireless networks and frame relay connections. Now that we learn about the different types of tools that can be used when conducting an ethical hacking audit, let's learn about some potential benefits of such campaigns and why organizations prefer to pay for such audits. Being able to identify defects from an attacker's perspective is game-changing since it displays all the potential avenues of a possible hack. One can only prepare for the known vulnerabilities as a defensive specialist, but proactively trying to breach a network or device can make hackers think of techniques that no defense contractors can account for. This kind of unpredictability goes a long way in securing a network against malicious actors. Another advantage of hiring ethical hackers is the ability to preemptively fix possible weak points in a company's network infrastructure. As seen on many occasions, a real breach will cause loss of data and irreparable damage to the foundation of an organization. Being able to gauge such shortcomings before they become public and can be used exploited is a benefit most organizations make use of. This is not to imply that such security audits are only beneficial to the organization paying for it. When coming across companies that provide certain services, a reliable third-party security audit goes a long way in instilling trust and confidence over their craft. If the ethical hackers cannot find any major vulnerabilities that can be leveraged by hackers, it just accentuates the technical brilliance of the organization and its engineers, thereby increasing the clientele by a substantial amount. With the rise in censorship and general fear over privacy loss, consumer security is at an all-time high risk. Technology has made our life so much easier while putting up a decent target on our personal information. It is necessary to understand how to simultaneously safeguard our data and be up to date with the latest technological developments. Maintaining this balance has become easier with cryptography taking its place in today's digital world. So here's a story to help you understand cryptography. Meet Anne. Anne wanted to look for a decent discount on the latest iPhone. She started searching on the internet and found a rather shady website that offered a 50% discount on the first purchase. Once Anne submitted her payment details, a huge chunk of money was withdrawn from a bank account just moments after. Devastated, Anne quickly realized she had failed to notice that the website was a HTTP web page instead of an HTTPS one. The payment information submitted was not encrypted and it was visible to anyone keeping an eye, including the website owner and hackers. Had she used a reputed website which has encrypted transactions and employs cryptography, our iPhone enthusiast could have avoided this particular incident. This is why it's never recommended 
to visit unknown websites or share any personal information on them. Now that we understand why cryptography is so important, let's take a look at the topics to be covered today. We take a look into what cryptography is and how it works. We learn where cryptography is being used in our daily lives and how we are benefiting from it. Then we will understand the different types of cryptography and their respective uses. Moving on, we will look at the usage of cryptography in ancient history and a live demonstration of cryptography and encryption in action. Let's now understand what cryptography is. Cryptography is the science of encrypting or decrypting information to prevent unauthorized access. We transform our data and personal information so that only the correct recipient can understand the message. As an essential aspect of modern data security, using cryptography allows the secure storage and transmission of data between willing parties. Encryption is the primary route for employing cryptography by adding certain algorithms to jumble up the data. Decryption is the process of reversing the work done by encrypting information so that the data becomes readable again. Both of these methods form the basis of cryptography. For example, when simply learn is jumbled up or changed in any format, not many people can guess the original word by looking at the encrypted text. The only ones who can are the people who know how to decrypt the coded word, thereby reversing the process of encryption. Any data pre-encryption is called plain text or clear text. To encrypt the message, we use certain algorithms that serve a single purpose of scrambling the data to make them unreadable without the necessary tools. These algorithms are called ciphers. They are a set of detailed steps to be carried out one after the other to make sure the data becomes as unreadable as possible until it reaches the receiver. We take the plain text, pass it to the cipher algorithm and get the encrypted data. This encrypted text is called the cipher text and this is the message that is transferred between the two parties. The key that is being used to scramble the data is known as the encryption key. These steps that is the cipher and the encryption key are made known to the receiver who can then reverse the encryption on receiving the message. Unless any third party manages to find out both the algorithm and the secret key that is being used, they cannot decrypt the messages since both of them are necessary to unlock the hidden content. Wonder what else we would lose if not for cryptography? Any website where you have an account can read your passwords. Important emails can be intercepted and their contents can be read without encryption during the transit. More than 65 billion messages are sent on WhatsApp every day, all of which are secured thanks to end-to-end -to -end encryption. There is a huge market opening up for cryptocurrency, which is possible due to blockchain technology that uses encryption algorithms and hashing functions to ensure that the data is secure. If this is of particular interest to you, you can watch our video on blockchain, the link of which will be in the description. Of course, there is no single solution to a problem as diverse as explained. There are three variants of how cryptography works and is in practice. They are symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption and hashing. Let's find out how much we have understood until now. Do you remember the difference between a cipher and ciphertext? Leave your answers in the comments and before we proceed, if you find this video interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up before moving ahead. Let's look at symmetric encryption first. Symmetric encryption uses a single key for both the encryption and decryption of data. It is comparatively less secure than asymmetric encryption but much faster. It is a compromise that has to be embraced in order to deliver data as fast as possible without leaving information completely vulnerable. This type of encryption is used when data rests on servers and identifies personnel for payment applications and services. The potential drawback with symmetric encryption is that both the sender and receiver need to have the same secret key and it should be kept hidden at all times. Caesar cipher and Enigma machine are both symmetric encryption examples that we will look into further. For example, if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, she can apply a substitution cipher or a shift cipher to encrypt the message. But Bob must be aware of the same key itself so he can decrypt it when he finds it necessary to read the entire message. Symmetric encryption uses one of the two types of ciphers, 
stream ciphers and block ciphers. Block ciphers break the plain text into blocks of fixed size and use the key to convert it into ciphertext. Stream ciphers convert the plain text into ciphertext one bit at a time instead of resorting to breaking them up into bigger chunks. In today's world, the most widely used symmetric encryption algorithm is AES-256 that stands for Advanced Encryption Standard which has a key size of 256-bit with 128-bit and 196-bit key sizes also being available. Other primitive algorithms like the Data Encryption Standard that is the DES, the Triple Data Encryption Standard 3DES and Blowfish have all fallen out of favor due to the rise of AES. AES chops up the data into blocks and performs 10 plus rounds of obscuring and substituting the message to make it unreadable. Asymmetric encryption on the other hand has a double whammy at its disposal. There are two different keys at play here, a public key and a private key. The public key is used to encrypt information pre-transit and a private key is used to decrypt the information post-transit. If Alice wants to communicate with Bob using asymmetric encryption, she encrypts the message using Bob's public key. After receiving the message, Bob uses his own private key to decrypt the data. This way, nobody can intercept the message in between transmissions and there is no need for any secure key exchange for this to work since the encryption is done with the public key and the decryption is done with the private key that no one except Bob has access to. Both the keys are necessary to read the full message. There is also a reverse scenario where we can use the private key for encryption and the public key for decryption. A server can sign non-confidential information using its private key and anyone who has its public key can decrypt the message. This mechanism also proves that the sender is authenticated and there is no problem with the origin of the information. RSA encryption is the most widely used asymmetric encryption standard. It is named after its founders Rivest, Shamir and Edelman and it uses block ciphers that separate the data into blocks and obscure the information. Widely considered the most secure form of encryption, albeit relatively slower than AES, it is widely used in web browsing, secure identification, VPNs, emails and chat applications. With so much hanging on the key's secrecy, there must be a way to transmit the keys without others reading our private data. Many systems use a combination of symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption to bolster security and match speed at the same time. Since asymmetric encryption takes longer to decrypt large amounts of data, the full information is encrypted using a single key, that is, symmetric encryption. That single key is then transmitted to the receiver using asymmetric encryption, so you don't have to compromise either way. Another route is using the Diffie-Hellman key exchange which relies on a one-way function and is much tougher to break into. The third variant of cryptography is termed as hashing. Hashing is the process of scrambling a piece of data beyond recognition. It gives an output of fixed size which is known as the hash value of the original data or just hash in general. The calculations that do the job of messing up the data collection form the hash function. They are generally not reversible without resilient brute force mechanisms and are very helpful when storing data on website servers that need not be stored in plain text. For example, many websites store your account passwords in a hashed format so that not even the administrator can read your credentials. When a user tries to log in, they can compare the entered password's hash value with the hash value that is already stored on the servers for authentication since the function will always return the same value for the same input. Cryptography has been in practice for centuries. Julius Caesar used a substitution shift to move alphabets a certain number of spaces beyond their place in the alphabet table. A spy can't decipher the original message at first glance. For example, if he wanted to pass confidential information to his armies and decides to use the substitution shift of plus 2, A becomes C, B becomes D and so on. The word attack when passed through a substitution shift of plus 3 becomes D W W D E F N. This cipher has been appropriately named the Caesar cipher which is one of the most widely used algorithms. The Enigma is probably the most famous cryptographic cipher device used in ancient history. 
It was used by the Nazi German armies in the world wars. They were used to protect confidential political, military and administrative information and it consisted of three or more rotors that scrambled the original message depending on the machine state at that time. The decryption is similar but it needs both machines to stay in the same state before passing the cipher text so that we receive the same plain text message. Let's take a look at how our data is protected while we browse the internet thanks to cryptography. Here we have a web based tool that will help us understand the process of RSA encryption. We see the entire workflow from selecting the key size to be used until the decryption of the cipher text in order to get the plain text back. As we already know, RSA encryption algorithm falls under the umbrella of asymmetric key cryptography. That basically implies that we have two keys at play here, a public key and a private key. Typically, the public key is used by the sender to encrypt the message and the private key is used by the receiver to decrypt the message. There are some occasions when this allocation is reversed and we will have a look at them as well. In RSA, we have the choice of key size. We can select any key from a 512 bit to 1024 bit all the way up to a 4096 bit key. The longer the key length, the more complex the encryption process becomes and thereby strengthening the ciphertext. Although with added security, more complex functions take longer to perform the same operations on similar size of data. We have to keep a balance between both speed and strength because the strongest encryption algorithms are of no use if they cannot be practically deployed in systems around the world. Let's take a 1024 bit key over here. Now we need to generate the keys. This generation is done by functions that operate on pass phrases. The tool we are using right now generates these pseudo random keys to be used in this explanation. Once we generate the keys, you can see the public key is rather smaller than the private key, which is almost always the case. These two keys are mathematically linked with each other. They cannot be substituted with any other key. And in order to encrypt the original message or decrypt the cipher text, this pair must be kept together. The public key is then sent to the sender and the receiver keeps the private key with himself. In this scenario, let's try and encrypt a word simply learn. We have to select if the key being used for encryption is either private or public since that affects the process of scrambling the information. Since we are using the public key over here, let's select the same and copy it and paste over here. The cipher we are using right now is plain RSA. There are some modified ciphers with their own pros and cons that can also be used provided we use it on a regular basis and depending on the use case as well. Once we click on encrypt, we can see the ciphertext being generated over here. The pseudorandom generating functions are created in such a way that a single character change in the plain text will trigger a completely different ciphertext. This is a security feature to strengthen the process from brute force methods. Now that we are done with the encryption process, let's take a look at the decryption part. The receiver gets this ciphertext from the sender with no other key or supplement. He or she must already possess the private key generated from the same pair. No other private key can be used to decrypt the message since they are mathematically linked. We paste the private key here and select the same. The cipher must always so be the same used during the encryption process. Once we click decrypt, you can see the original plain text we had decided to encrypt. This sums up the entire process of RSA encryption and decryption. Now some people use it the other way around. We also have the option of using the private key to encrypt information and the public key to decrypt it. This is done mostly to validate the origin of the message. Since the keys only work in pairs, if a different private key is used to encrypt the message, the public key cannot decrypt it. Conversely, if the public key is able to decrypt the message, it must have been encrypted with the right private key and hence the rightful owner. Here we just have to take the private key and use that to encrypt the plain text and select the same in this checkbox as well. You can see we have generated a completely new ciphertext. This ciphertext will be sent to the receiver and this time we will use the public key for decryption. Let's select the correct checkbox and decrypt and we still get the same output. Now let's take a look at practical example 
of encryption in the real world. We all use the internet on a daily basis and many are aware of the implications of using unsafe websites. Let's take a look at Wikipedia here. Pretty standard HTTPS website where the H stands for secured. Let's take a look at how it secures our data. Wireshark is the world's foremost and most widely used network protocol analyzer. It lets you see what's happening on your network at a microscopic level and we are going to use this software to see the traffic that is leaving our machine and to understand how vulnerable it is. Since there are many applications running in this machine, let's apply a filter that will only show us the results related to Wikipedia. Let's search for something that we can navigate the website with. Okay, once we get into it a little, you can see some of the requests being populated over here. Let's take a look at the specific request. These are the data packets that basically transport the data from our machine to the internet and vice versa. As you can see, there's a bunch of gibberish data here that doesn't really reveal anything that we searched or watched. Similarly, other secured websites function the same way and it is very difficult, if at all possible, to snoop on user data this way. To put this in perspective, let's take a look at another website, which is a HTTP web page. This has no encryption enabled from the server end, which makes it vulnerable to attacks. There is a login form here, which needs legitimate user credentials in order to grant access. Let's enter a random pair of credentials. These obviously won't work, but we can see the manner of data transfer. Unsurprisingly, we weren't able to get into the platform. Instead, we can see the data packets. Let's apply a similar filter that will help us understand what request this website is sending. These are the requests being sent by the HTTP login form to the internet. If we check here, see, whatever username and password that we are entering, we can easily see it with the Wireshark. Now, we used a dummy pair of credentials. If we select the right data packet, we can find our correct credentials. If any website had asked for our payment information or our legitimate credentials, it would have been really easy to get a hold of these. To reiterate what we have already learned, we must always avoid HTTP websites and just unknown or not trustworthy websites in general because the problem we saw here is just the tip of the iceberg. Even though cryptography has managed to lessen the risk of cyber attacks, it is still prevalent and we should always be alert to keep ourselves safe online. Due to the increase in the network transactions in the modern era, there are often cases when we face some problems regarding network issues. But are they exactly network issues or is somebody spying on us? Well, such cases are regarded as network sniffing cases. But how exactly a hacker hack into a network system? Well, for today's topic, we'll understand the same. Let's take a look at network sniffing. To access the network related information between devices to gain profit or use the hacked data for illegal purpose is known as network sniffing. This is a process where a hacker or a malicious programmer spy into the network devices of our system. They can access different websites that we visit often or see our network habits. Let's take a look at different tools that are suitable for sniffing purpose. Network sniffing tools are softwares that are available on the internet that can be used to sniff into the network. Let's take a look at some of the famous network tools. First one is AWIC. This is a networking sniffing tool which has a specialization in intelligent analysis for network packets. Next is Wireshark. This software tool is best to look into protocol related data packets that are often transmitted 
over the network. And lastly, we have SolarWind Network Packet Sniffer where the performance of this sniffing tool is best where the performance management is to be looked into. Let's take a look at the Wireshark sniffing tool. This is an open source network sniffing software which is specifically designed to attack data packets during the transmission over the network. This type of software uses different color combinations to represent different packets and protocols. Let's take a look at some of the uses for the sniffing software. The first use is it is used to analyze network packets, whereas it can also be used to troubleshoot different network issues which are often used by different engineers to test whether the software or a network device is susceptible to an attack. And lastly, it is also used to check malicious and hacking possibilities on the network. Now that we are completed with the briefing for the software, that is known as Wireshark. Let's take a look at the actual demo, how exactly network sniffing is done. You can directly access the Wireshark software website where you can find the download option and download the most suitable version for your laptop or computer device. After downloading the software, when you install it, you will get something like this. As we can see, these connections are the connections that are connected to my laptop right now. And the difference in the graph that we can see over here represent the traffic on the network that is present. To much better understand what exactly is going on the network, we can access one of them. Let's access the Wi-Fi network on my laptop. After accessing the network, we can see some packet settings like this. These represents the packet transaction that has been made on my network through the internet. And this is how a hacker or a cyber criminal knows how exactly we use a network services. This part of the Wireshark represents different detailed information about the transaction that has been made. And the last section represents some raw data or garbage data. But how exactly a hacker use all this jumbled data and hack into a system? Well, to clarify this, there's an option that can be used that is known as display filter on the Wireshark software. If you want to search for a specific protocol, for example, TCP, we can write TCP in the search filter and search. And now, as we can see, we only get the protocols that are related to TCP. This is how we can differentiate different protocols and access some of them to gain knowledge about what exactly is going on in the network. Let's try accessing some other protocol now. For example, DNS. And as we can see, only the protocol and the data packet that is related to DNS protocol is visible to us. To further enhance the display filter, let's try accessing a different page on the web browser. For example, simplylearn.com. When we access the Simply Learn website, we can see the professional courses that are available. But let's take a look at the changes that has been made on the Wireshark. To know this, let's write TCP and a keyword included contains. And one more thing to include over here is, during the display filter, if you write something that is related to the software, it will represent in a green color, like this. But if you write some error related keywords like this, it will represent in the red. Let's continue with the search setting. Including the contains keyword and writing, simply learn and entering. Now, as we can see, these two related data packets represent the Simply Learn website that we accessed just now, where the source destination IP address represents my system address, whereas the destination, 
that is 13.224.21.74 represent the simply learns IP address. Let's take a look. And in the garbage area or the raw data, we can take a look simply learn website. To see some more details regarding the same, you can access the transport layer security and the transmission control protocol where we can see the source port, the destination port, which is always 443, as well as the flag and the timestamp for the same. This is how hackers get the data about the network settings. But if we want to search for more data related to Simply Learn website that we visited just now, there's an another filter that we can use. For example, using ip.addr space equal equal and writing the IP address for the website Simply Learn. That is 13.224.21.74. And when we press enter, we get all the related data for the Simply Learn website. And this is how we can see the related data. To much for the enhance our display settings, let's try in another example. Access your internet browser and access some other website. For example, dot for example the state university and access the Allahabad State University and some other part in it, for example, the University State PDF. Let's see the changes in our Wireshark settings and try using HTTP. When we write this, we get the data that is related to the HTTP, but what is the use for the same? When you access this and right click on the same, and choose the option follow and HTTP stream. And over here, we can take a look at the host that is the website that we just visited. Now, imagine if we were a hacker and we knew all this, we can access any website that our user visited and we can hack into his system through the website. Guys, but the point that has to be noted over here is if we use the network sniffing tool, Wireshark, or some other tool that is available on the internet for research purpose or experimental use, that's fine. But we shouldn't use all these softwares for any malicious activity because that is illegal. Now, some of the options that we can see are the red box. This action is used if we want to stop the traffic connection. That means if we press this option and clear this and press enter, this shows that the network settings has stopped receiving any traffic that is available on the network. But if we want to access them again, we can choose this blue fin option, continue without saving and the software against start recording the websites or the data packets that are available on the network. Now let's take a look at an example. As we all know, we often visit different websites and there are some cases we often see when the Chrome represent a non-secure option. That represents that the website is unprotected against network attack for example, we can access an experimental website. This is a website that allows us to access the non-secure part of a website. If we write for username as admin1213 and for password as simply learn. and login. As this is an experimental website, it says it's sorry and the login has failed. Let's see the changes in a Wireshark software. Now, as we already did earlier, if we want to access a specific website, we should write TCP 
contains and the keyword of the website that was admin through this we can see this was the website that we visited just now but if we want to access the actual important data that was the password that we typed we can use this option and over here we can see the simply learn which was encrypted earlier in the website this is how a hacker or a cyber criminal use different sniffing softwares and gain data about different users in this video we bring you the best programming languages for hacking here we will give you the top 5 programming languages that will help you enhance your hacking skills first let's understand the importance of knowing programming for hacking you might wonder if programming is a necessity to become a hacker as you might be aware hacking involves breaking the protocols and exploiting a network thus being a hacker requires you to understand the languages of the software that you are focusing on hence it is required that a hacker knows coding having zero coding knowledge will definitely limit your opportunities in the future knowing different programming languages is undoubtedly an asset for hackers everyone wants to become a hacker today however it is not as easy as it is shown in numerous movies it takes plenty of practice and programming knowledge to become an ethical hacking expert if you want to become a hacker it is imperative that you have a knack for programming languages it is a known fact that some of the world's best hackers started off as programmers if you know how to program you will be able to dissect a code and analyze it you can write your scripts or malware that can be used on the victim yes there are several ready made scripts available today However, you might need to apply your skills in case the available scripts don't work well for you. Sometimes when script modification is required, you should be in a position to do that. In such a scenario, zero knowledge of the respective programming language will definitely be a hindrance. Programs can also help you automate multiple tasks which would normally take a lot of time. Codes allow you to penetrate different fields you want to hack. It will help you identify the plan behind an attack and defend against deadly hacking techniques and make your cybersecurity career worthwhile. It will help you understand the working of the target system or application before carrying out an exploit. Now that we have an idea as to why programming is important for hackers, let us understand which programming languages should a hacker learn. There are several programming languages for hacking and it might be overwhelming to choose from the endless list. Here we are to help you with that. Do keep in mind that your choice of programming language will also depend on the type of system you are targeting and your strategy. Let us now move on to the list of the top programming languages that are extensively used by hackers around the world. As you see on your screens, here we have the top 5 programming languages for hackers. Let us go through them one by one. Number 1 on our list is one of the most popular programming languages today that is Python. Python is a general purpose programming language and in the field of hacking it is mainly used for exploit writing. It is referred to as the de facto hacking programming language. It plays a crucial role in writing hacking scripts, exploits and malicious programs. One great feature that makes hacking easy with Python is the availability of ready-made modules. For example, OS modules are available if the target is a native operating system. For networking there is a socket module and a lot more. Python socket programming can be used for discovering vulnerabilities in a system since Python code helps in checking the security integrity of systems and it can also be used to exploit them. Python has a massive community that helps with third party plugins every day. It is also an easy to read language with a simple syntax. This will be helpful for beginners. You can easily write automation scripts using Python and it also makes prototyping much faster. Moving on to our second programming language, we have JavaScript. Currently, JavaScript is one of the best programming languages for hacking web applications. A good understanding of JavaScript allows a hacker to discover vulnerabilities and carry web exploitations since most of their web apps use JavaScript or one of its libraries. Knowing JavaScript will help you discover flaws in web applications. JavaScript can be used to read saved cookies and security experts also use JavaScript to develop cross-site scripting programs for hacking. JavaScript is known for carrying out attacks like cross-site scripting. JavaScript can also be used to spread and reproduce malware and viruses easily. 
Initially, JavaScript was a client-side scripting language. However, with the release of Node.js, it now supports backend development. This implies a larger field for exploitation. A hacker can now use JavaScript to snoop the typed words, inject malicious code, and track browsing history to name a few. Number 3 on our list is PHP. Hypertext Preprocessor or PHP is a dynamic server-side programming language that is used to build websites. Hackers should understand PHP as it will help them understand web hacking techniques better. Especially if you are into web hacking, then getting your hands on PHP would be an asset. PHP is used in server-side scripting. Using PHP, you could write a custom application that modifies settings on a web server and makes the target server susceptible to attacks. With the help of PHP, you can also eliminate any vulnerabilities in your code. PHP is one of the most powerful server-side languages used in most of the web domains. This shows how learning PHP can help you with web hacking and also help you fight against malicious attackers. Popular content management systems run on a foundation of PHP. Hence, having a strong knowledge of PHP can help you protect or compromise such websites. Next on a list of the best programming languages for hackers is SQL. SQL is the acronym for Structured Query Language. Although SQL is not a traditional programming language, it is a language used for only communicating with databases. Several systems like MySQL, PostgreSQL store their data in databases. SQL is used to interact with such databases in order to organize, add, retrieve, delete, or edit data from a database. Having an in-depth knowledge of SQL lets you comprehend the structure of a database, thereby helping you decide which scripts or tools to deploy. SQL is used for the purpose of web hacking. SQL is undoubtedly the best programming language when it comes to hacking into large databases. It will be impossible to counteract database attacks without a good understanding of SQL. Using SQL, hackers can perform an attack known as SQL injection attack. Such an attack enables hackers to access confidential information from databases. SQL is used by hackers to develop various hacking programs based on SQL injection. SQL injection is used to bypass web application login algorithms that are weak. Such an attack can also help a hacker view and modify confidential information from databases. Finally, at number 5, we have the C programming language. It is no surprise that we have C, the mother of all programming languages, on our list. It is used massively in the security field. It helps with exploit writing and development. The low-level nature of C provides an edge over other programming languages used for hacking. A hacker can use the C programming language to his or her advantage when it comes to accessing low-level hardware components such as the RAM. Security professionals mostly use C when they are required to manipulate system resources and hardware. C also helps penetration testers write programming scripts. Most operating systems and computer programs are coded in C language. Hence, learning C, you will help hackers get an overview of the structure of operating systems. C is also used to create shell codes, rootkits, exploits, build undetectable malware, keyloggers, and much more. Sometimes it is also advisable to learn both C and C++ as they both come in handy for hackers. So those were our top 5 programming languages for hackers. Do keep in mind that the most important step of becoming a hacker is to learn various programming languages. It will be great if you can master a variety of programming languages as your target will not be the same always. On that note, in addition to previously mentioned programming languages, we have an additional list of languages that are also well recognized for hacking. Let's have a look at our honorary mention. First, we have Ruby. The Ruby programming language has been used for exploitation for quite some time now. There can be a close comparison drawn between Ruby and Python based on its syntax. However, Ruby is more web-focused. Ruby can be used to write either small or large scripts and can be used interchangeably with bash scripting. It offers good flexibility while writing exploits. Ruby has been used by several hackers to exploit corporate systems. It is not that easy to master Ruby and that is one reason why MNCs look for professionals who know Ruby. Second, we have Perl. Although Perl has lost its old fame, it still holds value in the hacker community for exploit writing. There are systems that still run on Perl as it was the go-to solution once. It is a great language that can help you manipulate Linux text files and help you create tools and exploits. 
pearl code bases still do occupy a considerable portion of corporate tools. Third on our list is HTML. Many of you might have wondered why we didn't mention HTML yet. Yes, no programming list is complete without mentioning HTML. The hypertext markup language HTML is a standard markup language used for creating web pages. It glues the whole internet together and it is the language of the web. This shows the importance HTML has. An understanding of HTML is vital to play with web applications. HTML also finds its use in developing hybrid mobile and desktop apps. HTML is a must if you want to master this field. Having said that, HTML is not that tough a language to learn. Hence, it is advised to master HTML if you want to compromise web applications. And finally, at 4 we have assembly level language. It is undoubtedly one of the most powerful yet hardest programming languages to learn. It is a complicated low-level programming language. For hacking primitive systems, assembly is one of the best programming languages. The best part of assembly is that you can instruct machine hardware or software using it. Assembly language helps a hacker manipulate systems straight up at the architecture level. It is also the most suited coding language to build malware like viruses and trojans. It is considered to be the best language for jobs that are time critical. Reverse engineers use assembly language. For example, if you're interested in software cracking and if you want to reverse engineer a piece of software that has already been compiled, assembly is the go-to choice. As complicated as a language sounds, the results it produces are highly fruitful. So those were the additional programming languages that can help you become a skilled and successful hacker. We should keep in mind that a strong understanding of programming languages help cybersecurity professionals stay on top of cyber criminals. Kali Linux is an operating system that has become a well-known weapon in this fight against hackers. A Linux distribution that is made specifically for penetration testers. Let's start by learning about Kali Linux in general. Kali Linux, which is formerly known as Backtrack Linux, is an open source Linux distribution aimed at advanced penetration testing and security auditing. It contains several hundred tools that are targeted towards various information security tasks such as penetration testing, security research, computer forensics, and reverse engineering. Kali Linux is a multiple platform solution accessible and freely available to information security professionals and hobbyists. Among all the Linux distributions, Kali Linux takes its roots from the Debian operating system. Debian has been a highly dependable and stable distribution for many years, providing a similarly strong foundation to the Kali desktop. While the operating system is capable of practically modifying every single part of our installation, the networking components of Kali become disabled by default. This is done to prevent any external factors from affecting the installation procedure which may pose a risk in critical environments. Apart from boosting security, it allows a deeper element of control to the most enthusiastic of users. We did not get Kali Linux since the first day. How did it come into existence? Let's take a look at some of its history. Kali Linux is based on years of knowledge and experience in building penetration testing and operating systems. During all these project lifelines, there have been only a few different developers as the team has always been small. The first project was called WAPEX, which stands for White Hat NOPEX. As can be inferred from the name, it was based on the NOPEX operating system as its underlying OS. WAPEX had releases ranging from version 2.0 to 2.7. This made way for the next project which was known as Wax, or the long hand being White Hat Slacks. The name change was because the base OS was changed from Nopix to Slacks. Wax started at version 3 as a nod, it carrying on from Wapix. There was a similar OS being produced at the same time, Auditor Security Collection, often being shorter to just Auditor, which was once again using Nopix. Its efforts were combined with Wax to produce Backtrack. Backtrack was based on Slackware from version 1 to version 3 but switched to Ubuntu later on with version 4 to version 5. Using the experience gained from all of this, Kali Linux came after Backtrack in 2013. Kali started off using Debian Stable as the engine under the hood before moving to Debian testing when Kali Linux became a rolling operating system. Now that we understand the history and the purpose of Kali Linux, 
Let us learn a little more about its distinct features. The latest version of Kali comes with more than 600 penetration tools pre-installed. After reviewing every tool that was included in Backtrack, developers have eliminated a great number of tools that either simply did not work or which duplicated other tools that provided the same or similar functionality. The Kali Linux team is made up of a small group of individuals who are the only ones trusted to commit packages and interact with the repositories, all of which is done using multiple secure protocols. Restricting access of critical code bases to external assets greatly reduces the risk of source contamination, which can cause Kali Linux users worldwide a great deal of damage as a direct victim of cybercrime. Although penetration tools tend to be written in English, the developers have ensured that Kali includes true multilingual support, allowing more users to operate in their native language and locate the tools they need for the job. The more comfortable a user feels with the intricacies of the operating system, the easier it is to maintain a stronghold over the configuration and the device in general. Since ARM-based single board systems like the Raspberry Pi are becoming more and more prevalent and inexpensive, the development team knew that Kali's ARM support would need to be as robust as they could manage with fully working installations. Kali Linux is available on a wide range of ARM devices and has ARM repositories integrated with the mainline distributions, so the tools for ARM are updated in conjunction with the rest of the distribution. All this information is necessary for users to determine if Kali Linux is the correct choice for them. If it is, what are the ways that they can go forward with this installation and start their penetration testing journey? The first way to use Kali Linux is by launching the distribution in the live USB mode. This can be achieved by downloading the installer image file or the ISO file from the Kali Linux website and flashing it to a USB drive with a capacity of at least 8 GB. Some people don't need to save their data permanently and a live USB is the perfect solution for such cases. After the ISO image is flashed, the thumb drive can be used to boot a fully working installation of the operating system with the caveat that any changes made to the OS in this mode are not written permanently. Some cases allow persistent usage in live USBs, but those require further configuration than normal situations. But what if the user wants to store data permanently in the installed OS? The best and the most reliable way to ensure this is the full-fledged hard disk installation. This will ensure the complete usage of the system's hardware capabilities and will take into account the updates and the configurations being made to the OS. This method is supposed to override any pre-existing operating system installed on the computer, be it Windows or any other variant of Linux. The next alternative route for installing Kali Linux would be to use virtualization software such as VMware or VirtualBox. The software will be installed as a separate application on an already existing OS and Kali Linux can be run as an operating system in the same computer as a window. The hardware requirements will be completely customizable, starting with the allotted RAM to the virtual hard disk capacity. The usage of both a host and guest operating system like Kali Linux allows users a safe environment to learn while not putting their systems at risk. If you want to learn more about how one can go forward with this method, we have a dedicated video where Kali Linux is being installed on VMware while running on a Windows 10 operating system. You can find the link in the description box to get started with your very own virtual machine. The final way to install Kali Linux is by using a dual boot system. To put it in simple words, the Kali Linux OS will not be overwriting any pre-installed operating system on a machine but will be installed alongside it. When a computer boots up, the user will get a choice to boot into either of these operating systems. Many people prefer to keep both the Windows and Kali Linux installed, so the distribution of work and recreational activities is also allotted effectively. It gives users a safety valve should their custom Linux installation run into any bugs that cannot be fixed from within the operating system. There are multiple ways to install Kali Linux. We can either install it on a normal hard drive, in a virtual machine software such as VMware or VirtualBox, or we can do that in hard bare metal machines. Now for the convenience of explanation, we're going to install Kali Linux today on a virtual machine software known as VMware. VMware is able to run multiple operating systems on a single host machine, which in our case is a Windows 10 system. To get started with Kali Linux installation, we have to go 
to their website to download an image file. You go to Get Kali. And as you can see, there are multiple platforms on which this operating system can be inverted. As per our requirement, we are going to go with the virtual machine section. As you can see, it is already recommended by the developers. This is the download button which will download a 64-bit ISO file. We can download 32-bit, but that is more necessary for hard metal machines or if you are going to use it for older devices which do not support 64-bit operating systems yet. After clicking on the download button, we can see we have a window archive which will have the ISO files. For now, we have downloaded the ISO file and it is already present with me. So we can start working on the VMware side of things. Once the ISO file is downloaded, we open up VMware Workstation. Go to File and we create a new virtual machine. In these two options, it is highly recommended to go with the typical setup rather than the custom one. The custom is much more advanced and requires much more information from the user, which is beneficial for developers and people who are well versed with virtualization software. But for 90% of the cases, typical setup will be enough. Here we can select the third option, which will be I will install the operating system later. In some operating systems, we can use the ISO file here directly and VMware will install it for us. But for right now, in the case of Kali Linux, the third option is always the safest. Kali Linux is a Linux distribution. So we can select Linux over here and the version, as you can see here, it have multiple versions such as the multiple kernels. Every distribution has a, a parent distribution. For example, Kali Linux has Debian and there are other distributions which are based or forked from some parent distribution. Kali Linux is based of Debian. So we can go with the highest version of Debian, which is the Debian 10.x 64-bit. Go on next. We can write any such name. We can write Kali Linux so that it will be easier to recognize the virtual machine among this list of virtual machine instances. The location can be any location you decide to put. By default, it should be the documents folder, but anywhere you put, it will hold up all the information of the operating system. All the files you download, all the configurations you store, everything will be stored in this particular location that you provide. When we go next, we are asked about the disk capacity. This disk capacity will be all the storage that will be provided to your virtual machine of Kali Linux. Think of your Windows device. If you have a one terabyte of hard drive, you have the entirety of the hard disk to store data on. How much data you give here, you can only store up to that amount of data. Not to mention some amount of capacity will be taken up by the operating system itself to store its programs and applications. For now, we can give around, let's say 15 GB of information. Or if it recommended size for Debian is 20, we can just go ahead at 20. It depends all on the user case. If you are going to use it extensively, you can even go as high as 50 or 60 GB if you have plans to download many more applications and perform multiple different tests. Another option we get over here is storing virtual disks as a single file or storing them into multiple files. As we already know, this virtual machine run entirely on VMware. Sometimes when transferring these virtual machine instances, let's say from a personal computer to a work computer, we're going to need to copy up the entire folder that we had mentioned before over here. Instead, all virtual machines have a portability feature. Now this portability feature is possible for all scenarios, except it is much easier if the split the virtual disk into multiple files. Now, even if this makes porting virtual machines easier from either system to system or software to software, let's say if you want to switch from VMware to VirtualBox or vice versa, the performance takes a small hit. It's not huge, but it's recommended to go with storing the virtual disk as a single file if you have no purposes of ever moving the virtual machine. Even if you do, it's not a complete stop that it cannot be ported. It's just easier when using multiple files. But in order to get the best performance out of the virtual machine, we can store it as a single file over here. This is a summary of all the changes that we made and all the configurations that have been settled until now. 
Now at this point of time, we have not provided the .iso file yet, which is the installation file for the Kali Linux that we downloaded from this website. As of right now, we have only configured the settings of the virtual machine. So we can press on finish. And we have Kali Linux in the list. Now, to make the changes further, we press on edit virtual machine settings. The memory is supposed to give the RAM of the virtual machine. So devices with RAM of 8 GB or below that, giving high amount of RAM will cause performance issues and the host system. If the memory has some amount of free storage left, let's say on idle storage, my Windows machine takes about 2 GB. So I have 6 GB of memory to provide. Although if you provide all of the 6 GB, it will be much more difficult for the host system to run everything properly. So for this instance, we can keep it as 2 GB of memory for the virtual machine instance. Similarly, we can use the number of processors and we can customize it according to our liking. Let's say if we want to use one processor, but we want to use two different cores, we can select them as well. Hard disk is pre-set up as the SCSI hard disk and it does not need to be changed for the installation of this operating system at all. CDID DVD. This is where the installation file comes. You can think of the ISO file that we downloaded as a pen drive or a USB thumb drive, which is necessary to install an operating system. To provide this, we're going to select use ISO image file. We're going to click on browse. Go and go to downloads and select the ISO file over here. Select open. And you can see it is already loaded up. Next, in the network adapter, it is recommended to use NAT. This helps the virtual machine to draw the internet from the host machine settings. If your host machine is connected to the internet, then the virtual machine is connected as well. There are some other options such as host only or custom segments or LAN segments, but those are not necessary for installation. Rest of them are pretty standard, which do not need any extra configuration and can be left as it is. Press OK. And now we can power on this virtual machine. In this screen, we can choose how we want to proceed with the installation. We have a start installer option over here. So we're going to press enter on that. We're going to wait for the things to load from the ISO file. Um, the first step in the installation is choosing the language of the operating system. For this, we can go with English as standard. This is a location. This will be used for setting up the time and some of the internal settings which depend entirely on the location of the user. So for this, we're going to go with India. Configuring the keyboard, it's always recommended to go with the American English first. Many people make a mistake of going with the Indian keyboard if it is possible and it provides a lot of issues later on. So it's always preferred to go with the American English and if later we see some necessity of another keyboard dialect that is required, we can install it later. But for now, we should always stick with American English as a basic. At this point, it's going to load the installation components from the .iso file. It is a big file of 3.6 GB, so it has a lot of components that need to be put into the virtual machine, which can also be used to detect hardware. Once the hardware and the network configuration is done by the ISO file, we want to write a host name for the system. This host name can be anything which is used to recognize this device on a local network or a LAN cable. Let's say if we use the name Kali. Domain name, we can skip it for now. It's not necessary as such for the installation. This is the full name for the user. Let's say we can provide the name as simply learn as a full name. Next, we're going to set up a username. This username is going to be necessary to identify the user from its root accounts and the subsequent below accounts. For now, we can give it as something as simply one, two, three. 
Now we have to choose a password for the user. Now remember since this is the first user that is being added onto this newly installed operating system, it needs to be a password for the administrator. We can use whichever password we like over here and use the same password below and press on continue. At this point it's going to detect on the components on which the operating system can be installed. Like here, there are multiple options like the use entire disk, use entire disk and set up LVM, use entire disk and set up encrypted LVM. For newcomers, it is recommended to just use the first one since LVM encryption is something that you can learn afterwards when you're much more hands-on with the Linux operating system. For now, we're going to use the use entire disk guided installation and press on continue. When we set up the virtual machine on VMware, we had set up a disk capacity. There we gave a purpose 20 GB. That is the hard disk which is being discovered here. Even though it is a virtual disk, on VMware it acts as a normal hard disk on which an operating system can be installed. So we select this one and press on continue. Here there is a multiple partition system. All the operating systems that are installed have different components. One is used for the keeping of the applications, one for the files, other for the RAM management and other things. For newcomers, it is always recommended to keep it in one partition. And we're going to select that and press on continue. This is just an overview of the partition it's going to make. As you can see, it has a primary partition of 20.4 GB and a logical partition of 1 GB used for swap memory. Now these kind of naming can be confusing for people who are not well versed with Linux operating systems or in general virtualization. But for now you can go ahead and press on continue as this will be fine. You can press on finish partitioning and write changes to disk and continue. It's just a confirmation page. As you can see it's so that SCSI3 is our virtual hard disk of 20 GB disk capacity. We write the changes to the disk. We press yes and click on continue. At this point the installation has started. Now this installation will take a while depending on the num amount of RAM provided, the processors provided and how quickly the performance of the system is being hampered by the host machine. On quicker systems this will be rather quick while on the smaller ones this will take a while. Since this is going to take some time to install as it is being run on a virtual machine with only 2 GB of RAM. We're going to speed up this part of the video so we don't have to waste any more time just watching the progress bar. Now that our core installation is completed, it's asking us to configure a package manager. The work of a package manager on Linux operating system is similar to the Google Play Store on Android mobile devices and on the App Store for the Apple devices. It's an interface to install external applications which are not installed by default. Let's say for Google Chrome or any other browser which can be used to browse the internet. At this point of time, it's asked us to select a network mirror. We're going to select as yes and move forward with this. Next, it's going to ask us for an HTTP proxy, which we can leave it as blank and press it as continue forward. At this point of time, it's looking for updates to the Kali Linux installation. This will fetch the new builds from the Kali server, so the installation is always updated to the latest version. Now that the package manager is configured, we have the grub bootloader. The grub is used for selecting the operating system while booting up. Its core functionality is to allow the operating system to be loaded correctly without any faults. So at this point of time, if it asks install the grub bootloader to your primary dive, we can select it as yes and press continue. Remember the installation was conducted on dev SDA. So we're going to select installation of the grub loader on the same hard disk that we have configured. We press this one and press continue. So now the grub bootloader is being installed. The grub is highly essential because it, is, it shows the motherboard where to start the operating system from. Even if the operating system is installed correctly and all the files are in correct order, 
the absence of a bootloader will not be able to launch the OS properly. As you can see, the installation is finally complete. So now we can press on continue and it's going to finalize the changes. Now you can see Kali Linux being booted up straight away. It doesn't check for the ISO file anymore since the operating system is now installed onto the virtual hard disk storage that we had configured before. Here we're going to enter our username and password that we had set up before. And we have the Kali Linux system booted up. And this is your home page. We can see the installed applications over here which are being used for penetration testing by multiple security analysts worldwide. All of these come pre-installed with Kali Linux and others can be installed using the APT package manager that we had configured. We can see a full name over here. And with this, our installation of the Kali Linux is complete. In today's world, an organization's most valuable asset is its information or data. This is true for all kinds of businesses, be it public or private. On a daily basis, they all deal with enormous amounts of sensitive information. As a consequence, terrorist groups, hacking teams and cyber thieves often attack them. To ensure their safety and protection, businesses use a variety of security measures and regularly update their index. Organizations must be proactive in this age of digitalization by regularly assessing and updating their security. Every day, hackers discover new methods to breach firewalls. Ethical hackers or white hat hackers provide a fresh perspective on security. They conduct penetration tests to validate security measures. Generally, they will penetrate your networks and give you relevant information about your security posture. Once an organization has this knowledge, it may upgrade its security procedures accordingly. The latest version of Kali Linux comes with more than 600 penetration tools pre-installed. After reviewing every tool that was included in Backtrack, developers have eliminated a great number of tools that either simply did not work or which duplicated other tools that provided the same or similar functionality. Occasionally, when conducting penetration testing or hacking, we must automate our activities since there may be hundreds of conditions and payloads to test and manually examining everything is time consuming. To improve our productivity, we utilize tools that come pre-packaged with Kali Linux. These tools not only save us time, but also accurately capture and process the data. The Kali Linux team is made up of a small group of individuals who are the only ones trusted to commit packages and interact with the repositories all of which is done using multiple secure protocols. Restricting access of critical code bases to external assets greatly reduces the risk of source contamination. Although penetration tools tend to be written in English, the developers have ensured that Kali includes true multilingual support, allowing more users to operate in the native language and locate the tools they need to do for the job. Since ARM-based single board systems like the Raspberry Pi are becoming more and more prevalent and inexpensive, the development team knew that Kali's ARM support would need to be as robust as they could manage with fully working installations. Kali Linux is available on a wide range of ARM devices and has ARM repositories integrated with the mainline distribution, so tools for ARM are updated in conjunction with the rest of the distribution tools. Let's begin with some terminal basics on Kali Linux. When most people hear the term Linux, they envision a complex operating system used only by programmers. However, the experience is not as frightening as it appears. Linux is an umbrella term for a collection of free and open source Unix operating systems. There are many variants like Ubuntu, Fedora, Debian. These are distributions, which is, will be a more precise term. When using a Linux operating system, you will most likely utilize a shell, 
which is a command line interface that provides access to the operating system services. The majority of Linux distributions ship with a graphical user interface, also known as GUI, as their primary shell. This is done to facilitate user interaction in the first place. Having said that, a command line interface is suggested due to its increased power and effectiveness. By entering the commands into the CLI, tasks that require a multi-step GUI procedure may be completed in a matter of seconds. We can start the terminal by clicking on the prompt icon here on top. Once the terminal is open, we can put up a command. Use another command known as mkdir, which is supposed to stand for make directory and I write nf2, shortage for new folder 2. If I open up the nf, you can see the new folder is created. This is how the pwd command works. Another important command to change directories, it's called the cd command. Let's say right now if I am in nf, I want to create a new file in nf2 folder or something else in the nf2 folder. I have to shift to cd nf2. Now if I write pwd, it will show the present working directory of home, simply learn, desktop, nf and inside that I am in nf2 right now. It is done to navigate through the Linux files and disk directories. It requires either the full path or just the name of the directory. If we have to move a completely different folder on a completely different file, then we can use the entire path like this. For now, cd works. Another few commands is we can write cd dot dot and it will come back one folder. Now the pwd will be just nf and not nf2. Let's say we are in this folder and we want to go a different file. Let's say if we just go for cd home. Simply learn. That's it. Right now, these are the folders in our current present working directory. We have the desktop, the documents, downloads, etc. From here, we can again go to the desktop using the same cd command. Cross check the changing of directories and check the files again and yes there we go nf how do we know this what are the command that we are used to show the files and folders that folder is known as the ls command ls can be used to view the contents of a directory by default this command will display the contents of your current working directory if we add some other parameters we can find the contents of other directories as well there are some hidden files as well in Linux which cannot be showed just with ls. For example, if we just go to cd etc which is a configuration folder for Linux. If we write ls now, these are the files that can be seen. If we want to see the hidden files, we'll have to add one more parameter here like ls minus a and as you can see the number of files have increased this time around. There are other things as well that we can see with Linux ls minus al will show the hidden files along with some of the parameters and some of the permissions that has been provided for each file. As you can see many of these files have root access, some of them can write, some of them can read. It differs file to file and the ls minus al command is used to check each of these files permission and change them accordingly if needed. The next command that we can look for is the cat command or concatenate. It is one of the most frequently used commands and it is used to list the contents of a file on the output. For example, let's say if I have a file at the desktop. In this nf2 folder, I will create a document, create an empty file, e file. I'll open up the document and I'll write it as hello Kali. I will save this up. Now to change the directories from etc to nf2, we have already discussed how to use the cd command using just the folder name. Now if we want to go to the entire directory, we can write cd home as you can see, it is already prompting us to complete the name of the directory. At this point, we just have to press tab and it completes it for us. Next, we already know we have to enter the desktop, nf and nf2. 
and this brings us to the current working directory. Here if we press ls, we can find a file over here. Now as discussed for the concatenate, it is used to show the contents of a file. So right now if we press cat, which stands for concatenate, e file. As you can see, we have written hello Kali in the text file and we can see the output right now. We can also use it to create new files. For example, if we write cat, any file name such as efile2. Here we can write anything. Hello, Kali. Again. Once we press Ctrl C here, we can check efile2 and we have hello Kali again printed over here. We can see the same using the concatenate command as well. If I press ls, you can see we have two files here. And I can go with cat efile2 and I have hello Kali again. This is how the concatenate command works. Apart from this, it can be used to copy. There is a different command like called cp which is used to copy the files from one place to another. Mind you this is not moving, this is only going to copy the command. For example, currently our pwd which is the present fucking directory is in the nf2 folder as you can see over here. Let's copy the e file to to the nf folder. We can write cp e file to and give the path of the nf folder which will be home simply learn desktop and nf. Now if I press ls I'll find both the files in nf2 since I copied. To go back to the nf folder again we can again use the same command of no, no, uh, we can again use the home, simply learn, desktop, and just nf. No nf2 this time, just nf. As you can see, this will change back our present working directory. Now when we press ls, we will find the e file to file and the nf2 folder. And we can confirm this using the GUI as well. This is the nf folder, and you can see the nf2 folder and the e file to document. If I write cat e file 2, cat e file 2, we can see the contents of the file. Now, this can be done using moving as well. For example, if I go to cd nf2, which is the inside folder, it has both the document files like e file and e file 2. Let's say I want to move the e file completely from nf2 to nf1. Instead of writing cp, the command I'm going to use is mv mv e file and again give the path of the folder into which I have to copy which will be again home simply learn desktop and nf as you can see the contents of the nf2 have appeared here and e file has been moved from nf2 to nf this is this nf2 and we do, don't find e file here anymore. If we press cd dot dot and we go back to nf ls right now and we can find both the files e file that we moved and e file to that we copied from the nf2 folder. So this is how copying and moving will work using the terminal. Now this is just a simple one line statement that might take a couple of clicks when using GUI. This is why the command line interface is considered to be much more streamlined for Linux operating systems. Another very important com command for Linux operating system is the sudo command. sudo is short for super user do. The command enables you to perform tasks that require administrative or root permissions. You can think of it as how we run programs as administrator on Windows systems. It is not advisable to use this command for daily use because it might be easy for an error to occur and the permissions of root are very intricate. So new beginners are advice to use the sudo command only when absolutely necessary. For example, sudo su. With this command, I am giving this terminal a root permission. This su stands for this user. At this point, it's going to ask for my admin password. Once I enter my password, and I now have root access. Note how the password that I entered did not show up here. This is a security measure to prevent people from snooping on your root password, which is the end game of all this operating system. As you also can see, the symbol changed. If the dollar symbol is showing, it's source as a standard user. 
when you switch to root, you can easily see a hash symbol. This opens up a separate shell inside this terminal command. For example, we can exit out of the root user to the standard user using the command exit. And once again, we have the dollar sign and the root has vanished over here. There are some commands that will only work with administrative access. For example, when updating the Kali Linux system, we have to use apt update. As you can see, it says problem unlinking the file because permission denied. Now let's try this using sudo, sudo apt update. As you can see, it is updating the package repositories, which work as the software installed on the system. This can be done using either writing the sudo command every time we want to perform a root access, or we can just write sudo su once and write apt update alone. The fetching is complete over here. For the second example, let's say I just write sudo su and this time it's not going to ask me the password because at this current terminal process, I've already provided the root password once and it is in memory right now. Now, when we used to update the system, we had to write sudo apt update. That was because we were running it as a standard user. Now we are running it as a root user. So all we have to write is apt update and it's going to continue its work. There you go. Another command that can be useful is the ping command. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's going to be checking the internet connectivity. You can be used to check internet connectivity or you can see if the, there is a local server on your system which needs to be pinged. Then you can check that. For example, if you have to write ping and we can use either IP address or domain. Let's say if you want to check that if we can access google.com using this Kali Linux installation or not. We can write ping google.com and you can see it shows the bytes being sent and received and how much time it took to take up the request. This can be done for local systems as well. For example, this installation of Kali Linux is being run on a virtual machine. Once this machine is running, I still have my uh, host machine running over here. The IP address of which is 192.168.29.179. If I try to ping this from here, As you can see, the time to complete the request is drastically low compared to a website on the internet, considering this is on the local network. This is how the ping command is worked and it can show you what kind of packages are transmitted, how many are received, if there was any kind of packet loss between the connection window and other details. A very important command when working with the terminal for a long duration is the history command. Pretty self-explanatory, there are so many commands that are being run Sometimes people forget what was the change they did or what was the directory name they put. A history command helps to recover some of the commands that you have written. It doesn't go all the way back, but it takes up many commands that were inputted in the last few processes. This is how the history command works. These are some of the most commonly used terminal commands. If you want to learn more about this terminal and every other feature of this, please let us know in the comment section and we will try to make an in-depth tutorial, especially if you could repeat. If you want to learn more about the terminal, please let us know in the comment section and we will try to make an in-depth tutorial specifically for terminal commands on Linux. Moving on, we learn how to configure proxy chains on our system. Proxying refers to the technique of bouncing your internet traffic through multiple machines to hide the identity of the original machine. It is a good tool that hackers use to accomplish this goal is proxy chains. Essentially, you can use proxy chains to run any program to a proxy server. This will allow you to access internet from behind a restrictive firewall which hides your IP address. Proxy chains even allows you to use multiple proxies at once by chaining them together. One of the most important reasons that proxy chains is used in a security context is that it's easy to evade detection. Attackers often use proxies to hide their true identities while executing an attack. And when multiple proxies are chained together, 
it becomes harder and harder for forensic professional to trace the traffic back to the original machine. When these proxies are located across countries, investigators would have to obtain warranties in the local jurisdictions where every proxy is located. To, to see how proxy chain works, let's open Firefox first and check our current IP address. Right, Firefox and there we go. As we can see, Firefox is now open. Let's check our current IP address right now. If we go to an address called myip.com and you can see it easily detects our country is in India and this is a public IP address. Now, if we move to the terminal again, here we can now write proxy chains minus h what this minus h does is it finds a help it uh, it stands for the help file this is for help file what we found out using this is proxy chains has a config file here etc proxy chains 4.conf this is the config file found using this config file we can customize how our proxy chain should work if we want to open that we have to use it in a text editor. On Windows, we have Notepad and other things like that, Microsoft Word to edit documents. On Linux, we have a tool called Nano. To access the Nano, we use the command Nano and give the path of the file that we want to check. As of right now, the proxy chains config file is located over here. So we're going to follow the path there. Chains 4.conf And here we go. We see the config file. There are three basic types of proxy chaining here. We have a strict chain where all the proxy in the list will be used and they will be chained in order. We have a random chain where each connection made through proxy chains will be done by a random combo of proxies in the proxy list. And you have a dynamic chain. It's the same as strict chain, but dead proxies are excluded from the chain. And here we can set up whichever type we want. To enable or disable a particular type, we use the hash symbol here. As you can see right now, all the lines have a hashtag symbol at the front, except this one, a dynamic chain. This is the current one being used. Let's say if I want to use a strict chain method, so I can add a hash value here and remove the hash here. At one point of time, any one of these three, four types should be enabled. Let's go for the Dynam um, dynamic chain. We can disable this strict chain by putting the hashtag in front and removing the dynamic chain. As you can see below, we have few commands to how to handle the nano text editor. This symbol is known as the control button on your keyboard. Now if we want to write out, which is synonymous to saving the file, supposed to go with control O. So if I press control O on my keyboard, it says file name to write and we have to press enter here since we want to overwrite the proxy chains 4.conf file. We don't want to create a new file over here. So just press enter and we get a permission denied. This permission denied we're getting is because we have opened this using a standard user. ETC is a system folder. To be able to use make some changes, we have to use it using a sudo command. To exit this nano, we have to use the control X command. We use control X. We're going to clear. And this time we're going to use the sudo command. sudo nano etc proxy chains 4.conf. And we have the same file open up again. Now this time if we want to make a change, let's say we're going to add a strict chain instead of a dynamic chain. We remove the hashtag from strict. We're going to use control O for the save file option. We're going to press enter and it says wrote 160 lines. Again, if you want to reverse this change, we put the hashtag over here, enable dynamic chain. We press control O, press enter and it says wrote 160 lines. 
Now we can exit straight away using the Ctrl X format. Right now we have not provided any file or a proxy chain. We can have proxy IP addresses from the internet but we have to make sure that they are safe and they don't snoop on our data. When there is no proxy chains being provided personally, it going, it's going to use the Tor network but for that we have to start Tor. Tor is a service in Linux. To know more about the store, we can write sudo systemctl which is used to know the status of services on the Linux operating system and status of Tor. Uh, system CTL, sorry, uh, as instead of STL, it should be system CTL status Tor. As you can see, it is a Tor service, anonymizing overlay network for TCP connections, and it's currently inactive. Now, to start this up, we have to write sudo system CTL start Tor. Now, if we repeat the same sudo system CTL status Tor, as you can see, it's active now. You can see the green logo over here. Okay. To integrate the Firefox and the browser, we can use the proxy chains command directly over here. We can write proxy chains. We can use Firefox to launch our web browser. And let's say if we want to visit google.com, we press enter. And the Firefox window is launched. And it should open up google.com next. And there we go. If we go to myip.com once again, as you can see, we have a different IP address and the country is a known as well. So this is how we can use proxy chains to anonymize uh, uh, internet usage when using Kali Linux. Next on our agenda is the ability to scan networks using Nmap. At its core, Nmap is a network scanning tool that uses IP packets to identify all the devices connected to a network. You can learn more about Nmap using the help file. As you can see, these are some of the parameters that can be used when scanning ports of a system. You can see the version and the URL of the web of the service over here. The primary uses of Nmap can be broken into three core processes. First, the program gives you detailed information on every app IP active on your network and then each IP can then be scanned. Secondly, it can also be used to providing a lot of live hosts and open ports as well as identifying the OS of every connected device. Thirdly, Nmap has also become a valuable tool for users looking to protect personal and business websites. Using Nmap to scan your own web server, particularly if you are hosting your website from home, is essentially simulating the process that a hacker would use to attack your site. Attacking your own site in this way is a powerful way of identifying security vulnerabilities. As we already discussed, the host Windows 10 machine on this system has an IP address a 192.168.29.179. If you want to test the OS scan of this system, we're going to first get the root permission over here. We use the sudo command and now we are a root user. We're going to launch the command nmap minus o, which is supposed to be an OS detection scan. The IP address we can use of the host system 192.168.29.179. In a legitimate penetration testing scenario, we can use the IP address of the vulnerable digit device over here. We are going to let it scan for a while and it's going to give us some guesses on what can the OS be. As you can see the scan is done and it has shown some of the ports that are open. You can see the MSRPC port open at the HTTPS 443 port open which is used to connect to the internet and it has some aggressive OS guesses as well. For example, it thinks there's a 90% 94% chance that it's going to be a Microsoft Windows XP Service Pack 3. That's partly because a lot of the Windows XP update packages are still prevalent on Windows. Now that the OS detection is confirmed, there are multiple more details that we can gather from Nmap. Let's go with the Nmap minus A command, which is supposed to capture as much data as possible. There is also a speed setting. You can call it a speed setting or a control setting of the minus T. 
minus t ranges from t0 to t1 to t2 all the way up to t5. This basically determines how aggressively the victim is being scanned. If you scan slowly, it will take more time to provide the results, but it will also give a less chance for the intrusion detection system on the vulnerable machine firewall to detect that someone is trying to penetrate the network. For now, if we want to go with somewhat of a high speed, we can go with the T4 and provide the same IP address of the local machine I am trying to attack. It's going to take a little bit of time since it's trying to capture a lot of information. As you can see, the results are now here. It, it launched a scan and took a few top ports that are most likely vulnerable from a Windows XP perspective and it showed a few ports over here. It has not shown 991 filtered ports which could not be attacked anyway since they were closed for outside access. It shows a few fingerprint settings like the connection policies and the port details. It shows an HTTP options, some other intricate details that can be used when you attacking its servers. It shows a VMware version that it's running and some few other ports over here. Apart from that, we also have the aggressive OS guesses over here, just like we did with the minus O. And you can see this time, it is showing Windows 7 as 98%. No exact OS matches, since uh, if there was any exact OS matches, we could have seen a 100% chances over here. The, this is a trace route. A trace route will be the time and the path a connection request takes from the source to the destination. For example, this request went from 192.168.72.2 to a destination address. Since this is a local machine, it took only a single step. On multiple occasions, if you're trying to access a remote system, it's going to be a number of trace routes when it jumps from firewall to firewall and router to router. This is how we can use Nmap to find information about a system and find some vulnerable ports we can access. Moving on, we have a tutorial on how to use Wireshark to sniff network traffic. To start using Wireshark, we're going to have to open the application first. Now during installation of Wireshark, there is an option to enable if non-root users can be able to capture traffic or not. In my installation, I have disabled that. So I will be launching Wireshark when using the root user itself. Also, to capture data, we need an external Wi-Fi adapter. You can see it over here in the VM tab, Removable Devices, RELink A02.1 and WLAN. This is an external Wi-Fi adapter which is inserted into my USB system can see it over here. If I write iwconfig, this is the one, WLAN 0. This is absolutely necessary because we need to have a monitor mode required. We won't need it for sniffing data on Wireshark right now, but it's going to be necessary later on in this tutorial as well, as we will see. For now, we can just start up Wireshark by writing its name on the command line and it should start the program. Here we go. Here it's going to check which of the adapters we want to use. For example, right now the ETH0, which is supposed to stand for Ethernet 0 port, you can see data is being transmitted up and down. We're going to select ETH0. And we have started capturing data. You can see the data request from the source to destination, from the time and the which protocol it is following. Everything we can see and we can see the IPv4 flags here as well. As you can see over here. To capture internet traffic, we can try running Firefox. If we just write wikipedia.com And you can see the number of requests increasing. Okay, this is spelling mistake, Wikipedia. Yeah, 
you can see the application data of all these requests going up and they're connected to a destination server of 102.166.224. Now if we, even if we check the transmission control protocol flags over here and so many more things, we cannot find anything beneficial. As you can see the information over here is gibberish which is supposed to be since it's supposed to be encrypted. Now this is possible due to this being an HTTPS website hence you can see the lock symbol over here and connection is supposed to be secure. Now what about HTTP ports? We have seen a many people recommend to not visit HTTP ports. Repeat. We have seen many people recommend to not visit HTTP websites and even if we have to visit to not provide any critical information. For example, let's go to a random HTTP page over here. As you can see, this is saying connection is not secure and this is an HTTP, HTTP page and not HTTPS. Now let's check for some of the information that is passing through this. This is a login form. Let's say I have a legitimate account over here. If I write my account name and my password is supposed to be password1234. I press login and uh, the password does not match because I do not have an account over here. But let's say I did and I was logged in as expected. We can go to Wireshark. We can use filters over here. Now all the requests that I am sending, it's a TCP request. So I can write a filter containing TCP contains whatever string if it is being passed. Let's say for the end username, I write my account name. So I can just write my account name over here and press enter to find a request over here. Now as you can see, there are many flags over here. If we go to the HTML form URL encoded and open up some of its flags, as you can see, I can see my account name and simply learn password over here. This is the same uh, details that I input on the website. Let's say I did have a legitimate account on this website. I would have logged in with no problems, but anyone who would be using Wireshark to sniff on the data can easily get my credentials from here. This is why it's recommended to not provide any information on HTTP pages. The security is not up to the mark and always look for the lock symbol when visiting any website or making any internet transactions or providing any information. This is how we can use Wireshark to detect transmission and sniff packet data that is being transferred through the network adapter. Next, we have to learn about what is Metasploit. The Metasploit project is a computer security project that provides information about security vulnerabilities and aids in penetration testing and IDS development. We can open up the terminal here. We're going to allow root access. And to open up Metasploit, the keyword is MSF console. It's going to take a little bit of time to start it up. Now the Metasploit console has been loaded. From here, we can decide what type of attack we want to launch and what kind of exploits we can launch against vulnerable targets. For example, like we had already discussed, I'm running this virtual machine on a Windows 10 host machine. So if I open the command prompt for my Windows 10 over here, if I need to check the IP address once, I go with ipconfig. Here you can see the IP address of this local machine. Moving on, if we have to attack that machine, let's say we want to see what kind of exploits are going to work over there. Now we already know that Windows has some common vulnerabilities. One of those vulnerabilities is the HTA server vulnerability. HTA is supposed to be a HTML application, but when passed the right payload, it can be used to open a backdoor into a system. To start off with the Metasploit and accessing such applications, we're going to use the command use exploit and the name of the reverse HTA server is this Windows MISC for miscellaneous HTA server. As you can see, 
it already found this one all right now there are some options that we need to set for this exploit to go through for example you can see some of the options over here there is a payload the payload is supposed to be the malicious file that we are going to send on the HTML application, which allows us to give the backdoor. For example, right now the payload, which is the malicious file, is a Windows Meterpreter reverse TCP. Completely understandable. Now, let's set the L host. L host and R host and SRV host should be the one where we are going to launch the attack from for example if we launched another tab of this console and we just press i f config the ip address is 192.168.72.130 so we're going to set the l host as 192.168.72.130 and we're going to do the same thing with srv host We're going to set a port where we need to capture the backdoor access. Next, the payload has already been set. This payload will launch a backdoor and give us Meterpreter access to the system. Meterpreter is can be considered as an upgrade of a normal command prompt shell. We will look into it once we get the access in the first place. Now that we have set the commands, we can press on exploit and press enter. Now, you can see we have a URL over here. We're going to copy this URL. Once the URL is copied, we take it into the browser and paste it. This will ask us to download this file. Now, as per browser security settings, this file should be blocked by default. We can decide to keep it and with the correct formulation of this malicious package, even the website browser antivirus softwares will not be able to detect good payloads. We're going to save this file and we're going to open it. Publisher could not be verified. If we press run and we go back to our Metapeter access over here, you can see it has already captured a URL of an HD server and it is writing delivering payload. Just have to wait for a few seconds till the payload is delivered. It has sent this much amount of data. Meter Peter session one is open and we should get the access soon. There we go. Now, to understand where is the session set, we can write sessions minus i. As you can see, it has a meter Peter over here. We're going to write sessions minus i. The session ID is one, so we're going to write one. And we have the meter Peter access. Now to get a fair idea of the system, we're going to write this info and it's going to the computer name, the OS, architecture, all these things. We can write the help command to see what are the things that we can get out of the system. We can take screenshots, we can control the webcam and start a video chat. We can take a lot of things over here. There are other commands as well where we can change the file directory like the cat command, cd command. There are so many things that work in the normal CMD which we can run on the meter Peter as well. Now if you want to access this command prompt of the system directly, we can go with this. We have to write shell and there we go. We are in the downloads folder right now. To see if this is the same computer or not, we are going to write ipconfig. As you can see, it is our victim machine with 192.168.29.171. We can just press exit and we're back with the Metapreter access. This is how we can use Metapreter and Metasploit to gain access to a Windows 10 machine. Next, let's take a look at how we can get root access from a Windows 10 system. We just learned how we can get a Metapreter access from a system. We can background this meter Peter session by writing background and pressing enter. We can still we can still see the sessions sessions minus i. It's still present over here. Now these kind of access are not administrative access. 
These are the kind of backdoors that can be created for standard users. But to get a complete access of a system, including the program files, the Windows documents, we need to have a root access or administrative access. To do that, we're going to use another exploit. Reminder that the Metapeter session of the standard access is already present and we're not messing with it right now. We're going to set up another session, albeit with the same machine. That exploit name is use exploit windows local bypass usc event viewer and there we go now if we check the options that we can put in the system we have to choose an exploit target we need to put a session as well let's say we are going to use the session one this is the session that has the meter peter access with the standard user. It doesn't have the system user. We're going to write set session one and we're going to run exploit. Run a few commands and it opened a second meter peter session. As you can see, it is the session two. If I write sysinfo, you can still see I'm not the system user right now. I'm still just a normal user. How can we check that? If you go to shell, I can still see, see users gonna be downloads, all these things. If I press exit, go back to the meter peter. There is a command on meter peter, get system. It attempts to elevate your privilege to that of the local system, which basically means you get promoted into root access. So if we write get system and Due to pipe impersonation, we now have the system root access. As you can see, now it has become x64 and we are the admin users. Now if I go to shell, I can easily go back, windows, and I can easily access these ones. This kind of control over the windows folders and the program files folders these kind of things are not possible if you are not an admin access or the command prompt has not been run with admin permissions this is how we can use privilege escalation to get into an admin access system we use the second exploit which was the bypass us event viewer exploit and essentially used it with the first session as you can read here windows escalation usc protection bypass it was first disclosed on 2016, but it still works on some systems. So let's start out by learning what Parrot Security is. Parrot OS is a Debian-based Linux distribution with an emphasis on security, privacy, and development. It is built on Debian's testing branch and uses a custom hardened Linux kernel while being founded in 2013. Parrot Security contains several hundred tools targeted towards various information security tasks such as penetration testing, security research, computer forensics, and reverse engineering. It has become a multi-platform solution, accessible and freely available to information security professionals and hobbyists. It features a distinct forensics mode that does not mount any of the system hard disks or partitions and has no influence on the host system making it more stealthy than regular mode. This mode is used on the host system when there is a need for executing forensic procedures. In software development, a rolling release is a paradigm in which software upgrades are rolled out constantly rather than in batches of versions. This ensures that the software is constantly up to date. A rolling release distribution such as Parrot Security OS follows the same concept providing the most recent Linux kernel and software versions as they become available on the market. With a basic introduction to the operating system out of the way, let us have a look at the bare minimum system requirements necessary to be able to run this operating system. First up, we got a CPU requirement which states that a 1 GHz dual core CPU is the absolute minimum in order to use Barrett OS. While multiple core systems will provide more optimum performance, a small beginner has been included. A very distinct thing to be noted is that the operating system can be installed on all variants of chipsets, be it 32-bit, 64-bit and the newly popular ARM portfolio of devices. 
Unlike Kali Linux, which requires some amount of graphical acceleration needed to display the operating system correctly, Parrot OS has no such requirements and can be used with the leanest of machines. Taking into account the RAM issue, a minimum of 256 MB to 512 MB free RAM provides the optimum usage scenarios. Even when the OS is installed on a hard drive storage media, it should theoretically occupy around 8 GB of information which may extend up to 16 GB depending on the tools being installed out of the box. When it comes to booting options, we have the option of going with the legacy BIOS settings or with the more modern UEFI settings. These are just some of the requirements for the installation of Parrot Security OS. To understand this process more vividly and to learn how visualization can help install an OS in our existing computer, please follow the link to a Parrot Security installation video linked right above. Let's understand what some of the things that make Parrot Security unique among all the other penetration testing operating systems. Along with all the giant catalog of scripts, Parrot Security has its own custom hardened Linux kernel which has been modified explicitly to provide as much security and resistance to hackers as possible as a first line of defense. The configurations in the operating system act as a second gateway, taking care of malicious requests and dropping them off. This is particularly beneficial since should there be a scenario where the latest Linux kernel is causing some particular issue, the Parrot OS development team will most likely iron it out first before passing it on as an update. If the custom hardened kernel wasn't reasoning enough, Parrot security developers managed to install more hacking tools and scripts to ensure a smooth transition for the Gali Linux users. All the tools you found in Gali are present in Parrot OS and then a few extra ones for good measure. This has been achieved while keeping roughly the same size of the installation file between both operating systems. However, it's not all productivity points for Parrot OS. They provide a choice between two different desktop environments, the made desktop which comes pre-installed by default and KDE. For those unfamiliar with Linux terminology, you can think of desktop environments as the main UI for a Linux system. Being highly modular in nature, one can use Kali Linux or Parrot OS while adding another desktop environment which they find appealing. While Kali has only a single option, Parrot OS has managed to provide two optimized builds with made desktop and KDE desktop ready-made on the website. One of the primary advantages of Parrot OS over Kali is that it's relatively lightweight. This implies that it takes significantly less disk space and computing power to function properly with as little as 320 MB of RAM required. In reality, Parrot OS is also designed to operate successfully off a USB stick, but Kali Linux does not work well from a USB stick and is generally installed in a virtual machine. Parrot OS can be seen as more of a niche distribution if you are searching for something lighter than Kali Linux. There are multiple ways to go about with this installation. Many people prefer to install it directly onto a hard disk where the Parrot Security OS will override whichever data the hard disk already has. Now this is beneficial if you want to preserve your data for the long term, but this might pose some trouble to people who do not have a spare hard disk or do not want to lose their current installation of Windows operating system. Another way to use Parrot Security is by using the live boot. But whatever changes you make to the live boot operating system, those changes are removed the moment we restart or shut down the system. A very good common ground between both these installations is virtualization. Using virtualization software like VMware or VirtualBox, we can install Parrot security on our systems while simultaneously saving our data and having the convenience of a host machine such as a Windows operating system in case things go wrong. To start the installation, we first need to get an ISO file for the Parrot Security Operating System. This can be found on the current website parrotsec.org. Once we enter the website, move into the download section and select the Get Security Edition over here. Parrot Security OS has multiple desktop environments to you to choose from. This desktop environment serves as a different user interface for the user. For example, right now we have the MADE desktop and the KDE desktop. As you can see from the screenshots, both of these look quite different while having a similar look and feel to them. For our example, let's go with the MADE desktop. We have two options, either we can go with the direct download or we can get the torrent file. 
For this example, if we press on the download button and our download will start. I have already downloaded this file, but the ISO file provided over here will serve as an installation. It will have around 4.5 GB of space. It will be used to install this operating system in VMware. Once the file is downloaded, we can close this and open VMware Workstation. VMware can also be used as a player version or the workstation version. If you have much more familiarity with using VirtualBox or virtualization application, we can use that as well. Once the VMware is open, we click on File and select a new virtual machine. For the first time installation, we're going to go with the typical and recommended installation procedure instead of an advanced one. If you have already installed multiple virtual machine OSs, going with the advanced option will give you much more control over the hardware customization. But for now, we're going to stick with the typical option. Moving on, it will ask us for a source to where to install the operating system from. Since we're going to use a live ISO first, we're going to select the third option, which will be I will install the operating system later and press next. As we already know, Parrot security is a Debian derivative. So when selecting the guest operating system type, we're going to go with Linux. And in the selection, we're going to choose whichever the highest version of Debian is along with a 64-bit OS. We're going to click on next. We're going to name our virtual machine, let's say Parrot Security OS. We're going to select the location where we want to save the virtual machine. This will have all the hard disks of the operating system installation. We're going to click on next. For the disk size, we're going to specify how much of the current memory are we going to allocate. This is the hard disk memory of the operating system installation. Whatever changes we make in the operating system, whatever applications we install on the virtual instance will all be stored in this amount of memory. While it is recommended to go with at least 15 GB of storage, we can go as high as possible and we're going to select the recommended 20 GB as written. When given the choice of storing the virtual disk as a single or multiple files, many people want to keep their virtual instance in a way so that it helps them stay portable. People change systems and sometimes they want to swap their instances between the work and their personal computer. If there is no portability in mind, storing the virtual disk as a single file gives the best performance and should be the recommended go-to when installing for the first time. We click on next here and it's going to give us a summary of the settings we have already settled till now. We're going to press on finish and there we go. We have our installation first step completed. Here on out, we're going to click on edit virtual machine settings. Here we're going to have a look at some of the requirements that the Parrot Security OS will need. It is known to be a memory lightweight operating system, but just to have the most optimum performance, we're going to provide around 2 GB of RAM from our host system, which is a Windows 10 machine. When it comes to the processors, I'm going to increase it to 2 and the number of cores to 2 as well. So giving out a total 4 processor cores to the operating system. Now this depends on what are your computer rig and how much resources you can justify. So these need to be customized according to the system at hand. Hard disk size has already been set at 20 GB and the rest of them are pretty standard and we can go on. One thing that we need to make sure is selecting the CD DVD IDE. Here we have to use our ISO image file over here. Previously, it should be use physical drive and at auto detect. We're going to use a use ISO image file over here. We're going to click on browse. We're going to go to where we have downloaded the ISO file, which is over here and select it. Press OK here. And we can now power on this virtual machine. At this point of time, there are two options. We can go with the try install option using the graphical user interface or we can go using the terminal mode. To get a better user experience, we're going to go with the try install mode specifically. Press enter and it's going to start the live boot ISO. Meanwhile, VMware has a prompt over here where it will try to install some VMware tools on it. 
While this is not mandatory, it is much more recommended to install these tools so that you can get some additional features like drag and drop with the host system and many more things. For now, we are going to close this prompt. As you can see, this is the live boot ISO of the Parrot security operating system. Currently, it's running the Mate desktop as we have downloaded in the website. The live boot ISO is necessary to get a good feel of the operating system. There are many good Linux distros that have this live boot option so that you can give a try of the operating system before installing it permanently. Once you are into the live boot, we can start up with the installation using the shortcut as you can see install parrot I'm going to double click it and this is a calamaris installer choose your language as american english and press next you can select your time zone according to your location and we can go next. At this point of time, you have to choose the correct keyboard. Now, what many people go, get confused is choosing their own language keyboard. What people must keep in mind is what keyboard the laptop provides. Most of the systems that come pre-built provide the English US keyboard. So, whatever keyboard you choose, make sure to type here and test that all the buttons including the superscript and the subscript buttons are working correctly before moving forward with this step. Once you have settled on the keyboard that you need to install, you can go ahead. Here it will ask you to select storage device and the only option you are going to get is the amount of hard disk storage you have given in the virtual machine settings. We have already provided 20 GB of storage, we are going to choose that and we are going to erase this disk. Manual partitioning can be useful when you are going to install Parrot security on an operating system or on a hard disk where it is already including a Windows OS. For now, we are going to select Erase Disk and press Next. We are going to give our full name. Let it be Simply Learn. You can give the name of the computer and this is the username which we will use to log in. This is your root password that we are going to give over here. The root password of this Kali Linux will act as the administrative access and it will be necessary for making changes to the system or installing and updating software. Enter the password and repeat it over here. You have the option to log in automatically without asking for the password, but for security purposes, it is recommended to keep this disabled. Click on next. This is another summary of the installation that we are going to move forward with. Have a look that whatever changes we have made is according to your requirements and once everything is checked, we can press on install. Click on install now and we are going to let it complete the work. As you can see, the installation of Parrot security is now completed. We're going to make sure that we have the restart now button over here disabled. I'm going to click on done. We're going to shut down this live boot ISO. We're going to click on menu. Turn off the device. And shut down. We're not restarting straight away because if you remember correctly, in the virtual machine instance settings, we had given it an ISO file. Please remove the live medium and press enter to continue. We can just press enter to continue. And it's going to shut down. Now, to move on, we're going to click on edit virtual machine settings. We're going to CD, DVD and we're going to use physical drive now. 
We're going to remove it from the ISO image file because the installation has already been completed and we don't want to use the same ISO file again and again. By using physical drive over here, it's going to detect the 20 GB hard disk that we have already provided and installation is done on it. We're going to press OK and we're going to power on this virtual machine for testing. Make sure this you click ES over here. This is the grub menu. At this we get different choices, for example, which NVIDIA drivers off or with some other advanced options. More often than not, we're going to choose the first option and press enter. If you remember clearly, we did not get the option of try install or a terminal run just like we did in the live boot ISO. Since this is running straight from the 20 GB hard drive storage, it's going to start the OS directly. Now with the login screen, you can see our username over here as we provided in the installation. We're going to enter our root password. And press enter. And this is our currently working desktop of the Parrot security operating system. We can open the terminal over here. And we're going to try a root password and installation. To install any software, we're going to use the keyword sudo apt install and neofetch. We're going to use the root password that we used to log in. We're going to press Y for yes. This is just an additional step that we're doing to check that the installation is done correctly with the correct amount of hardware requirements that we had provided. Now that we have installed NeoFetch, we can write the command NeoFetch and this is going to give us some information about our installation. You can see the OS name as Parrot OS 4.11 is running on a VMware host, so the kernel versions and some of the other information like the number of packages installed, the current shell version, resolution of the VMware instance that we are running, the desktop environment which is made as we had downloaded once and some other things. You can see the memory is supposed to be 1951 megabytes which is supposed to equal around 2 GB of RAM usage that we had provided. Let us compare both these operating systems directly with respect to their hardware specifications and usability. In the end, we can decide on what distribution is fit for each type of user. For our first point of comparison, let's take a look at the RAM required. For optimum performance of the operating system, which is highly essential when trying to crack hashes or something of similar nature, RAM usage is a very important facet. While Kali Linux demands at least 1 GB of RAM, Parrot security can operate optimally with a minimum of 320 MB of RAM. For correctly displaying graphical elements, Kali Linux requires GPU-based acceleration. While this is not the case with Parrot security OS, which doesn't require any graphical acceleration needed from the user side. Once these operating systems are installed on VMware using their live boot ISOs, they take up a minimum amount of hard disk storage. Both of these operating systems have a recommended disk storage of minimum of 20 GB in Kali Linux and a minimum of 15 GB in Parrot security so they can install all the tools necessary in the ISO file. When it comes to the category and the selection of tools, Kali Linux has always been the first in securing every single tool available for hackers in the penetration testing industry. Parrot security on the other hand has managed to take it up a notch. While specializing in wireless pen testing, Parrot security makes it a point that all the tools that Kali Linux provides has been included in the ISO while simultaneously adding some extra tools that many users will have to install from third party sources in Kali Linux. Being a decade-old penetration testing distribution, 
Kali Linux has formed up a very big community with strong support signature. Parrot security on the other hand is still growing and it is garnering much more interest among veteran penetration testers and ethical hackers. A primary drawback of Kali Linux is the extensive hardware requirement. To perform optimally, it requires higher memory than Parrot security. It also needs graphical acceleration while demanding more virtual hard disk storage. Parrot security on the other hand was initially designed to run off a USB drive directly, thereby requiring very minimal requirements from a hardware perspective like just 320 MB of RAM and no graphical acceleration needed. This means Parrot security is much more feasible for people who are not able to devote massive resources to either their virtual machine or on their laptop hard disk directly. With the comparison done between both of these operating systems, let's take a look at the type of users both of these are catered to. One can go with Kali Linux if they want the extensive community support offered by its users, if they want to go with a trusted development team that have been working on this distribution since many years, if they have a powerful system which can run Kali Linux optimally without having to bottleneck performance, and if they are comfortable with a semi-professional environment which may or may not be very useful for new beginners. One can decide to go with Parrot security if they want to go with a very lightweight and lean distribution that can run pretty much on all systems. It also has a lot of tools pre-installed and some of them are not even present on Kali Linux. It is much more suitable for underpowered rigs where users do not have a lot of hardware resources to provide to the operating system and thereby it is much more feasible for people with underpowered laptops or no graphical acceleration. Compared to Kali Linux, Parrot Security's desktop environment is also relatively easier to use for new beginners. For people who are just getting into ethical hacking, Parrot Security does a relatively better job of introducing them to the operating system and to the various tools without having to dump them into the entire intricacies. In recent years, the cost of data breaches has steadily risen. The additional vulnerabilities that occur due to the move to a remote workforce dramatically enhance the chances for cyber attacks and introduce several weak points for hackers to exploit. Additionally, automated hacking assaults and the capacity to exchange bitcoins via ransomware have increased the cost of cybercrime in general. Companies' workforces have transitioned to full-time work-from-home models, which gives rise to new attack surfaces. Threat actors target the people who are most vulnerable by taking advantage of current events and shifting situations. To better understand this growth in digital crime, let us go through a few statistics. 2020 brought with it a slew of new problems for both businesses and consumers. In the midst of a worldwide epidemic, forest fires and political instability, it's easy to overlook a serious, albeit less physical threat. It set a record for data loss due to cyber attacks as well as the sheer volume of attacks. 2020 is already outpacing its predecessor. The graph below denotes the percentage of companies that fell victim to at least one cyber attack in the respective year. With the numbers growing steadily, we are yet to see the true crux of this digital revolution. In situations like these, penetration testing has been a gift for organizations worldwide. While security testing cannot guarantee a 100% solution, it can go a long way in securing those critical data from falling into the wrong hands. Hey everyone, this is Bhavab from Simple Learn. Next, we know about the benefits of penetration testing and how they help organizations save money in the long run. Moving on, we familiarize ourselves with the different types of penetration testing or ethical hacking, with each serving a different category of personnel. In the next section, we read about the five distinct phases in every ethical hacking campaign and how they help clear up the extensive report at the end of every penetration testing session. Finally, we have a live demonstration on how we can check for vulnerabilities and the ways hackers can break into devices without adequate security measures in place. Let's start by learning about penetration testing in general. Organizations can define penetration testing based on the objectives of the test. All networks, applications, devices and physical security components are included. It imitates the behavior of harmful individuals or the hackers. Experienced cybersecurity specialists use penetration testing to strengthen a company's security posture and eliminate any weaknesses that leave it vulnerable to attacks. 
penetration testing when done correctly goes beyond simply preventing thieves from gaining unauthorized access to a company's systems. It generates realistic scenarios that demonstrate how well a company's present defenses might perform in the face of a full-scale cyber assault. The simulation aids in the discovery of the sites of exploitation and the testing of IT breach security. Businesses may acquire professional unbiased third-party input on the security procedures by conducting frequent penetration testing. Pen testing, while relatively time-consuming and costly, can aid in the prevention of highly destructive and expensive breaches. A white hat hacker employs hacking talents to find security flaws in hardware, software, or networks. On the other hand, white hat hackers follow the rule of law when it comes to hacking instead of black hat hackers. They assist firms in conducting penetration tests to analyze their security index and make the necessary improvements. Ethical hacking provides a full audit of your security policies and in the case of bug bounties, can assist you in identifying holes in existing operational systems. It takes a far broader approach to cybersecurity than penetration testing. Whereas penetration testing focuses on system flaws, ethical hacking allows actors to utilize any attack tactics available to them. They can take advantage of system misconfigurations, send phishing emails, launch brute force password assaults, breach physical boundaries, or do whatever else they feel will get them access to critical information. Because thieves are progressively changing up the approaches and launching multi-layered complex attacks, this is incredibly useful for determining just how exposed the organization is to cyber threats. Considering the vast domain that is ethical hacking, we have multiple categories of penetration testing methodologies. Let's cover them in the next section. When configuring a security system, testing is critical to preventing hackers from penetrating the perimeter. There are three sort of tests black box, gray box, and white box. In the black box testing, the tester receives no information during the penetration test. In this case, the pen tester takes the method of an unprivileged attacker from initial access and execution until exploitation. This scenario is the most realistic, showcasing how an attacker with no inside knowledge may target and compromise an organization. However, because of this, it is also the most expensive alternative. White box penetration testing, which is also known as crystal box testing, entails sharing all network and system information with the tester, which includes network maps and passwords. This saves time and lowers the overall cost of a project. A white box penetration test effectively simulates a focused assault on a given system using as many attack paths as feasible. In a gray box penetration test, also known as a transparent box test, very restricted information is present with the tester. Gray box testing is beneficial for understanding the extent of access a privileged person may get and the possible damage they could wreck. Gray box tests achieve a mix between depth and efficiency and may be used to mimic either an insider danger or an assault that has infiltrated the network perimeter. Now that we covered the basics of penetration testing and the relative categories, one must know how these testing campaigns benefit the organizations conducting them. Let us go through a few perks of penetration testing. Regular penetration testing helps your business assess the security of online applications, internal networks, and external networks. It also assists you in understanding what security measures are required to achieve the degree of protection your company needs to protect its people and assets. Prioritizing these risks offer firms an advantage in anticipating hazards and preventing harmful assaults. Penetration testing is similar to a real-life hacker rehearsing for a real-life hack. Regular penetration testing helps you be proactive in your real-world approach to reviewing the security of your IT infrastructure. The process identifies gaps in your security, allowing you to correct any flaws before an actual attack happens. It is undeniably expensive to recover from the effects of a data breach. Legal fees, IT cleanup, consumer protection programs, lost revenue, and dissatisfied customers may cost businesses millions. Penetration testing regularly is a proactive strategy to remain on top of your security and may assist in preventing financial damage from a breach while safeguarding your brand and image. Penetration testing aid in meeting the compliance and security duties imposed by industry standards and regulations such as PCI, HIPAA, FISMA, and ISO 27001. 
Having these tests done regularly help demonstrate due care and your commitment to information security, all while avoiding the significant fines associated with the non-compliance. With the entire process seeming to be a lengthy ordeal, what are the multiple phases in the process? Theoretically, we have to follow a five-stage process. Reconnaissance is the first phase of the penetration test. In this phase, the security researcher collects information about the target. It can be done actively, meaning you are collecting information by sending a request directly to the target and interpreting it. Passively, where you are collecting data without contacting the target or both. It helps security firms gather information about the target system, network components, active machines, etc. This activity can be performed by using information available in the public domain and using different tools. The scanning phase is more tool oriented rather than performed manually. The penetration tester runs one or more scanner tools to gather more information about the target by using scanners such as war dialers, port scanners, network mappers and vulnerability scanners. The penetration tester collects as many vulnerabilities which help in turning to attack a target in a more sophisticated way. The third phase is the gaining access of the system. In this phase, the penetration tester tries to connect with the target and exploit the vulnerabilities found in the previous stage. The exploitation may be buffer overflow attacks, denial of service DOS attacks, session hijacking and many more. Pen tester extracts information and sensitive data from the servers by gaining access using different tools. In the fourth stage, the hacker has to maintain access. The penetration tester tries to create a backdoor from himself. It helps the penetration tester to identify hidden vulnerabilities in the system and can later access the machine should the need arise. In the final phase of clearing and covering tracks, the penetration tester removes all logs and footprints which help the administrator identify his presence. This allows the penetration tester to think like a hacker and perform corrective actions to mitigate those activities. With the cost of cyber security platforms going up, trained penetration testers receive an excellent level of remuneration for their efforts. As per reports, the average yearly salary for a penetration tester is 6 lakh Indian rupees or $110,000 in the American counterpart. Finally, let's go over some of the ways hackers can identify vulnerable positions on a system to gather information in a live demonstration. In this demo, we will start by setting up a VPN connection that will allow us to access to a vulnerable network by creating a local virtual group over the internet. We then try to scan the victim machine for breachable entry points, find the username and password of the user in question and eventually grab the root password from the device. To start our demonstration, we are going to need a vulnerable machine to work on. Now this vulnerable machine can be found on the website known as TryHackMe which is a service catered towards penetration testers. Before we connect to the machine, we need to join the network where the machine is located. We can do that using an OVPN file which is short for OpenVPN protocol. To connect to this OVPN file, we are going to go into a new workspace on Parrot Security. We are going to activate the root access. And we are going to connect to it. Hacktest.ovpn. Once we see the message initialization sequence completed, we can be sure that we have connected to the network which has the vulnerable machine. Now to start the vulnerable machine, we are going to click this button and wait for a few seconds. As you can see, it gives a one minute countdown before it shows you the IP address. Now remember, whatever the IP address we receive here, it is a machine being launched on the TriHackMe servers, but we can access that machine because of the OVPN connection that we have just set up using this file. This OVPN file can be found on the TriHackMe servers profile section, which I downloaded beforehand. As you can see, we now have the IP address of our victim machine. Let's try if we can reach this machine or not. We're going to copy the IP address and we're going to try and ping to the machine. 
If the connection is successful and we have joined the network, we should be able to see some response over here. As you can see, we are receiving uh, request pings from the victim machine, which means that we have already joined the victim network. Now that we are confirmed, we are able to access the vulnerable machine. Let's run the first step in a penetration test, which is reconnaissance. Let's run up and map scan. We are going to use the flag of SV so that we can know which version of the service it is running. We are going to take up the IP address and paste it here. This scan will only be possible if the OpenVPN connection is up and running. As you can see, it is still running. And we have our results over here. We are running this scan so that we can find the services running on the host machine that we will run and map against. We conclude that a web service is running actually on port 80, as we can see over here, which is using the Apache server system. In addition to this, there is a SMB Samba service as well running on ports 139.445. Now that we know that we have an Apache server, we can use this IP address to open it on the browser. Okay. Since the current home page is not accessible, we can use some other URLs as well. As far as Apache servers are concerned, there are a certain set of URLs that can be used to open. However, if we go to the URL, which is IP address slash development, this opens up a new folder. If we try to check the contents of these files, this is for the dev.txt. You can see the version of the Apache HTTP server that is being run. This is the dev.txt. If we go back and we check the second file as well, it says the content C shadow has the credentials. Okay, if we go back again, SMB has been configured which we have already found out and map that it is running a Samba server. Now, with this version of the Apache server, we can find version specific exploits that can be run on Metasploit, but there is sometimes no, no need of that. We can use another technique as we now know that there are multiple users that is being run over here. We can use a tool known as enum for Linux. What it does this is acts it enumerates the windows and Samba systems. To run that command, we're going to use enum for Linux minus A and we're going to take IP address of the machine. I'm going to paste it here. What this will essentially do is provide us usernames that are being stored in the victim machine. It's going to take some time to find out the usernames. Once we find those out, we can run the necessary attacks. As we have already seen on the NMAP, it is also happening in SSH port. So if we find the username and we find a single hash that can be cracked, we can use the SSH to get inside the machine. Right now, we have to wait for the results of the enum for Linux command. As you can see, we have found two users of the machine known as K and Jan. I think we can stop the enumeration right now since we have the two users of this machine. Next step what we can do is we can try to SSH into the machine.
Now to run the SSH command, we're going to need the password of one of the users. For this example, let's say we go with the user of Jan. To brute force, we're going to use the Hydra tool. This is like an example command. This is how we can use. Let me just copy this and paste it over here. All right. Hydra minus L user as we have already decided we're going to use the user Jan and we're going to use SSH for the IP address we're going to copy it from here and paste it here now for the password list we're going to use a word list which has a few passwords already present in it. For this example, I'm going to use the rockyou.txt file, which has like millions of passwords already stored in it. What the Hydra will do is it will try to bypass the SSH console on the machine using the passwords present in the rockyou.txt file. We will give the path of rockyou over here like this. And we're going to run it. As you can see, it's mentioned that it's attacking SSH at this IP address. Now this attack is going to take a while. And after this attack is done, we are going to get the SSH password, which is basically the credentials of the Jan user in the victim machine. For now, I'm going to stop this attack. What I would recommend is for you to run this attack and write down the password that you received in the comment section below. The password that we receive from here can be used to log in into the machine. Let's try that once. To SSH into the machine, we're going to write SSH user at the rate IP address. We're going to write yes and press enter. Now we're going to enter the password that we have found after running the Hydra command. I'm going to type the password and press enter and we have logged in as you can see. Now if we try to look around there are no directories over here okay so let's go one step back give a space over here okay let's go to the second users folder Okay. These are the contents of the K folder and you can see there's a dot SSH folder over here. So we're going to enter that. Let's have a look the files in this folder and we can file an RSC ID over here which if I'm not wrong should be an RSA private key which can be used to SSH into the machine. Here we go. You can see it's a big an RSA private key and it should end here as well. Now what this private key does, this hash will be used to log SSH into the machine when using the user K. Once this hash is cracked using Hydra or any other cracking software like John the Ripper, we can easily use the passphrase to log in into the machine with the user of K. What I am going to do is copy this private key I'm going to launch a new terminal to create a new file known as nano ID paste the private key over here and save it as you can see we have saved the file over here now this hash can later be used to crack into the machine using the user of K this hash can be cracked using either John the Ripper Hydra or there are other cloud mechanisms that can be used to crack this machine after it is cracked 
we can use the passphrase derived from it to SSH into the machine. To perform the SSH entry, we're going to use this command SSH I. We're going to use the same file which we received. We're going to write the username which is K 10.10. .10. We can just copy it from the here, right? Minimize this and paste the IP address over here. Or, or we can do one more thing. We're going to use a sudo command together as well. It's better. sudo ssh enter the system password. This passphrase is the one that we received after cracking the hash in this ID file. Whichever password you received after cracking this using Hydra or John the Ripper, please write the password in the comment section so that we can know that we have successfully cracked the password. We're going to write the passphrase over here. Press enter. And as you can see, we have entered the system of K. Here we're going to press ls and we find the backup file of the password. We're going to write cat password back and here is the final root password. So as you can see we have now able, we have now received the final root password of the primary user and we have already cracked the password of the other user that is Jan. So this is the entire process of how you can use Nmap to find out the vulnerable points. You can see which are the softwares that are running, which versions they are running, and which of those versions have a legitimate claim as an insecure exploit. Malware is a malicious software that is programmed to cause damage to a computer system, network, and hardware devices. Many malicious programs like Trojan, viruses, bombs, and bots which cause damage to the system are known as malware. Most of the malware programs are designed to steal information from the targeted user or to steal money from the target by stealing sensitive data. Let's take a look at the introduction for two different types of malware, virus and trojan. Firstly, let's take a look what exactly is a virus program. A computer virus is a type of malicious program that on execution replicates itself. They get attached to different files and programs which are termed as host programs by inserting their code. If the attachment succeeds, the targeted program is termed as infected with a computer virus. Now let's take a look at the Trojan horse. Trojan horse program is a program that disguises itself as a legitimate program but harms the system on installation. They hide within the attachments and emails then transfer from one system to another. They create bad doors into our system to allow the cyber criminal to steal our information. Let's take a look how they function after getting installed into our system. Firstly, we have virus programs. The computer virus must contain two parts to infect the system. First is a search routine, which locates new files and data that is to be infected by the virus program. And the second part is known as the copy routine which is necessary for the program to copy itself into the targeted file, which is located by the search routine. Now let's take a look at the Trojan horse functioning. For Trojan horses, entryway into our system is through emails that may look legitimate, but may have unknown attachments. And when such files are downloaded into the device, the Trojan program gets installed and infects the system. They also infect the system on the execution of infected application or the executable file and attacks the system. Now that we understand what virus and trojans are, let's understand different types of virus and trojans. Let's take a look at different types of viruses. The first one is known as the boot sector virus. This type of virus damages the booting section of the system by infecting the master bot record, which is also known as MBR. This damages the boot sector section by targeting the hard disk of the system. Then we have the macrovirus. Macrovirus is a type of virus that gets embedded into the document related data and is executed when the file is open. They also are designed to replicate themselves and infect the system on a larger scale. 
and lastly we have the direct action virus this type of virus gets attached to executable files which on execution activates the virus program and infects the system once the infection of the file is completed they exit the system which is also the reason it is known as a non resident virus let's take a look at different types of trojans the first type of trojan is the backdoor trojan they are designed to create a backdoor in the system on execution of an infected program they provide remote access of a system to the hacker this way the cyber criminal can steal our system data and may use it for illegal activities next we have crick sauce trojan they enter the system by clicking the random pop-ups which we come across on the internet they tempt the user to give their personal details for different transactions or schemes which may provide remote access of a system to the cyber criminal and the last trojan type is ransom trojan this type of trojan program after entering the system blocks the user from accessing its own system and also affects the system function the cyber criminal demands a ransom from the targeted user for the removal of the trojan program from the device now that we understand some details regarding viruses and trojan let's solve a question the question is jake was denied access to his system and he wasn't able to control the data and information in his system now the actual question is what could be the reason behind his system's problem option a macro virus option b ransom trojan option c backdoor trojan give your answers in the comment section now let's understand how to detect the activity of viruses and trojan in a system to detect virus or trojan activity in a system we can refer to the following points for viruses we have slowing down of the system and frequent application freeze shows that the infection of the virus is present in the system then we have the viruses can also steal sensitive data including passwords account details which may lead to unexpected logout from the accounts or corruption of the sensitive data and lastly we have frequent system crashes due to virus infection which damages the operating system for trojan we have frequent system crashes and system also faces slow reaction time then we have there are more random pop ups from the system which may indicate trojan activity and lastly we have modification in the system application and change of the desktop appearance can be also due to the infection of a trojan program next let's take a look at a famous cyber attack for virus and a trojan host for virus we have the mydom virus which was identified in the year 2004 which affected over 50 million systems by creating a network of sending spam emails which was to gain backdoor access into our systems next for the trojan host we have the emotat trojan program which is specifically designed for financial theft and for stealing bank related information next we have few points for how to prevent virus entry or trojan attack for a system the most basic way of virus protection is to using antivirus and do regular virus scan this will prevent virus entry in the system and also having more than one antivirus provides much better protection then avoid visiting uncertified websites can also prevent virus entry into our system then we have using regular driver updates and system updates to prevent virus entry for trojan we have using certified softwares from legal sites to prevent any trojan activity in our system and also avoid clicking random pop ups that we often see on the internet and lastly using antivirus and firewalls for protection against trojan horses is a good habit now that we have reached the end of the video let's take a look what we learned for the first part we saw the main objective of the virus is to harm the data and information in a system whereas for the trojan we have stealing of the data files and information effect of viruses is more drastic in comparison to the trojan horses then we have viruses which are non remote programs whereas 
Trojan horses are remote accessed. And lastly, viruses have the ability to replicate itself to harm multiple files, whereas Trojan does not have the replication ability. Let's take a look at some of the famous botnet attacks. The first one is Mirai Botnet, which is a malicious program designed to attack vulnerable IoT devices and infect them to form a network of bots. That on command perform basic and medium level denial of service attacks. Then we have the Zeus bot, specifically designed for attacking the system for bank related information and data. Now let's take a look at the agenda for today's video. Firstly, we'll understand what is a botnet. Then we'll see how exactly a botnet works. After that, we'll learn some of the architectures how a botnet works on. After in the end, we learn how to protect ourselves from botnet attacks. Now, let's see what exactly a botnet is. Botnet refers to a network of hijacked interconnected devices that are installed with malicious codes known as malware. Each of these infected devices are known as bots. The hijack criminal known as bot hoider remotely controls them. The bots are used to automate large scale attacks, including data theft, server failure, malware propagation, and denial of service attacks. Now that we know what exactly a botnet is, let's dive deeper into learning how a botnet works. During the preparation of a botnet network, the first step involves preparing the botnet army. After that, the connection between the botnet army and the control server is established. And the end, the launching of the attack is done by the bot herder. Let's understand through an illustration. Firstly, we have a bot herder that initiates the attack. According to the control server commands, the devices that are infected with the malware programs and begins to attack the infected system. Let's see some details regarding the preparation of the botnet army. The first step is known as the prepping the botnet army. The first step is creating a botnet is to infect as many as connected devices as possible. This ensures that there are enough bots to carry out the attack. This way, it creates bots either by exploiting the security gaps in the software or websites or using phishing attacks. They are often deployed through Trojan horses. For the next step we have, establishing the connection. Once it hacks the device, as per previous step, it infects it with the specific malware that connects the device back to the control bot server. A bot herder uses command programming to drive the bot's actions. And the last step is known as launching the attack. Once infected, a bot allows access to admin level operation like gathering and stealing of data, reading and rewriting the system data, monitoring user activities, performing denial of service attacks, including other cyber crimes. Now let's take a look at the botnet architecture. The first type is known as client server model. The client server model is a traditional model that operates with the help of a command and control center server and communication protocols like IRC. When the bot order issues a command to the server, it is then relayed to the clients to perform malicious actions. Then we have peer-to-peer -peer model. Peer controlling the infected bots involves a peer-to-peer -peer network that relies on a decentralized approach. That is, the bots are topological interconnected and act as both CNC servers, that is the server and the client. Today hackers adopt this approach to avoid detection and single point failure. In the end, we will see some points on some countermeasure against botnet attacks. The first step is to have updated drivers and system updates. After that, we should avoid clicking random pop-ups or links that we often see on the internet. And lastly, having certified antivirus, anti-spyware softwares and firewall installed into a system will protect against malware attack. Jane is relaxing at home when she receives an email from a bank that asks her to update her credit card PIN in the next 24 hours as a security measure. Judging the severity of the message, Jane follows the link provided in the email. On delivering her current credit card PIN and the supposedly updated one, the website became unresponsive, which prompted her to try sometime later. 
However, after a couple of hours, she noticed a significant purchase from a random website on that same credit card, which she never authorized. Frantically contacting the bank, Jane realized the original email was a counterfeit or a fake message with a malicious link that entailed credit card fraud. This is a classic example of a phishing attack. Phishing attacks are a type of social engineering where a fraudulent message is sent to a target on the premise of arriving from a trusted source. Its basic purpose is to trick the victim into revealing sensitive information like passwords and payment information. It's based on the word phishing, which works on the concept of baits. If a supposed victim catches the bait, the attack can go ahead, which in our case makes Jane the fish and the phishing emails the bait. If Jane never opened the malicious link or was cautious about the email authenticity, an attack of this nature would have been relatively ineffective. But how does the hacker gain access to these credentials? A phishing attack starts with a fraudulent message, which can be transmitted via email or chat applications. Even using SMS conversations to impersonate legitimate sources is known as smishing, which is a specific category of phishing attacks. Irrespective of the manner of transmission, the message targets the victim in a way that coaxes them to open a malicious link and provide critical information on the requisite website. More often than not, the websites are designed to look as authentic as possible. Once the victims submit information using the link, be it a password or credit card details, the data is sent to the hacker who designed the email and the fake website giving him complete control over the account whose password was just provided. Often carried out in campaigns where an identical phishing mail is sent to thousands of users, the rate of success is relatively low, but never zero. Between 2013 and 2015, corporate giants like Facebook and Google were tricked off of $100 million due to an extensive phishing campaign, where a known common associate was impersonated by the hackers. Apart from credit access, some of these campaigns target the victim device and install malware when clicked on the malicious links, which can later function as a botnet or a target for ransomware attacks. There is no single formula, for there are multiple categories of phishing attacks. The issue with Jane, where the hacker stole her bank credentials, falls under the umbrella of deceptive phishing. A general email is sent out to thousands of users in this category, hoping some of them fall prey to this scam. Spear phishing, on the other hand, is a bit customized version. The targets are researched before being sent an email. For example, if you never had a Netflix subscription, sending you an email that seems like the Netflix team sends it becomes pointless. This is a potential drawback of deceptive phishing techniques. On the other hand, a simple screenshot of a Spotify playlist being shared on social media indicates a probable point of entry. The hacker can send counterfeit messages to the target user while implying the source of such messages being Spotify, tricking them into sharing private information. Since the hacker already knows the target uses Spotify, the chances of victims taking the bait increase substantially. For more important targets like CEOs and people with a fortune on their back, the research done is tenfold, which can be called a case of whaling. The hackers prepare and wait for the right moment to launch their phishing attack often to steal industry secrets for rival companies or sell them off at a higher price. Apart from just emails, farming focuses on fake websites that resemble their original counterparts as much as possible. A prevalent method is to use domain names like Facebook with a single O or YouTube with no E. These are mistakes that people make when typing the full URL in the browser, leading them straight to a counterfeit web page which can fool them into submitting private data. A few more complex methods exist to drive people onto fake websites, like ARP spoofing and DNS cache poisoning, but they are rarely carried out due to time and resource constraints. Now that we know how phishing attacks work, let's look at ways to prevent ourselves from becoming victims. While the implications of a phishing attack can be extreme, protecting yourself against these is relatively straightforward. Jane could have saved herself from credit card fraud had she checked the link in the email for authenticity and that it redirected to a secure website that runs on the HTTPS protocol. Even suspicious messages shouldn't be entertained. One must also refrain from entering private information on random websites or pop-up windows, irrespective of how legitimate they seem. It is also recommended to use secure anti-phishing browser extensions like Cloudfish to sniff out malicious emails from legitimate ones. 
The best way to prevent phishing is browsing the internet with care and being on alert for malicious attempts at all times. So here is a question for you. If both me and my friends receive the same email that instructs us to change our Spotify password before the end of the day, even though one of us never used Spotify, what bracket does this phishing attack fall under? 1. Whaling 2. Spear phishing 3. Deceptive phishing 4. Farming Think about it and leave your answers below in the comments section, and three lucky winners will receive Amazon gift vouchers. Cyber attacks are becoming more prevalent due to the pandemic, where work from home is the norm and people spend possibly more than half their day with a laptop. But we cannot stop every attack at the root. We must be informed and vigilant to phishing attacks, among others, to safeguard our data. It's the year 2015, and Richard has just finished playing games on his computer. After a long gaming session, Richard tries to shut it down, but finds some random text file on the desktop that says, Ransom Note. The text file mentioned how a hacking group had encrypted Richard's game files and private documents, and he had to pay a ransom of $500 worth of Bitcoin in a specified Bitcoin address. Richard quickly checked his files, only to see them being encrypted and unreadable. This is the story of how the Tesla Crypt ransomware spread in 2015, which affected thousands of gamers before releasing the master key used for encrypting the files. So, what is ransomware? For Richard to be targeted by such an attack, he must have installed applications from untrusted sources or clicked an unverified link. Both of them can function as gateways for a ransomware breach. Ransomware is a type of malware that encrypts personal information and documents while demanding a ransom amount to decrypt them. This ransom payment is mainly done using cryptocurrency to ensure anonymity, but can also employ other routes. Once the files are encrypted or locked behind a password, a text file is available to the victim, explaining how to make the ransom payment and unlock the files for it. Just like Richard found the ransom note text file on his desktop, even after the money has been paid, there is no guarantee that the hackers will send the decryption key or unlock the files. But in certain sensitive situations, victims make the payment hoping for the best. Having never been introduced to ransomware attacks before, this gave Richard an opportunity to learn more about this, and he began his research on the topic. The spread of ransomware mostly starts with phishing attacks. To know more about phishing attacks, click the link in the button above. Users tend to click on unknown links received via emails and chat applications, promising rewards of some nature. Once clicked, a ransomware file is installed on the system that encrypts all the files or blocks access to computer functions. They can also be spread via malware, transmitted via untrusted application installation, or even a compromised wireless network. Another way to breach a system with ransomware is by using the Remote Desktop Protocol, or RDP access. A computer can be accessed remotely using this protocol, allowing a hacker to install malicious software on the system with the owner unaware of these developments. Coming to the different types of ransomware, first, we have Locker Ransomware which is a type of malware that blocks standard computer functions from being accessed until the payment to the hackers is complete. It shows a lock screen that doesn't allow the victim to use the computer for even basic purposes. Another type is crypto ransomware, which encrypts the local files and documents in the computers. Once the files are encrypted, finding the decryption key is impossible unless the ransomware variant is old and the keys are already available on the internet. Scareware is fake software that claims to have detected a virus or other issue on your computer and directs you to pay to resolve the problem. Some types of scareware lock the computer, while others simply flood the screen with pop-up alerts without actually damaging files. To prevent getting affected by ransomware, Richard could have followed a few steps to further enhance his security. One must always have backups of their data. Cloud storage for backup is easy but a physical backup in a hard drive is always recommended. Keeping the system updated with the latest security patches is always a good idea. Apart from system updates, one must always have reputed antivirus software installed. Many antivirus software like Kaspersky and Bitdefender have anti-ransomware features that periodically check for encryption of private documents. When browsing the internet, a user must always check for the lock symbol on the address bar which signifies the presence of HTTPS protocol for additional security. 
If a system is infected with ransomware already, there is a website, nomoreransom.org. It has a collection of decryption tools for most well-known ransomware packages. It can also help decrypt specific encrypted files if the list of anti-ransomware tools didn't help the victim. So, here's a question for you. What should be the first course of action after a ransomware attack? 1. Contact the criminal authorities. 2. Run antivirus scan for the entire system. 3. Recover from local or cloud backups. 4. Isolate device from the parent network. Think about it and leave your answers in the comments section, and three lucky winners will receive Amazon gift vouchers. Ransomware attacks have become increasingly common due to the shift in corporate work culture from in-office to work from home. In March 2021, a Chicago-based company called CNA Financial was attacked by ransomware that affected nearly 75,000 users. The company was later forced to pay out $40 million to get their system access back. Ransomware costs businesses more than $75 billion per year, and we must take the necessary steps to incur as minor damage as possible. So that was ransomware in a nutshell, a growing concern among security professionals worldwide. To understand the key logging problem better, let's take a look at an example. This is June. She works in a business firm where she manages the company's data regularly. This is Jacob from the information department who is here to inform her about some of the security protocols. During the briefing, she informed him about some of the problems her system was facing with, which included slow reaction speed and unusual internet activity. As Jacob heard about the problems with the system, he thinks of the possibility what could be the reason behind these problems her system was facing with. The conclusion that he came across was the key logging issue. Unknown to the problem her system was facing with, she asked him about some of the details regarding it. For today's topic, we learn what exactly key loggers are and how they affect our system, what are the harmful effects that key logging can bring into the system. For today's agenda, we learn what exactly the key logging program is. Then we'll see how the system gets infected, what are different methods of the key logging issue enter into the system. Then we'll take a look at different types of methods how to detect the key logging issue into the system. Then we'll take a look at different types of key loggers that are present and how they affect differently into the system. Then we'll take a look how the hackers use the recorded data that has been sent by the key logging program. And then we'll take a look at a case where the mobile devices get affected with the key logging issue. And lastly, we'll take a look what are different prevention methods available to prevent the system from getting infected by the key logging issue. To begin with, we learn what exactly the key logging program is. As the name suggests, Keylogger is a malicious program or a tool that is designed to record keystrokes that are typed during data input and record them into a log file. Then the same program secretly sends these log files to its origin, where they can be used for malicious acts by the hacker. Now that we know what the keylogging program is, let's take a look how they enter into the system. Searching for a suitable driver for a system can often lead to the installation of the key logging program into the system if we often visit suspicious sites and uncertified software are installed into our system. Then, if we use unknown links or visiting unknown websites which come through unknown addresses can also be a reason behind the key logging issue entering into the system. And lastly, there are often cases where Different pop-ups that we often see on social sites or different media sites can lead to the installation of key logging program into our system. Now that we know how the problem gets into the system, let's take a look how to identify whether the system is infected by the key logging issue. The key logging issue can be identified if there are often cases when our keyboard lags behind the system. The data that we enter Sometimes it's stuck in between when we type through the input. Then 
there are cases when the system freeze occurs unknowingly to what exactly could be the reason behind them and also there are delayed reaction time for different applications that run on the system and lastly there are different cases when we often see suspicious internet activity on the system that we don't know about this could lead to the identification of a problem into the system now we'll take a look at different types of key loggers that are present on the net which can harm our system differently the first problem that key loggers arouse is api based the most common key logging case which uses apis to keep a log of the type data and share it to its origin for malicious purposes each time we press a key the key logger intercepts the signal and logs it then we have form grabbing based key loggers as the name suggests they are a based key loggers that store the form data that is if we often use web forms or different kinds of forms to enter different data they can be recorded into the system by the program and send it to its origin then we have kernel based key loggers these key loggers are installed deeply into the operating system where they can hide from different antivirus if not checked properly and they record the data that we type on the keyboard and send it to its origin and lastly we have hardware key loggers these key loggers are present directly into the hardware that is they are embedded into system where they record the data that we type on the keyboard now let's take a look how hackers differentiate different type of recorded data and exploit them when hackers receive information about the target they might use it to blackmail the target which may affect the personal life of the target and also blackmail them for different money related issues then in case of company data that is recorded by the key logging program can also affect the economic value of the company in the market which may lead to the downfall of the company also in some cases the key logging program can also log data about military secrets which may include nuclear codes or security protocols which are necessary to maintain the security of a country now let's take a look whether mobile devices get infected with the key logging issue or not In the case of hand devices infection of key loggers are low in comparison to the computer systems as they use on screen keyboard or virtual keyboard but in some cases we often see different kinds of malicious programs getting installed into the hand device if we often visit different uncertified websites or illegal websites or torrent sites and also the device that is infected with the key logging issue or different kind of malicious program can often lead to the exploitation of data that includes photos emails or important files by the hacker or the cyber criminal that installed the particular malicious program into the system now to prevent a system from getting infected by the key logging program let's take a look at different points The first point includes using of different antivirus softwares or tools which can prevent the entering of malicious program into the system. Then keeping system security protocols regularly updated is also a good habit. And lastly, using virtual keyboard to input our sensitive data which may include bank details, login details or different passwords related to different websites. Now that we have some understanding about the topic of key loggers Let's take a look at the demo to further increase the knowledge about the topic. For the first step, we have to download some of the important libraries that are required into the system, which is this library. Now we'll run it. The system says the library is already installed into the system. Now let's take a look what exactly modules are required from the particular library. From this library, we'll import the keyboard module, which will help us to record the data that we type on the keyboard. Now, from the same, we'll also import 
key module and the listener module and also the logging module which will help us to record the data into a log file. For the next part, we'll write a piece of code that will allow us to save the data that is recorded by the program into our text file that will be named as key underscore log text file along with the date and time stamp. Let's take a look. Now, we'll provide it with the file name that will be given as keylog.txt file and also so the part where the format of the data is recorded. Put the brackets over here to contain the file name. Now we'll write the format in which the data will be recorded into the log file which will be given as the format would be the message and the timestamp which would be given as along with the timestamp given as percentage and ending it with the bracket. Now for the next step we'll design two of the functions that will be used into the program that will be termed as while press function and while release function. Let's take a look. While press function would be a function that will come into play when the keyboard key has been pressed is pressed and this would go for the format that we designed in the above line and logging the press key info a string file to be recorded into the log file now now we will design a function that is while release that will come into play when the escape key has been pressed that is the program will terminate itself and the program will stop from running and in the end we require for the functioning of the program to loop these functions that is while press and while release to continue its cycle. That will be going for while press and on release will contain while release function as listener and now this part would join the different threads and store them into the log file now that we have completed the code for the program let's run it We have to wait for a moment so the program runs it. Now, 
To verify the program, let's open Notepad. And on the Notepad, we'll write Hello World, which will be the basic whether the program is working or not. Let's take a look. And we'll go for the main page on Jupyter Notebook and refresh the page. Go to the bottom. Over here, we see the key log text. That is a text file that we created. Let's open it. And over here, we have the data that is created. As we started with, note, then this is a hello world part that we created just now, which shows that the program we created is working properly. Let's take a look at some of the detection methods for keylogger in a system. First one is, the keystrokes that we make become sluggish. That is, the reaction speed from the hardware keyboard is slower than usual. Then we have instances where our system gets hanged or freezes in between the work. There are also cases when there is suspicious unusual activity in the internet. And lastly, there are some unknown programs that are running in the background of the system. These four are general cases where we can observe whether the system is infected with a keylogger program or not. To better understand keylogging activity in a system, let's take a look at the demo for the same. For the first step, let's execute the keylogging program in a system. Over here, I am using a Python keylogging program. And if you want to know more about the keylogging program in Python, you can watch our previous video on what are keyloggers. Let's begin now. Let's execute the program and wait for a second or two for the program to continue execution. Okay, let's take a look whether the program is working properly. We can see that the keylogging program would create a text file named key underscore log. Let's take a look. Key underscore log. Seems like the program is working fine. Let's try typing something on the notepad. Hello world. Now let's see whether the recorded data comes. Seems like the program is working fine. The data is recorded. Hello world with exclamation marks along with the time. Now let's try detecting the keylogger program using different detection methods. For the first step, you can access your settings where you should go for Windows Update. Over here, you would often see some of the updates regarding security measures. That is the very basic step if you want to detect keylogging activity in your system. Let's take a look at the second detection method. For this, you can use a start option and type task manager. Using the task manager app, you can see some of the programs that are displayed. These programs are the ones that are currently working or executed in my system right now. If you see any unusual program that is being executed without your knowledge, may refer to a keylogger program. And if you find any unusual program that has been executed on your system right now, you should right click on the program and choose the option end task. This will immediately end the task that has been executed, which might protect your data from being recorded. Let's take a look at the third option, how we can detect the keyloggers. In the task manager, use the option startup. In the startup option, represents the softwares or programs that get executed when the system is turned on. If you see any unusual program or software mentioned in any of these in your system, you might have to disable that. This represents there's an unusual program or a malicious tool that has been executed when you start up your system, which may relate to a keylogger problem. 
and the last method to detect keylogger activity is to type something if you feel there is some restrictions or there is a gap between when you type the key on your keyboard and the reaction speed becomes slow even by a millisecond this might represent there is a program that is interfering with the keyboard if you use the following detection methods you might save yourself from being spied on or getting your data recorded that you type on your system jude is waiting at the airport to hop on her flight back home when she realizes that she missed making an important bank payment she connects her laptop to the public wi-fi at the airport and goes ahead to carry out the bank transaction everything goes well and jude completes her transaction after a couple of days she was wiped off her feet when she learned that her bank account was subjected to a cyber attack and a hefty amount was wiped from her account after getting in touch with the bank authority she learned that her account was hacked at the airport she then realized that the public wi-fi she used might have caused her this trouble jude wishes that had her bank transfer escaped the hacker's eyes she would not have been a victim of a cyber attack bank officials advise her to use a vpn for future transactions especially when connecting to an open or public network like most of us Jude had come across the term VPN several times, but didn't know much about it, and little did she think that the repercussions of not using a VPN would be this bad. Let's understand how the hacker would have exploited Jude's transaction in the absence of a VPN. In this process, Jude's computer first connects to the internet service provider, ISP, which provides access to the internet. She sends her details to the bank's server using her IP address, Internet Protocol Address, or IP Address, is a unique address that recognizes a particular device, be it a laptop or a smartphone on the internet. When these details pass through the public network, the hacker, who passively watches the network traffic, intercepts it. This is a passive cyber attack, where the hacker collects Jude's bank details without being detected. More often or not, in such an attack, payment information is likely to be stolen. The targeted data here are the victim's username, passwords, and other personal information. Such an unsecured connection exposed Jude's IP address and bank details to the hacker when it passed through the public network. So would Jude have been able to secure her transaction with the help of a VPN? Well, yes. Picture Jude's bank transaction to be happening in a tunnel that is invisible to the hacker. In such a case, the hacker will not be able to spot her transaction. And that is precisely what a VPN does. A virtual private network, more often known as VPN, creates a secure tunnel between your device and the internet. For using a VPN, Jude's first step would be to install a software-based technology known as the VPN client on her laptop or smartphone that would let her establish a secure connection. The VPN client connects to the Wi-Fi and then to the ISP. Here, the VPN client encrypts Jude's information using VPN protocols. Data is encrypted to make sure it is secure. Next, the VPN client establishes a VPN tunnel within the public network that connects to the VPN server. The VPN tunnel protects Jude's information from being intercepted by the hacker. Jude's IP address and actual location are changed at the VPN server to enable a private and secure connection. Finally, the VPN server connects to Jude's bank server in the last step, where the encrypted message is decrypted. This way, Jude's original IP address is hidden by the VPN, and the VPN tunnel protects her data from being hacked. This explains how VPN makes your data anonymous and secure when it passes through the public network, and the difference between a normal connection and a VPN connection. After learning about this, Jude was certain that she should start using a VPN to carry out her online transactions in the future. This is also applicable to each one of us. Even if you work remotely or connect to public Wi-Fi, using a VPN is the safest option. In addition to providing a secure encrypted data transfer, VPNs are also used to disguise your whereabouts and give you access to regional web content. VPN servers act as proxies on the internet. This way, your actual location cannot be established. VPN enables you to spoof your location and switch to a server to another country and thereby change your location. For example, by doing so, you can watch any content on Netflix that might be unavailable for your region. Given the current scenario, 
cyber attacks are on the rise now more than ever. So we have to stay alert and protect our digital information. If you are interested in protecting networks and computers from cyber criminals, a cybersecurity career is what you should venture into. So what are you waiting for? Get certified with Simply Learn and become a cybersecurity expert. Let's move on to learning about the Tor network. Tor, short for the Onion Router, it's an open source privacy network that permits users to browse the web anonymously. The Tor was initially developed and solely used by the US Navy to protect sensitive government communications before the network was made publicly available. The digital era has disrupted the traditional way of doing things in every sector of the economy. The rapid rise in development and innovation of digital products has given way to frequent data breaches and cyber thefts. In response, consumers are increasingly opting for products that offer data privacy and cybersecurity. Tor is one such underground network that was implemented for the purpose of protecting users' identities. The Tor network is one example of the many emerging technologies that attempt to fill a data privacy void in a digital space plagued by cybersecurity concerns. The Tor network intercepts the traffic from your browser and bounces a user's request of a random number of other user IP addresses. Then the data is passed to the user requester's final destination. These random users are volunteer devices which are called as nodes or relays. The Tor network disguises your identity by encrypting the traffic and moving it across different Tor relays within the network. The Tor network uses an onion routing technique for transmitting data, hence the original name of onion router. To operate within the Tor network, a user has to install the Tor browser. Any address or information requested using the browser is transmitted through the Tor network. It has its own feature set which we will be covering over later in this video. As we discussed already, the data passing through the Tor network must follow a unique protocol known as the Onion Routing Protocol. Let us learn more about its unique characteristics. In our normal network usage, the data is transmitted directly. The sender has data packets to transmit which is done directly over a line of communication with either a receiving party or a server of some kind. However, since the data can easily be captured while being transmitted, the security of this exchange is not very reliable. Moreover, it becomes very easy to trace the origin of such requests. On many occasions, websites with questionable and controversial content are blocked from the ISP. This is possible since the ISP is able to detect and spy on user information passing through the network. Apart from ISPs, there is a steady chance of your private information being intercepted by hackers. Unfortunately, easy detection of the source and contents of a web request make entire network extremely vulnerable for people who seek anonymity over the internet. However, in the Onion Routing Protocol, things take a longer route. We have a sender with the Tor browser installed on the client system. The network sends the information to Node 1's IP address, which encrypts the information and passes it on to Node 2's address, which performs another encryption and passes it on to Node 3 address. This is the last address, which is also known as the exit node. This last node decrypts the encrypted data and finally relays the request to the final destination, which can be another device or a server end. This final address thinks the request came from the exit node and grants access to it. The encryption process across multiple computers repeats itself from the exit node to the original user. The Tor network obfuscates user IP addresses from unwanted surveillance by keeping the user's request untraceable. With multiple servers touching the data, it makes the tracking very difficult for both ISPs and malicious attackers. Now that we understand the way Tor works, let us learn more about the Tor browser. The Tor browser was developed by a non-profit organization as a part of the Tor project in 2008 and its first public release was announced. The Tor browser is a browser fork from the popular Firefox that anonymizes your web traffic using the Tor network. If you're investigating a competitor, researching an opposing litigant in a legal dispute, or just think it's creepy for your ISP or the government to know what websites you visit, the Tor browser might be the right solution. Before the Tor browser were developed, using that network to maintain anonymity was a huge task for everyday consumers. Starting from the setup to the usage, the entire process demanded a lot of knowledge and practice. The Tor browser managed to make it easy for users to traverse the relay servers in Tor and guarantee the privacy of the data exchange. 
A major feature of the Tor browser is the ability to delete all browser history, cookies and tracking data the moment it is closed. Every new launch of the browser opens an empty slate, having your usage habits from being tracked and singled out. A major feature that is the highlight of the Tor network is the availability of Onion links. Only a small portion of the World Wide Web is available to the general public. We have the deep web that contains links that are not allowed to be indexed by standard search engines like Google and Bing. The dark web is a further subset of the deep web which contains Onion links. Tor browser gives you access to these .onion websites which are only available within the Tor network. Onion is a special use top level domain which designates an anonymous Onion service which is also known as a hidden service. Similar to the links of the deep web, these Onion links provide services like online shopping, cryptocurrency and many other products not available in the consumer internet space. Often being considered as a haven for illegal activities and sales, Onion links provide both information and assets in a private manner without the risk of spying by authorities. Browsing the web over Tor is slower than the clear net due to the multiple layers of encryption. Some web services also block Tor users. Tor browser is also illegal in authoritarian regimes that want to prevent citizens from reading, publishing and communicating anonymously. Journalists and dissidents around the world have embraced Tor as a cornerstone of democracy and researchers are hard at work at improving Tor's anonymity properties. Let us take a look at some of the advantages of using the Tor browser over standard web browsers. The highlight of using the Tor browser is to maintain anonymity over the internet. The cause for such requests can differ from person to person but all of these concerns are answered by the Tor network. Routing the information via multiple nodes and relay servers make it entirely difficult for the ISP to keep a track of usage data. The entire Tor project is designed to be completely free and open source. Allowing the code for the browser to be inspected and audited by third parties helps in the early detection of faulty configurations and critical bugs. It is present for multiple operating systems starting from laptops to mobile devices. A number of websites are blocked by governments for a variety of reasons. Journalists under authoritarian regimes have difficulty in getting the word out regarding the situation. Since the Onion routing protocol transfers data between multiple servers of random countries, the domains being blocked become available when used via Tor. Usage of these encryption messaging platforms is easily enforced using the Tor browser, which otherwise would have been a difficult task under oppressive circumstances. Many people believe that a VPN offers the same benefits as the Tor browser. Let's put both of them to the test and see the differences between them. Coming to the first point of difference, Tor is completely free and open source. All of the code for the browser and the network can be audited and has been cleared for security concerns. When it comes to VPN, there are many different brands which have open source clients but the same cannot be said for their counterparts. Some have partly open source while some have completely locked up their code so that they cannot be stolen further. Moving on, Tor has multiple relay points in its data transfer protocol. Between the server and the receiver, there are three different IP nodes. That number can increase but it will always be more than two. Once the data is passed from the sender, it goes through all of those relay points. While in the case of a VPN, the connection is made from the client device to the VPN server and then to the requested destination. There is no other IP node that comes into work here, thereby making the connection a one-to-one -one between the client and a VPN. As a next point, since Tor handles multiple layers of encryption and the data passes through multiple systems along the way, the performance is slow compared to a VPN, where the performance is relatively fast due to the less number of nodes the data passes through. Similarly, the multi-layer encryption of Tor is consistent. If you use Tor browser, Every single request passes through the same layer of encryption and follows the same routing protocol. In the case of a VPN, different companies offer different levels of encryption. Some have multi-hop, some prefer a single one-to-one -one connection and these kind of differences make the choice much more variable. Finally, the nodes and relays being used in the Tor network are volunteer. There is no company holding over them, so jurisdiction becomes relatively straightforward. Whereas in the case of VPNs, Many such VPNs are hosted by adware companies or are being monitored by central governments to note the usage information. 
Now that we have a better understanding of the Tor browser and its routing, let us take a look at how the Tor browser can anonymize and protect our internet usage. On opening up the Tor browser for the first time, this is the page that you are going to be welcomed with. You have the option of connecting to the Tor network before we start our browsing. So let's press connect and we can see that it is connected. Coming to the anonymization, let's check my current location on Google Chrome. Currently is showing as Navi Mumbai in Maharashtra. If we check the same link on the Tor browser, we should get a different address. Now every link that we open in the Tor browser will be little delayed and the speed will be hampered because of the multiple layers of encryption like we discussed. Now as you can see, it's showing a German IP and the state of Bavaria. This is how the anonymization works. There is no VPN configured, there is no proxy attached. It's straight up the out of the box settings that come inbuilt with the Tor browser. Similarly, we have an option of cleaning up the data. Let's say if you want to refresh your location and you want to use a different ID for the next browsing session. If you just restart it once and you can have to check it again. We should be seeing a different country this time. As you can see, we have Netherlands right now. So this is how you can keep refreshing your address. You can keep refreshing your host location so that you cannot be tracked when in browsing the internet. Like we discussed, we have some onion links that can only be used on the Tor network. As you can see, these kind of links do not open in the Google Chrome browser. But once we copy these over to the Tor browser, as you can see, we have opened the hidden wiki, which is available only on the Tor network. This is kind of an alternative Wikipedia website where we can find articles to read and more information to learn. Similarly, we have another onion link over here, which is once again available only for the Tor browser. Now these kind of delays are expected, but they are a valid compromise because they maintain the anonymity that many people desire. Similarly, we have found a hidden wallet, which is a cryptocurrency wallet, which is specifically for dark web members. This operates over the Tor network and this is used by mostly journalists and people who want to anonymize their internet transactions when it comes to dealing money. All of the transactions that occur over the Tor network are almost impossible to track. Therefore, these kind of cryptocurrency wallets are very big on the deep web. This is just one example while having multiple different wallets for every single cryptocurrency available. With every aspect of corporate culture going online and embracing cloud computing, there is a plethora of critical data circulating through the internet, all worth billions of dollars to the right person. Increasing benefits require more complex attacks and one of these attacks is a brute force attack. A brute force or known as brute force cracking is the cyber attack equivalent of trying every key on your keyring and eventually finding the right one. Brute force attacks are simple and reliable. There is no prior knowledge needed about the victim to start an attack. Most of the systems falling prey to brute force attacks are actually well secured. Attackers let a computer do the work, that is trying different combinations of usernames and passwords until they find the one that works. Due to this repeated trial and error format, the strength of password matters a great deal. Although with enough time and resources, Brute force will break a system since they run multiple combinations until they find the right passcode. Hey everyone, this is Bhavab from Simply Learn and welcome to this video on what is a brute force attack. Let's take a look at the topics we need to cover today. We start by learning about what a brute force attack is and its reliability as a hacking technique. Next, we take a look at a step-by-step -step approach to how the hackers can take control of a system using brute force techniques. Moving on, we learn about the harmful effects of getting our personal devices brute forced or compromised and how it can affect not only our devices but our friends and family as well. We also understand a few steps that we can enforce to make a better security system against brute force attacks specifically. And finally, we have a demonstration that explains how the brute force mechanism works in a real world situation. 
But before we begin, make sure you're subscribed to our Simply Learn channel and click the bell icon to never miss an update from us. Let's begin with learning about brute force attacks in detail. A brute force attack, also known as an exhaustive search, is a cryptographic hack that relies on guessing possible combinations of targeted password until the current password is discovered. It can be used to break into online accounts, encrypted documents, or even network peripheral devices. The longer the password, the more combinations that will need to be tested. A brute force attack can be time consuming and difficult to perform if methods such as data obfuscation are used and at times downright impossible. However, if the password is weak, it could merely take seconds with hardly any effort. Dictionary attacks are an alternative to brute force attacks where the attacker already has a list of usernames and passwords that need to be tested against the target. It doesn't need to create any other combinations on its own. Dictionary attacks are much more reliable than brute force in a real world context, but the usefulness depends entirely on the strength of passwords being used by the general population. There is a three step process when it comes to brute forcing a system. Let's learn about each of them in detail. In step one, we have to settle on a tool that we are going to use for brute forcing. There are some popular names on the market like Hashcat, Hydra, and John the Ripper. While each of them has its own strengths and weaknesses, each of them perform well with the right configuration. All of these tools come pre-installed with certain Linux distributions that cater to penetration testers and cybersecurity analysts like Kali Linux and Parrot Security. After deciding what tool to use, we can start generating combinations of alphanumeric variables whose only limitation is the number of characters. For example, while using Hydra, a single six-digit password will create 900,000 passwords with only digits involved. Add alphabets and symbols to that sample space and that number grows exponentially. The popular tools allow customizing this process. Let's say the hacker is aware of the password being a specific eight-digit word containing only letters and symbols. This will substantially increase the chances of being able to guess the right password since we remove the time taken to generate the longer ones. We omit the need for including digits in such combinations. These small tweaks go a long way in organizing an efficient brute force attack since running all the combinations with no filters will dramatically reduce the odds of finding the right credentials in time. In the final step, we run these combinations against the file or service that is being broken. We can try and break into a specific encrypted document, a social media account, or even devices at home that connect to the internet. Let's say there is a Wi-Fi router. The generated passwords are then fed into the connection one after the other. It is a long and arduous process, but the work is left to the computer other than someone manually clicking and checking each of these passcodes. Any password that doesn't unlock the router is discarded and the brute force tool simply moves on to the next one. This keeps going on until we find the right combination which unlocks the router. Sometimes reaching the success stage takes days and weeks which makes it cumbersome for people with low computing power at their disposal. However, the ability to crack any system in the world purely due to bad password habits is very appealing and the general public tends to stick with simple and easy to use passwords. Now that we have a fair idea about how brute force works, let's see if we can answer this question. We learned about how complex passwords are tougher to crack by brute force. Among the ones listed on the screens, which one do you believe will take the longest to be broken when using brute force tools? Leave your answers in the comment section and we will get back to you with the correct option next week. Let's move on to the harmful effects of getting a system compromised due to brute force attacks. A hacked laptop or mobile can have social media accounts logged in, giving the hackers free access to the victim's connections. It has been reported on multiple occasions where compromised Facebook accounts are sending malicious links and attachments to people on their friends list. One of the significant reasons for hacking, malware infusion is best done when spread from multiple devices, similar to distributing spam. This reduces the chance of circling back the source to a single device which belongs to the hacker. Once brute forced, a system can spread malware via email attachments, sharing links, file upload via FTP, etc. 
Personal information such as credit card data, usage habits, private images and videos are all stored in our systems, be it in plain format or root folders. A compromised laptop means easy access to these information that can be further used to impersonate the victim regarding bank verification, among other things. Once a system is hacked, it can also be used as a mail server that distributes spam across lists of victims. Since the hacked machines all have different IP addresses and MAC addresses, it becomes challenging to trace the spam back to the original hacker. With so many harmful implications arising from a boot force attack, it's imperative that the general public must be protected against such. Let's learn about some of the ways we can prevent ourselves from becoming a victim of brute force attacks. Using passwords consisting of alphabets, letters and numbers have a much higher chance of withstanding brute force attacks thanks to the sheer number of combinations they can produce. The longer the password, the less likely it is that a hacker will devote the time and resources to brute force them. Having alphanumeric passwords also allows the user to keep different passwords for different websites. This is to ensure that if a single account or a password is compromised due to a breach or a hack, the rest of the accounts are isolated from the incident. Two-factor authentication involves receiving a one-time password on a trusted device before a new login is allowed. This OTB can be obtained either via email, SMS or specific 2FA applications like Authy and Aegis. Email and SMS based OTPs are considered relatively less secure nowadays due to the ease with which SIM cards can be duplicated and mailboxes can be hacked. Applications that are specifically made for 2FA cores are much more reliable and secure. CAPTCHAs are used to stop bots from running through web pages precisely to prevent brute forcing through their website. Since brute force tools are automated, forcing the hacker to solve CAPTCHA for every iteration of a password manually is very challenging. The CAPTCHA system can filter out these automated bots that keep refreshing the page with different credentials, thereby reducing the chances of brute force considerably. A definite rule that locks the account being hacked for 30 minutes after a specific number of attempts is a good way to prevent brute force attempts. Many websites lock account for 30 minutes after 3 failed password attempts to secure the account against any such attack. On an additional note, some websites also send an email instructing the user that there have been 3 insecure attempts to log into the website. Let's look at a demonstration of how brute force attacks work in a real world situation. The world has gone wireless. With Wi-Fi taking the reins in every household, it's natural that the security will always be up for debate. To further test the security index and understand brute force attacks, we will attempt to break into the password of a Wi-Fi router. For that to happen, we first need to capture a handshake file, which is a connection file from the Wi-Fi router to a connecting device like a mobile or a laptop. The operating system used for this process is Parrot Security, a Linux distribution that is catered to penetration testers. All the tools being used in this demo can easily be found pre-installed in this operating system. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit ScaleUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. To start our demo, we're going to use a tool called AirGeddon which is made to hack into wireless network specifically. At this point, it's going to check for all the necessary scripts that are installed in the system. To crack into a Wi-Fi and to capture the handshake file, we're going to need an external network card. The significance of the external network card is a managed mode and a monitor mode. For now, the WLX1 named card is my external network adapter, which I'm going to select. To be able to capture data over the air, we're going to need to put it in monitor mode. As you can see above, it's written it is in managed mode right now. So we're going to select option 2, which is to put the interface in monitor mode. And its name is now WLAN0 monitor. The monitor mode is necessary to capture data over the air. That is the necessary reason why we need an external card since a lot of inbuilt cards that come with the laptops and the systems, they cannot have a monitor mode installed. Once we select the mode, we can go into the fifth, which is the handshake tools menu. 
In the first step, we have to explore for targets and it is written that monitor mode is necessary to select a target. So let's explore for targets and press enter. We have to let this run for about 60 seconds to get a fair idea about the networks that are currently working in this locality. For example, this ESS ID is supposed to be the Wi-Fi name that we see when connecting to a network. Geo24, Recover Me, these are all the names that we see on our mobile when trying to search for the Wi-Fi. This BSS ID is supposed to be an identifier, somewhat like a MAC address that identifies this network from other devices. The channels features on one or two or uh, there are some many channels that the networks can focus on. This here is supposed to be a client that is connected to one such network. For example, the station that you can see 5626, this is supposed to be the MAC address of the device that is connected to a router. This BSS ID is supposed to be which Wi-Fi it is connected to. For example, 5895D8 is this one, which is the Geo24 router. So we already know which router has a device connected to it and we can use our attack to capture this handshake. Now that we, it has already run for one minute, now that we press Ctrl C, we will be asked to select a target. See it has already selected the number 5 which is the Geo24 router as the one with clients. So it is easy to run an attack on and it is easy to capture a handshake for. We select network 5 and we run a capture handshake. It says we have a valid WPA, WPA2 network target selected and that the script can continue. Now to capture the handshake we have a couple of attacks, a DAuth or a DAuth air replay attack. What this attack does is kick the clients out of the network. In return when they try to reconnect to the Wi-Fi as they are configured that way that when a client is disconnected it tries to reconnect it immediately. It tries to capture a handshake file which in turn contains the security key which is necessary to initiate the handshake. For our demo, let's go with the second option that is the DAuth air replay attack. Select a timeout value, let's say we give it 60 seconds and we start the script. We can see it capturing data from the Geo24 network and here we go. We have the WPA handshake file. Once the handshake file is captured, you can actually close this and here we go, congratulations. In order to capturing a handshake, it has verified that a PMK ID from the target network has successfully been captured. This is the file that is already stored, the .cap file. For the path, we can, let's say we can keep it in a desktop. Okay, we give the path and the handshake file is generated. We can already see a target over here, same Geo24 router with the BSS ID. Now if we return to its main menu, we already have the handshake file captured with us. Now our job is to brute force into that handshake capture file. The capture file is often encrypted with the security key of the Wi-Fi network. If we know how to decrypt it, we will automatically get the security key. So let's go to the offline WPA WPA2 decrypt menu. Since we'll be cracking personal networks, we can go with option 1. Now to run the brute force tool, we have two options. Either we can go with the air crack or we can go with the hash cat. Let's go with air crack plus crunch, which is a brute force attack against a handshake file. We can go with option 2. It can already detect the capture file that we have generated. So we select yes. The BSS ID is the one which denotes the Geo24 router. So we're going to select yes as well. The minimum length of the key, for example, it has already checked that the minimum length of a Wi-Fi security key, which is a WPA2 PSK key, will always be more than eight digits and below 64 digits. So we have to select something in between this range. So if we already know, let's say that the password is at least 10 digits, we can go with the minimum length as 10. and as a rough guess, let's say we put the maximum length as 20. The character set that we're going to use for checking the password will affect 
the time taken to brute force for example if we already know that or we have seen a user use the password while connecting to the router as something that has only numbers and symbols then we can choose accordingly let's say if we go with only uppercase characters and numeric characters go with option 7 and it's going to start decrypting So how aircrack is working right here you can see this passphrase over here the first five or six digits are a it starts working its way from the end from the last character it keeps trying every single combination you can see the last the fourth character from the right side the d it will eventually turn to e because it keeps checking up every single character from the end this will keep going on until all the single characters are tested and every single combination is tried out. Since the handshake file is encrypted using the security key that is the WPA2 key of the router, whichever passphrase is able to decrypt the handshake key completely will be the key of the Wi-Fi router. This is the way we can brute force into Wi-Fi routers anywhere in the world. Apart from individuals, Organizations worldwide that host data and conduct business over the internet are always at the risk of a DDoS attack. These DDoS attacks are getting more extreme, with hackers getting easy access to botnet farms and compromised devices. As can be seen in the graph, three of the six strongest DDoS attacks were launched in 2021, with the most extreme attack occurring just last year in 2020. Lately, Cyber criminals have been actively seeking out new services and protocols for amplifying these DDoS attacks. Active involvement with hacked machines and botnets allow further penetration into the consumer space, allowing much more elaborate attack campaigns. Apart from general users, multinational corporations have also had their fair share of problems. GitHub, a platform for software developers, was the target of a DDoS attack in 2018. Widely suspected to be conducted by Chinese authorities, this attack went on for about 20 minutes after which the systems were brought into a stable condition. It was the strongest DDoS attack to date at the time and made a lot of companies reconsider the security practices to combat such attacks. Even after years of experimentation, DDoS attacks are still at large and can affect anyone in the consumer and corporate space. Hey everyone, this is Bebop from Simply Learn. And welcome to this video on what is a DDoS attack. Let's take a look at the topics we will be covering today. We start by learning what is a DDoS attack and how it works on a phase-by-phase -phase level. We learn about the distinct categories in DDoS attacks and the potential aim of hackers when they launch a DDoS attack campaign. We also look at some preventive measures that can be taken to protect oneself from these DDoS attacks. Finally, we have a demonstration of how such attacks can hamper the working of a server system using VMware and Parrot Security Operating System. But before moving forward, make sure you are subscribed to the Simply Learn YouTube channel. Don't forget to hit the bell icon to receive updates about more informative videos from our channel. So let's learn more about what is a DDoS attack. A distributed denial of service attack or DDoS is when an attacker or attackers attempt to make it impossible for a service to be delivered. This can be achieved by thwarting access to virtually anything – servers, devices, services, networks, applications, and even specific transactions within applications. In a DOS attack, it's one system that is sending the malicious data or requests. A DDoS attack comes from multiple systems. Generally, these attacks work by drowning a system with requests for data. This could be sending a web server so many requests to serve a page that it crashes under the demand or it could be a database being hit with a high volume of queries. The result is available internet bandwidth, CPU and RAM capacity become overwhelmed. The impact could range from a minor annoyance from disrupted services to experiencing entire websites, applications or even entire businesses taking offline. More often than not, these attacks are launched using machines in a botnet. A botnet is a network of devices that can be triggered to send requests from a remote source, often known as the command and control center. The bots in the network attack a particular target, thereby hiding the original perpetrator of the DDoS campaign. But how do these devices come under a botnet? And what are the requests being made to the web servers? Let's learn more about these and how DDoS attacks work. 
A DDoS attack is a two-phase process. In the first phase, a hacker creates a botnet of devices. Simply put, a vast network of computers are hacked via malware, ransomware or just simple social engineering. These devices become a part of the botnet which can be triggered anytime to start bombarding a system or a server on the instruction of the hacker that created the botnet. The devices in these networks are called bots or zombies. In the second phase, a particular target is selected for the attack. When the hacker finds the right time to attack, all the zombies in the botnet network send these requests to the target, thereby taking up all the server's available bandwidth. These can be simple ping requests or complex attacks like SYN flooding and UDP flooding. The aim is to overwhelm them with more traffic than the server or the network can accommodate. The goal is to render the website or service inoperable. There is a lot of wiggle room when it comes to the type of DDoS attack a hacker can go with. Depending on the target's vulnerability, we can choose one of the three broad categories of DDoS attacks. Volume-based attacks use massive amounts of bogus traffic to overwhelm a resource. It can be a website or a server. They include ICMP, UDAP and spoofed packet flood attacks. The size of volume-based attack is measured in bits per second. These attacks focus on clogging all the available bandwidth for the server, thereby cutting the supply short. Several requests are sent to the server, all of which warrant a reply, thereby not allowing the target to cater to the general legitimate users. Next, we have the protocol level attacks. These attacks are meant to consume essential resources of the target server. They exhaust the load balancers and firewalls, which are meant to protect the system against the DDoS attacks. These protocol attacks include SYN floods and Smurf DDoS, among others, and the size is measured in packets per second. For example, in an SSL handshake, server replies to the hello message sent by the hacker, which will be the client in this case, but since the IP is spoofed and leads nowhere, the server gets stuck in an endless loop of sending the acknowledgement without any end in sight. Finally, we have the application level attacks. Application layer attacks are conducted by flooding applications with maliciously crafted requests. The size of application layer attacks is measured in requests per second. These are relatively sophisticated attacks that target the application and operating system level vulnerabilities. They prevent the specific applications from delivering necessary information to users and hog the network bandwidth up to the point of a system crash. Examples of such an attack are HTTP flooding and BGP hijacking. A single device can request data from a server using HTTP POST or GET without any issues. However, when the requisite botnet is instructed to bombard the server with thousands of requests, the database bandwidth gets jammed and it eventually becomes unresponsive and unusable. But what about the reasons for such an attack? There are multiple lines of thought as to why a hacker decides to launch a DDoS attack on unsuspecting targets. Let's take a look at a few of them. The first option is to gain a competitive advantage. Many DDoS attacks are conducted by hacking communities against rival groups. Some organizations hire such communities to stagger their rivals' resources at a network level to gain an advantage in the playing field. Since being a victim of a DDoS attack indicates a lack of security, the reputation of such a company takes a significant hit, allowing the rivals to cover up some ground. Secondly, some hackers launch these DDoS attacks to hold multinational corporations at ransom. The resources are jammed and the only way to clear the way is if the target company agrees to pay a designated amount of money to the hackers. Even a few minutes of inactivity is detrimental to a company's reputation in the global market and it can cause a spiral effect both in terms of market value and product security index. Most of the time, a compromise is reached and the resources are freed after a while. DDoS attacks have also found use in the political segment. Certain activists tend to use DDoS attacks to voice their opinion. Spreading the word online is much faster than any local rally or forum. Primarily political, these attacks also focus on online communities, ethical dilemmas, or even protests against corporations. Let's take a look at a few ways that companies and individuals can protect themselves against DDoS attacks. The company can employ load balancers and firewalls to help protect the data from such attacks. 
load balancers reroute the traffic from one server to another in a DDoS attack. This reduces the single point of failure and adds resiliency to the server data. A firewall blocks unwanted traffic into a system and manages the number of requests made at a definite rate. It checks for multiple attacks from a single IP and occasional slowdowns to detect a DDoS attack in action. Early detection of a DDoS attack goes a long way in recovering the data lost in such an event. Once you've detected the attack, you will have to find a way to respond. For example, you will have to work on dropping the malicious DDoS traffic before it reaches your server so that it doesn't throttle and exhaust your bandwidth. Here's where you will filter the traffic so that only legitimate traffic reaches the server. By intelligent routing, you can break the remaining traffic into manageable chunks that can be handled by your cluster resources. The most important stage in DDoS mitigation is where you will look for patterns of DDoS attacks and use those to analyze and strengthen your mitigation techniques. For example, blocking an IP that's repeatedly found to be offending is a first step. Cloud providers like Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure who offer high levels of cybersecurity, including firewalls and threat monitoring software can help protect your assets and network from DDoS criminals. The cloud also has greater bandwidth than most private networks, so it is likely to fail if under the pressure of increased DDoS attacks. Additionally, reputable cloud providers offer network redundancy, duplicating copies of your data, systems and equipment so that if your service becomes corrupted or unavailable due to a DDoS attack, you can switch to a secure access on backed up versions without missing a beat. One can also increase the amount of bandwidth available to a host server being targeted. Since DDoS attacks fundamentally operate on the principle of overwhelming systems with heavy traffic, simply provisioning extra bandwidth to handle unexpected traffic spikes can provide a measure of protection. This solution can prove expensive as a lot of that bandwidth is going to go unused most of the time. A content delivery network or a CDN distributes your content and boosts performance by minimizing the distance between your resources and end users. It stores the cached version of your content in multiple locations and this eventually mitigates DDoS attacks by avoiding a single point of failure when the attacker is trying to focus on a single target. Popular CDNs include Akamai CDN, Cloudflare, AWS CloudFront, etc. Let's start with our demo regarding the effects of DDoS attacks on a system. For our demo, we have a single device that will attack a target, making it a DOS attack of sorts. Once a botnet is ready, multiple devices can do the same and eventually emulate a DDoS attack. To do so, we will use the virtualization software called VMware with an instance of Parrot Security Operating System running. For a target machine, we will be running another VMware instance of a standard Linux distribution known as Linux Lite. In a target device, we can use Wireshark to determine when the attack begins and see the effects of the attack accordingly. This is Linux Lite, which is our target machine. And this is Parrot Security, which is used by the hacker when trying to launch a DDoS attack. This is just one of the distros that can be used. To launch the attack, we must first find the IP address of our target. So to find the IP address, we open the terminal. We use the command ifconfig. And here we can find the IP address. Now remember, we're launching this attack in VMware. Now the, both the instances of Parrot Security and Linux Lite are being run on my local network. So the address that you can see here is 192.168.72.129, which is a private address. This IP cannot be accessed from outside the network, basically anyone who is not connected to my Wi-Fi. When launching attacks with public servers or public addresses, it will have a public IP address that does not belong to the 192.168 subnet. Once we have the IP address, we can use a tool called HPing3. HPing3 is an open source packet generator and analyzer for the TCP IP protocol. To check what are the effects of an attack, we will be using Wireshark. Wireshark is a network traffic analyzer. 
we can see whatever traffic that is passing through the Linux Lite distro is being displayed over here with the IP address, the source IP and the destination IP as to where the request is being transferred to. Once we have the DOS attack launched, you can see the results coming over here from the source IP which will be Parrot Security. Now, to launch the HPing3 command, we need to give sudo access to the console which is the root access. Now we have the root access for the console. The hping3 command will have a few arguments to go with it which are as you can see on the screen minus s and a flood a hyphen v hyphen p80 and the IP address of the target which is 192.168.72.129. In this command, we have a few arguments this, such as the minus "-s", which specifies syn packets. Like in an SSL handshake, we have the syn request that the client sends to the server to initiate a connection. The hyphen flood aims to ignore the replies that the server will send back to the client in response to the syn packets. Here the Parrot Security OS is the client and Linux Lite being the server. Minus V stands for verbosity, as in where we will see some output when the requests are being sent. The hyphen P80 stands for port 80, which we can replace the port number if we want to attack a different port. And finally, we have the IP address of our target. As of right now, if we check Wireshark, it is relatively clear and there is no indication of a DDoS attack incoming. Now, once we launch the attack over here, we can see the uh, request coming in from this IP which is 192.168.72.128. Till now even if the network is responsive and so is Linux Lite. The requests keep on coming and we can see the HTTP flooding has started in flood mode. After a few seconds of this attack continuing, the server will start shutting down. Now remember Linux Lite is a distro that can focus on and that serves as a backend. Now remember Linux Lite is a distro and such Linux distros are served as backend to many servers across the world. For example, a few seconds have passed from the attack. Now the system has become completely irresponsive. This has happened due to the huge number of requests that came from Parrot Security. You can see whatever I press, nothing is responded. Even the Wireshark has stopped capturing new requests because the CPU usage right now is completely 100% and at this point of time, anyone who is trying to request some information from this Linux distro or where this Linux distro is being used as a backend for a server or a database cannot access anything else. The system has completely stopped responding and any request, any legitimate request from legitimate users will be dropped. Once we stop the attack over here, it takes a bit of time to settle down. Now remember, it's still out of control, but eventually the traffic dies down and the system regains its strength. It is relatively easy to gauge right now the effect of a DOS attack. Now remember, this Linux Lite is just a VM instance. Actual website servers and web databases, they have much more bandwidth and are very secure and it is tough to break into. That is why we cannot use a single machine to break into them. That is where a DDoS attack comes into play. What we did right now is a DOS attack, as in a single system is being used to penetrate a sub target server using a single request. Now, when a DDoS attack, multiple systems such as multiple parallel security instances or multiple zombies or bots in a botnet network can attack a target server to completely shut down the machine and drop any legitimate request thereby rendering the service and the target completely unusable and inoperable. As a final note, we would like to remind that this is for educational purposes only and we do not endorse any attacks on any domains. Only test this on servers and networks that you have permission to test on. The important question 
is how to become a certified ethical hacker in order to become a certified ethical hacker you need to pass the certified ethical hacker or the ceh exam from ec council which tests the broad knowledge of subject matter that is required for someone to be an effective ethical hacker well since its inception in 2003 the certified ethical hacker has been the absolute choice of the industry globally it is recognized worldwide and has been endorsed by governmental agencies like the nsa the ch exam is also is accredited by nc which adds credibility and value to the credential members the ch exam is computerized proctored exam you'll have four hours to complete 125 questions there are some sources of information that mentions that in order to pass you need to score about 60 to 80 percent the actual percentage of questions that you must answer correctly varies from exam to exam and depends on the difficulty of the exams delivered when you take the exam the harder the questions that are asked the fewer questions you need to get right to pass the exam if you get easier questions then you will need to get more of the questions right to pass the exam however keep in mind that when you take the actual exam at the testing center the passing grade may vary the ceh certification exam cost five hundred dollars plus an additional eligibility fee of hundred dollars the exam duration is for four hours the questions are all multiple choice the exam is only available in English as of today. Candidates can take the CES exam online using a remotely proctored service from anywhere in the world 24-7 as long as they have a computer equipped with a webcam and a microphone. Let's discuss the exam outline. The exam is broken into seven domains. Networking and information background covers about 22%. Analysis assessment covers 12%, security covers 23%, tools system programs 29%, procedures methodology 9%, regulation policy 2%, and ethics 3%. Let's discuss these domains a little more in detail. Networking and information background. This first domain of the CEH exam is designed to test your knowledge of everything that you need to know to practice ethical hacking, which isn't specific to any information security domain. The objectives of this domain include network and communication technologies. Next is information security threats and attack vector, such as malwares, OWASP top 10, etc. The final objective covers information security technologies such as mobile technologies, telecommunication technologies, backups, archiving, etc. Analysis Assessment This domain of the Certified Ethical Hacker exam is designed to test your knowledge of what goes into performing a penetration test or ethical hacking. The objectives of this domain are information security assessment and analysis and information security assessment process. Combination of ethics and regulation policy domains covers 5% of the total exam weightage. The objectives of these domains are ethics of information security, which covers what is considered ethical and unethical from the perspective of the CEH certification. Not only you will be expected to behave ethically, you will be expected to adhere to a code of ethics. Next objective is information security policies, laws, acts, which covers some of the major information security regulations and the evaluation of organizational security policies. This is an important procedures methodology. This is an important domain and carries a weightage of 9%. There are two objectives. The first objective covers information security procedures, which is the step-by-step -step methods that is used to identify, prevent, and enforce security controls against unwanted behavior. The next objective is information security assessment methodologies, which covers security assessments to determine security gaps that may pose a risk to the organization tools systems programs this domain carries the maximum weightage of 29 percent and so you should expect the maximum number of questions from here this domain is heavily focused on knowledge of the specific systems programs and tools used in ethical hacking 
There are three objectives. First objective covers information security systems such as firewalls, intrusion detection and prevention systems, SIEM solutions, etc. Next objective covers information security programs that are used to secure a host system against malicious attackers. These programs include antivirus, anti-spyware, anti-riskware, ad blockers, anti-rootkit, etc. The final objective covers information security tools used for performing footprinting and reconnaissance, performing enumeration, conducting network scanning, performing web application hacking, etc. This security domain is the second largest domain on the exam with 23% weightage. This domain is divided into three objectives. The first objective covers information security controls such as administrative controls, technical controls and physical controls. The second objective, information security attack detection, covers various methods to detect attacks against an organization's information security. The final objective, information security attack prevention, covers proactive methods that organizations can use to protect themselves from malicious attackers. From malicious attacks. Let us understand the importance of the CA certification before getting to know about its content. So why should you take up the CH version 11? The Certified Ethical Hacker is the most trusted ethical hacking certification and a recommended one by employers around the globe. Since the introduction of the CH certification in 2003, it is globally recognized as a standard within the information security field. The CH version 11 by EC Council continues to keep up to the standard and it familiarizes the latest hacking techniques and teaches you advanced hacking tools and exploits used. The CH version 11 aligns with the current cybersecurity market requirements and adds the latest advancements in the cybersecurity field. The CH certification helps and trains you to think like a hacker and this in turn helps you beat a hacker and defend your network. After obtaining the CH certification, you'll be a certified ethical hacker. A certified ethical hacker is a skilled professional working in a red team environment who safeguards networks and understands attack strategies and mimics the skills of malicious hackers. Certified ethical hackers discover vulnerabilities in a system and operate with permission from the system owners only. So who can become a certified ethical hacker and who can take up the CH certification? Let us have a look at that now. In the first case, to be eligible for the CH certification exam, you need to attend the official training from authorized EC Council training partners. It can be an online training or tutor-led training from EC Council learning partners. Only then are you eligible to take up the CH certification exam. So a candidate who has completed an official EC Council training is eligible to take up the exam without going through the application process. Or, in the second case, in order to be considered for this credential, you need to have at least two years of work experience in the information security domain and you must pay a non-refundable application fee and submit an eligibility application form. Once it is approved, you can take up the CH exam. After the application is approved, you can purchase the test voucher. In the latest version of the CH, we will see the addition of various core concepts. Moving on to our next topic, let us see how different the CH version 11 is and few of its objectives. Firstly, it outlines ethical hacking concepts, cyber kill chain concepts, an overview of information security and various laws and regulations related to information security. This certification briefs you about the phases of system hacking, attacking techniques and how you can maintain access. It also briefs you about footprinting concepts and ways of utilizing footprinting tools along with necessary countermeasures. The next objective is to familiarize with vulnerability assessment along with the hands-on experience of various scanning tools. Next, we have cybersecurity threats like malware threats, analysis of various worms, viruses and trojans. Various malware concepts, packet sniffing concepts and techniques have been introduced into this domain. It also highlights the concepts related to social engineering, denial of service attacks, SQL injection, and evasion techniques. It also speaks about wireless hacking concepts and mobile device management. The concept of operational technology is a new addition this time. Next is getting acquainted with security solutions like firewalls, honeypots, IPS, their evasion, and protection. 
Our fifth point is knowing various topics in cryptography like encryption algorithms, public key infrastructure and cryptanalysis. Moving on, the next objective is to incorporate Parrot Security OS as it offers better performance on lower powered laptops and machines when compared to Kali Linux. Next is to learn to recognize and deal with IoT-based vulnerabilities and attacks with the CH version 11 course that covers the latest IoT hacking tools. You would be required to ensure the safety of IoT devices. Our next point is with respect to the evolving cloud industry. You would need to learn how to identify and defend cloud-based threats and attacks. The latest version of CH includes new operating systems and Windows 10 configured with domain controller and vulnerable web applications for improving hacking skills. Finally, what is different is that more than 50% of the CH version 11 course is dedicated to practical skills in live ranges via EC Council Labs. EC Council leads in this aspect of the industry. Now that we saw the CH exam objectives, let us look into the CH exam topics weightage. As you see on your screens, this is a pie chart with 9 domains in CH along with their weightages. You can prepare for your exam accordingly. Let us move on and take a closer look at each of these domains, their respective subdomains and their descriptions. Our first domain is Information Security and Ethical Hacking Overview. This domain consists of questions from information security, cyber kill chain concepts, ethical hacking concepts, various hacking concepts, and information security laws and standards. You can expect a total number of 8 questions from this domain. The weightage of this section is 6%. The second domain is reconnaissance techniques. Under the subdomains, we have footprinting and reconnaissance at first. This covers various topics like footprinting concepts, footprinting methodology, email footprinting, footprinting through web services, DNS footprinting, footprinting through social engineering, etc. The next subdomain in this section is scanning networks. Scanning networks covers various concepts like scanning tools, host discovery, port and service discovery, OS discovery, draw network diagrams, scanning beyond IDS, firewall, etc. And our third subdomain under reconnaissance techniques is enumeration. Various topics like SNMP enumeration, NTP and NFS enumeration, SMTP and DNS enumeration, and enumeration countermeasures are covered under this subdomain. A total of 26 questions will be asked from this domain. Under footprinting and reconnaissance, you will have 10 questions. And under scanning networks, another 10. And finally, under enumeration, you will have 6 questions. A total weightage of 21% is given to this particular topic. Our third domain is system hacking faces and attack techniques. Under our third domain, our first subdomain is about vulnerability analysis. This subdomain covers topics on vulnerability assessment, vulnerability classification, vulnerability assessment solutions and tools, and various vulnerability assessment reports. Our next subdomain is about system hacking. You have concepts like gaining access, cracking passwords, vulnerability exploitation, escalating privileges, maintaining access covered under this subdomain. And finally, we have malware threats under this domain. Malware threats incorporate concepts like APT concepts, Trojan concepts, virus and worm concepts, malware analysis and so on. A total of 21 questions will be asked from this domain. Under vulnerability analysis, there will be 9 questions asked, system hacking another 6 questions and finally under malware threats, you will have 6 other questions asked. That sums up to a total 21 with a weightage of 17% for this domain. Our fourth domain is about network and perimeter hacking. Here you have various subdomains and one of it is social engineering. Under social engineering, you will be asked questions based on social engineering techniques, insider threats, impersonation on social, networking sites, identity theft and so on. You will also have various questions on the sniffing concepts as it is another subdomain. You can also expect questions from the denial of service subdomain. Here, questions related to botnets and DDoS attacks will be asked. Various session hijacking concepts are another crucial part of this domain. The final subdomain is about evading IDS firewalls and honeypots. Here, various concepts on IDS, IPS, firewall and honeypots are covered. 
you will need to understand how to evade IDS and firewalls and how to detect honeypots. A total number of 18 questions will be asked from the fourth domain that was network and perimeter hacking and the weightage for this domain is 14%. Our fifth domain is about web application hacking and our first subdomain in it is hacking web servers. This incorporates concepts related to web server attacks, web server attack tools, patch management and so on. The next subdomain is about hacking web applications. Here you have various concepts related to bypass client-side controls, analyze web applications, footprint web infrastructure, attack access controls, and how to perform injection attacks and so on. Finally, under the SQL injection subdomain, you will have questions based on SQL injection, the types of SQL injection, the SQL injection methodology, SQL injection tools, evasion techniques, and SQL injection countermeasures. Here, a total of 20 questions will be asked from this domain. And that is, a weightage of 16% will be given to the web application hacking domain. Our sixth domain is solely devoted to wireless network hacking. This domain focuses on hacking wireless networks, various wireless concepts, wireless encryption, wireless threats, wireless hacking tools, various hacking methodologies, Bluetooth hacking, and wireless countermeasures are covered. A total of 8 questions will be asked from this domain with a weightage of 6%. Our seventh domain is all about mobile platform IoT and OT hacking. Our first subdomain here is hacking mobile platforms. Here, the concepts that are touched upon are mobile platform attack vectors, hacking Android OS, hacking iOS, mobile device management, and mobile security guidelines and tools. Our next subdomain here is about IoT and OT hacking, which covers concepts on IoT hacking tools, its methodologies, countermeasures, and it also speaks about OT concepts, OT attacks, OT hacking tools, and OT countermeasures. You have a total of 10 questions asked from this domain with a weightage of 8%. The next domain is very interesting and it is all related to cloud. The cloud computing domain covers concepts based on cloud computing, serverless computing, cloud computing threats, cloud hacking, and cloud security. The weightage given to this domain is 6% with a total number of questions of 7. And finally, we have cryptography as our ninth domain. As the name suggests, this domain covers topics based on cryptography concepts, encryption algorithms, cryptography tools, public key infrastructure, email encryption, disk encryption, crypt analysis, and countermeasures. And seven questions will be asked from this domain with a weightage of 6%. Now that you saw the CH exam topics weightage, let us have a closer look at the CH exam details. Let us first have a look at the CH exam based on MCQs. The exam title is Certified Ethical Hacker with the exam code of 312-50. This exam will have 125 questions with a time limit of 4 hours. The test format is multiple choice questions. The pass percentage varies ideally between 60% to 85%. Now let's have a look at the CH practical exam details. In order to gain the CH master recognition, it is mandatory that you take up the CH practical exam as well. The exam title is Certified Ethical Hacker Practical and this practical exam will have 20 questions with a duration of 6 hours. The exam format will be iLab Cyber Range and finally the passing score for the CH practical exam is at 70%. After clearing both the MCQ based exam and the practical exam, you can get the CH master recognition. Now that we had a look at the CH exam details, let us have a look at the career prospects for a professional with this certification. Let's look at the critical skills you need to become a certified ethical hacker. First is coding. Ethical hackers should have an excellent grasp of the various programming languages and understand the coding techniques to gain access to any software. It will help you understand the tools hackers develop to infiltrate a security system. Some of the popular coding languages ethical hackers need to know are Python, JavaScript, PHP and SQL. Coming to the second skill, so ethical hackers should know the basics of different operating systems, specifically Linux as it is more secure than any other operating system. Most web servers run on Linux operating system. Gaining access to this server to check for faults is another must-have skill for ethical hackers. Now they also need to understand how firewalls work as well. Coming to the third skill. So to become an ethical hacker, you must understand both wired and wireless networks. They must know networks like DHCP, 
NAT and subnetting to investigate the different interconnected machines in a network and the possible security threats that this may create. Now moving on to the fourth skill, having good knowledge of wireless technologies like Wired Equivalent Privacy or WEP, Wi-Fi Protected Access or WPA and Wi-Fi Protected Setup or WPS will help ethical hackers guard systems against sending information via hidden streams. Ethical hackers need to grasp how to write SQL statements for in-band, out-of-band and blind SQL attacks which can swiftly compromise a database operation and the data it holds. Cryptography deals with transforming a normal text message to a non-readable form during the transmission to make it incomprehensible for hackers. An ethical hacker ensures that conversation between different people within the organization does not leak. Now coming to the final skill, ethical hackers additionally require analytical thinking and problem solving skills to succeed at this job. They should be able to reverse engineer security frameworks, come up with uncommon ways to break into a network. This also requires thinking outside the box. Now companies across various industries hire ethical hackers for several job roles. So once you become a certified ethical hacker, you can get into multiple job roles. Let's look at a few of them. First, we have security analyst. The security analysts execute security systems to safeguard the organization's networks, data and also help to maintain security standards. They document the security breaches and measure the damage caused. Security analysts also analyze the security issues thoroughly to identify the root cause. The second job role we have is penetration tester. So penetration testers conduct tests and purposefully try to exploit existing computer systems and software to identify and correct system weaknesses. They implement solutions to enhance data security and provide recommendations based on an assessment of hardware and software systems. The third job role we have for a certified ethical hacker is security engineer. So security engineers understand complicated technical issues and manage them with a fast paced business environment. They also conduct proactive research to investigate security vulnerabilities and recommend suitable strategies. And finally, we have the job role of a security consultant. Cybersecurity consultants are highly in demand today and are amongst the heavily paid professionals. A cybersecurity consultant is responsible for protecting sensitive data that come from various aspects of the digital world. They evade security risks and prevent cyber attacks. Security consultants study security criteria or cybersecurity criteria, security systems and validation procedures. Now before we go further, I have another question for you people. So which role do you think is the most exciting? Do let us know your responses in the comment section of the video. We would be glad to hear from you. Now moving ahead. With the increasing number of cyber attacks across the globe, ethical hackers are in demand like never before. Very recently, a United Nations official warned that cybercrime went up by 600% during the COVID-19 pandemic. As per the government data presented in Parliament, India alone reported 1.16 million cyber attacks in 2020. That's almost 3x times more than 2019. Now, according to Cybersecurity Ventures, cyber threats will cost nearly 6 trillion US dollars in 2021. Cybersecurity Ventures also expects global cybercrime costs will grow up by 15% per year over the next 5 years and reach 10.5 trillion US dollars annually by 2025. Now there is a huge shortage of ethical hacking professionals globally. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the information security industry is expected to grow 32% in the next decade. Another report by Cybersecurity Ventures tells that the world will have 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs by the end of 2021. According to a report by the Data Security Council of India, the Indian cybersecurity services industry is expected to grow to about $7.6 billion in 2022 and would be worth $13.6 billion by 2025. So companies are looking for trained ethical hackers who can protect their networks and safeguard them from potential threats. A few of the industries that heavily rely on ethical hackers are healthcare companies, financial institutions, 
energy companies and government agencies. With ample opportunities lying ahead, what's stopping you from starting a career in cybersecurity? With the world turning virtual, cyber attacks are constantly flooding new headlines. COVID-19 accelerated the current digital transformation, and the year 2020 witnessed several data breaches. Since technology has become more intertwined with our daily lives, it is no surprise that the need for skilled cybersecurity professionals is increasing. On that note, hey everyone, welcome yet to another exciting video by Simply Learn, which will take you through the top cybersecurity career options available today. But before we begin, if you're new here and haven't subscribed already, make sure to hit the subscribe button and that bell icon for interesting tech videos every day. There is a significant lack of skilled cybersecurity professionals who can tackle the cybersecurity challenges faced daily. Hence, a career in cybersecurity is demanding and equally rewarding. Finding the right career path in the cybersecurity industry isn't always easy. Here, we are here to help you with that. There are a few prerequisites for a career in cybersecurity. The basic one being a bachelor's degree in a subject relating to cybersecurity. However, if you don't have a relevant degree, you can always take up relevant cybersecurity certifications and kickstart your cybersecurity journey. A few other skills like networking, knowledge of operating systems, and cloud security are required to start and grow your cybersecurity career. You can check out our video on the top five cybersecurity skills to know more. Cybersecurity jobs vary from entry level to executive management and everything in between. There are several cybersecurity paths available today. It is best if you start with entry level and then move on to the next level with the help of certifications and relevant experience. Here, let us have a look at the top five cybersecurity job roles today. The first job role is that of a network engineer. Network engineers construct and administer a company's computer networks. They are responsible for installing, configuring, and supporting network equipment. They also configure and maintain firewalls, switches, and routers. This entry-level cybersecurity job can help you start your journey to become an ethical hacker. The annual average salary of a network engineer in the U.S. is $85,098, and in India, it is around 510,000 rupees. Second on our list is Information Security Analyst. As an Information Security Analyst, your primary duty is to protect sensitive information. Information Security Analysts create and implement plans for preventing cyber attacks. They monitor data access and ensure compliance with policies. Depending on the cyber threat, they decide if it has to be resolved or escalated further. In the U.S., an Information Security Analyst earns $89,140 annually. And in India, they earn 6,42,756 rupees. Third on our list is Ethical Hacker. They are also known as Penetration Testers. They are network security consultants who identify and exploit system vulnerabilities just like how a hacker would do. They probe and test the network using various penetration tools and software. They also design new penetration tools and document the test results. In the US, a certified ethical hacker earns around $93,000 on an annual average basis. And in India, they make around 5 lakh rupees. The fourth job role that we are going to talk about is Security Architect. Security Architects research and plan the security elements for their organizations. They design robust security structures that are capable of preventing malware attacks. A Security Architect approves the installation of routers, VPN, and firewalls. Their duties go beyond just architecture building and including formulating company procedures, guidelines, and user guides. Security architects in the U.S. make a handsome sum of $124,000 a year on an average, and in India, they make nearly 21 lakh 80,000 rupees. And finally, fifth on our list is Chief Information Security Officer, CISO. They are senior level officers in an organization. They ensure the safety of the information they develop, implement and maintain information security and risk management programs. They also interact with stakeholders and regularly brief them with information security concerns. The average annual salary of a Chief Information Security Officer in the States is a whopping $165,000 annually and in India, it is 22,22,845 rupees. Several companies are looking for skilled cybersecurity professionals. 
Philips, Siemens, Google, Microsoft, and GE, to name a few. With passion, the right amount of experience, and relevant certifications, you can grow your cybersecurity career. You can check out Simply Learn Cybersecurity Expert Master's Program to equip you with the necessary skills needed to become an expert in this rapidly growing domain. This course will help you learn various methods as to how you can protect your infrastructure, secure your data, run risk analysis, achieve compliance, and much more. Choose from over 300 in-demand skills and get access to 1,000 plus hours of video content for free. Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. The books we are going to talk about in this live session will familiarize you with hacking on the whole. These books will introduce you to new ideas and help you solve problems. Reading in general is great as it helps with your thought process and keeps you mentally alert. It is important that you use the information in the upcoming books only for lawful purposes. So let's get started and see the best books which can help you with hacking. The first book we have is The Basics of Hacking and Penetration Testing. This book is written by Patrick Ingbretson. For all your beginners out there, if you're clueless about how to go about hacking, then this is a good read for y'all. Having said that, this book is not just for beginners, but even for those individuals who are only exposed to superficial penetration testing logic. This book dives deep into the tools and processes that are used by penetration testers to gain access to the systems. The basics of hacking and penetration testing book will help you achieve a better understanding of offensive security as well. You'll be acquainted with various phases of ethical hacking here. The book contains seven chapters and it focuses on hacking tools such as Backtrack Linux, Google Reconnaissance, Nmap, Nessus, Metasploit, and Hacker Defender Rootkit to name a few. The fun part is that each chapter consists of hands-on exercises that help you interpret and implement results in each phase. This book is apt for students, beginning infosec professionals, and security consultants. The second book we have is Hacking, A Beginner's Guide to Computer Hacking, Basic Security, and Penetration Testing. It is written by John Slavio. This is yet another go-to book for beginners. This book can be your first step to a career in ethical hacking. It will cover all the basics with respect to hacking, security, and pen testing. The tools covered in this book are History of Hacking, Types of Hackers, Various Types of Hacking Attacks, basic hacking tools and software, and hiding IP address. It also speaks about mobile hacking, hacking an email address, penetration testing, and spoofing attacks. Up next, we have Hacking the Art of Exploitation. It is written by John Erickson. This book has two editions, one which was published in 2003 and the other in 2008. This book is famous for the hacking approach it teaches. It focuses on network security and computer security. It helps you understand how to develop exploits rather than just using them. If you want to up your ethical hacking game, then this book definitely requires a read. Hacking the Art of Exploitation in its second edition introduces you to C programming from a hacker's perspective. Out of the plethora of concepts that you will learn in this book, few crucial ones are that you will learn to program computers using C and shell scripts. You will also be able to outplay security measures like intrusion detection systems. Having said that, you will also learn to hijack TCP connections, crack encrypted wireless traffic, and speed up brute force attacks. Let's now have a look at the next ethical hacking book on our list, and that is Kali Linux, an ethical hacker's cookbook. This book revolving around Kali Linux is written by Himanshu Sharma. Kali Linux is primarily used for advanced penetration testing and also for security auditing. It contains numerous tools that are geared towards various security tasks such as security research, penetration testing, and so on. This book will help you get started with installation and configuration of Kali Linux which will enable you to perform your tests. In addition to that, you will learn to perform web application exploitation using tools such as Burp. You will also be acquainted with performing network exploitation using Metasploit and Wireshark. Lastly, you will know how to conduct advanced penetration testing these were few of the concepts you will be learning besides a lot more others in the book. At number 5, we have Metasploit, the Penetration Tester's Guide. This book is written by four authors, David Kennedy, Jim O'Gorman, Devon Kearns, and Marty Aharoni. The Metasploit framework is a powerful tool for hackers to exploit IP addresses and ports in it. This framework makes discovering and exploiting vulnerabilities easy. 
but for first time users it can be a little tricky hence this book will teach you all about metasploit you will learn the framework's interfaces module system and more as you launch simulated attacks after which you will move on to advanced penetration testing techniques which include network reconnaissance client side attacks wireless attacks and targeted social engineering attacks you will also learn to integrate nexpos nmap and nessis with metasploit to automate discovery up next we have penetration testing a hands on introduction to hacking this book is written by georgia wheatman as the name suggests this book throws an insight into penetration testing a penetration tester discovers security weaknesses in operating systems networks and applications penetration techniques are used to gauge enterprise defenses This book focuses on the core skills and techniques a penetration tester requires. Here you'll go through the prime stages of an actual assessment which includes gathering information, unravel vulnerabilities, gaining access to networks and so on. In addition to the above, you will learn to crack passwords with the techniques of brute forcing and word lists, bypass antivirus software, automate attacks and you will also learn to use Metasploit framework for launching exploits and for writing your own Metasploit modules out of the many other learnings. Moving on to our next book, we have The Hacker Playbook 3. The Hacker Playbook 3: Practical Guide to Penetration Testing is written by Peter Kim. This is the third iteration of the Hacker Playbook series. It brings with itself new strategies, attacks, exploits, tips and tricks. Besides all the new concepts, it also highlights a few techniques from the previous versions. Many schools have this book incorporated in their teaching. The Hacker Playbook 3 Red Team Edition acquaints you with the Red Team. Red Team simulate real-world advanced attacks to test your organization's defensive teams. A Red Teamer will accurately test and validate the overall security program. Reading the Hacker Playbook 3 will help you advance your offensive hacking skills and attack paths. In addition to that, it also focuses on real-world attacks, exploitation, custom malware, persistence, and more. This heavily lab-based book will incorporate several virtual machines and custom the hacker playbook tools. At number eight, we have Black Hat Python, Python programming for hackers and pen testers. Justin Seeds is the author of this book. As you know Python is a very strong programming language and it comes to great use when creating powerful and effective hacking tools. Python is the chosen language by many security professionals across the world and many exploit frameworks are written in Python. In this book you will go through the darker side of Python's capabilities like infecting virtual machines, writing network sniffers, creating trojans, etc. This book covers some networking fundamentals, interesting network tooling, web applications, Windows privilege escalation tricks and more. This book as the author says is a fun read. Moving on at number 9 we have the Web Application Hackers Handbook: Finding and Exploiting Security Flaw. It is written by David Stuttard and Marcus Pinto. This new edition focuses on updated web applications exposing them to attacks and executing fraudulent transactions. This web application hackers handbook is updated to speak about the latest step-by-step methods for attacking and defending the large range of ever-evolving web applications. It also discusses new remoting frameworks, HTML5, UI redress, and hybrid file attacks to name a few. It looks into attacking authentication, attacking the application server, finding vulnerabilities in source code, etc. If you have already mastered the first edition, you can focus on new concepts in this one. Now let's head to our last book on our list. At ten, we have Web Security Testing Cookbook: Systematic Techniques to Find Problems Fast. The author of this book is Paco Hope and Ben Walter. Security testing is quite often a neglected one when it comes to the tests performed on web applications, but it is a very crucial one. This book teaches you how to check for the most common web security issues. It also acquaints you with installing and configuring free and good security testing tools. You will also understand how your application communicates with users and this book will help you build tests pinpointed at Ajax functions and help you automate the tests. With the knowledge of this book and the free tools used here, you can defend your site. So those were the top 10 books for ethical hacking. Now that you had a look at the books, let's move on and see how Simply Learn can help you become an ethical hacker. Simply Learn provides a certified ethical hacker CH version 10 course. 
This CS certification training course provides you hands-on training that will help you master the techniques used to penetrate network systems and defend your system against it. Simply Learn's ethical hacking course is aligned with the latest CH version 10 by EC Council. Here you will learn about trojans, backdoors and countermeasures, IDS firewalls and honeypots, advanced hacking concepts, network packet analysis, mobile and web technologies and advanced log management. This course content includes an introduction to ethical hacking, penetration testing and ethical hacking concepts. It also speaks about SQL injection, IoT hacking and cryptography to name a few. There are no prerequisites to take up this certification training course. In this video, we will run you through the top 20 ethical hacking interview questions based on concepts like networking, software and programming, operating system and applications, cyber attacks and cryptography. So, let's get started. But before we begin, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to never miss an update from Simply Learn. Let's start off with question one. What is a firewall? Now, this is a very good question and normally a very basic answer that I've ever heard is that a firewall is a hardware and a software firewall. But that's the functionality of a firewall. That is what how we can install a firewall. But there are different types of firewalls and there is a specific functionality that a firewall is created for. Right. So a firewall is either a hardware or software, but its responsibility is for blocking either incoming or outgoing traffic from the internet to your computer. They secure a network. So essentially, the firewall will allow a connection to happen or disallow a connection to happen. It won't go beyond that. That's the basic functionality of a firewall. Okay, so based on the configurations that you have done, based on the rules that you have created on the firewall, it will then, based on those rules, identify whether some traffic is allowed in that network or some traffic is to be blocked from entering that network. So as the screen shows, the firewall rules will analyze whether the traffic is good. If yes, it will allow. If the traffic is bad, it will block the traffic and not allow that connection from happening in the first place. Now, there are a few common types of firewalls that also need to be included in the answer to this question. And the first one is a packet filtering firewall. These are the most common types that you will come across, which analyze packets and lets them pass through only if they match an established security rule set. Now here people do get confused when we say that we analyze packets. People think that these firewalls will analyze the contents of that packet, which is not correct. When a definition for a packet filtering firewall says that these firewalls analyze packets, it means that they are only analyzing the source and destination IP addresses, port numbers and the protocols that are mentioned in those packets. These firewalls do not have the cap capability of deep packet inspection or a DPI as it is known. If that capability comes into the picture, you're basically looking at an intrusion detection system or an intrusion prevention system in today's world called as a next gen firewall. Okay, so a packet filtering firewall essentially will only analyze data packets for its source and destination IP addresses, port numbers and the protocol that is being utilized. It will then map that information to the rules that are there on the firewall. And based on those rules, it will either allow that connection to happen or disallow that connection from happening. The second type of is a proxy firewall. These firewalls filter network traffic at the application level. So when you say application level, they work at the layer 7 of the OSI model. Packet filtering firewalls, since we have mentioned that they work on IP addressing and port numbers, will work on the network layer of the OSI model. Also on the transport layer because they also look at protocols. Proxy firewalls will work at layer 7, which is the uh, application layer of the OSI model and will deal with application level protocols such as HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, SMTP and so on and so forth. And the third one is a stateful multi-layer inspection firewall. Uh, these filter packets at the network, transport and application layers. So they basically do the job of the first and the second type of firewalls. The packets are compared to known uh, trusted packets. But now the first question is if there is a uh, stateful multi-layer inspection firewall, why do we have type 1 and type 2 firewalls like packet filtering and proxy, proxy firewalls. That is because that is how the firewalls have evolved. We started off with the packet filtering, then we added functionality to it and so on and so forth. So if a question comes, what is a firewall? You start off with the option saying it is a hardware or software. This is the responsibility. The functionality of a firewall is to allow good traffic and disallow bad traffic based on the rules that have been configured on the firewall. 
and then you've got basically three types of firewalls packet filtering proxy and stateful multi-layer and just include a brief description of each of these firewalls so that's question one moving on to the question two what is a vpn vpn is also called a virtual private network it is a connection between a vpn server and a vpn client so it basically creates an encrypted tunnel between the client and the VPN server, which is then utilized to secure the connections that you're making with the internet. So as you can see in the diagram, the user has a VPN client installed on their machine. The VPN client then creates an encrypted tunnel to the VPN server. And through this tunnel, encrypted data is transmitted, which can then be processed by the VPN server uh, sent to the internet, information can, received, be, can be received back by the VPN server, the VPN server will encrypt that data back and send it back to the user. So if there is a man in the middle attack that is happening or a hacker trying to eavesdrop on the communication mechanism, they will not be able to do so because of the encrypted tunnel. It is very difficult to decrypt this or hack through this encrypted tunnel. It, the, it is possible, but it is very difficult to achieve that. Then question number three, how do you keep a computer secure? Now, this is going to be a very generic question. So you want to put your best foot forward and you want to identify the most common methodologies on how you can keep a computer secure. So when we talk about computers, the first thing that you want to talk about is authentication mechanisms where you want multi-factor authentication or two-way authentication to ensure that your accounts are kept secured. Now, if you look at using passwords, depending on how passwords are being stored by the application, uh, password attacks can be possible, either a brute force attack or a dictionary based attack uh, or even password guessing attacks are possible. To mitigate those kind of attacks, you, we need multi-factor authentication to ensure that accounts are kept secure. Now, even if we are using multi-factor authentication, we also want to look at secure passwords, which means that the password is complex enough to withstand most of the common attacks. and a brute force attack or a dictionary attack is just not possible. So we want to randomize our passwords. We want to create a complexity where a password meets standards such as uh, meet has at least one lowercase, one uppercase character, has numerics and special characters and is randomized as not based on a dictionary word, doesn't contain usernames, email addresses, phone numbers or anything that is personal to that particular user. Third, keep regular updates, which means that there will be patches that will be released for the application, for the software that you're utilizing, download the patches, install them on a regular basis to ensure that you are secured against the most recent attacks that have been identified. Install a good antivirus, could be a internet security suite, which will have an antivirus, an intrusion detection system, a firewall, uh, and will help you protect yourself against ransomwares, malwares, and any script based attacks. Also have a specialized firewall on your system, could be a host based firewall or a network based firewall to ensure that uh, attacks are kept at a minimum and you have your network definitions in place to allow or disallow connections from happening to your devices. Have anti phishing softwares installed as well to ensure that you are not getting any spam mails. Even if you do, you're able to identify that and not fall prey or victim to those spam mails. Phishing attacks are generic where they are directed towards individuals uh, and they prey on the gullibility of that particular individual. So our Nigerian frauds or the lotteries that we win on a regular basis of hundreds of million dollars, uh, those messages, the emails that we receive, they are all phishing emails where uh, they're basically prone to victimize the user and then rob them of money or uh, install some malware or do some other malicious activity. If you want to enhance encryption about data that you have stored on your devices or on your uh, or that is accessed by your software or being transmitted by your software, use encryption. Encrypt your data whether it is at rest, whether it is in motion or whether it is at use, thus reducing data leakage and data loss uh, possibilities. And finally, in the foremost, secure your DNS. DNS is the domain name server, which is utilized by computers to resolve domain names to IP addresses. If a DNS poisoning attack is possible, where your DNS settings have been modified by an attacker and you're redirected to a malicious DNS server, 
that server is going to redirect you to another malicious application which may have a malware or a malicious software as a payload. Also, you don't want people to know your DNS servers and the queries that you're making. So you want to use secure DNS or uh, DNS over HTTPS to encrypt your DNS queries as well. So in a nutshell, if you follow these eight steps, your devices, your computers, your applications are going to be as secure as possible. Moving on to the question number four, what are the different sources of malware? Now, malware stands for malicious software, right? Malware is basically a software that poses as a legitimate software, but has a payload of a Trojan, virus, spyware, keylogger, or some malicious software that is going to have a negative impact on security of your particular device. So the question here is, what are the different sources of malware? We want to identify the most common sources through which malwares infect end-user devices in today's world. And you can start with pop-up ads. So most of the websites, if you're visiting untrusted sites, if you're being redirected to sites that you don't know about, there'll be a lot of pop-ups coming your way where it says you're the one millionth visitor to this site. Please click here to download your gift. Or it will say, uh, congratulations on winning a particular uh, product for visiting this page and so on and so forth. There are some instances where you can see a banner which is flashing at you on top of the page and says that there are eight uh, infections that have been identified on your computer. Click here to download an antivirus to clean the infections. So all of these pop-ups are there as a social engineering attack, as a phishing attack to make gullible people click on those links and download those malwares. Now the software that is posing as a security software itself can be a malicious software which is going to install a Trojan or a virus or a bot on your machine compromising the security of that machine. The second is removable media, USBs. And humans have a fascination with USBs. So if you find a USB lying around, it's a free USB, you get excited about it and you want to take it home, you want to plug it into a machine and see what's on the USB. Worst case scenario, you format it and you've got a free USB to utilize. Higher the capacity, the better. But that is one of the most easiest way people use malwares to, uh, uh, to be deployed on unsuspecting users. If there is a USB lying around, why would, why would somebody want to forget a USB? It's most likely planted over there as a social engineering attack so that a gullible person is going to pick it up plug it into their device. If the device is not secured enough, it is going to install the malware, right? Uh, then documents and executable files. This is where your viruses and uh, all those creeps in. So let's say you're surfing on the internet, you're looking for a software uh, and you find the software on a particular website. You do not verify the trustworthiness of that site and you just download and install that software. Now that software could be uh, malware as well. Thus, if you're surfing on the internet, you're downloading files from different locations, you have to research the website, you have to research the source to ensure that it is trustworthy and only then are you going to download and execute those files. Thus, internet downloads as well. And when we say internet downloads, it's not just untrustworthy sites. We go to torrents, uh, we go to uh, dark, the dark web or the deep web and we are searching for other softwares, especially uh, those who are researching security, right? We always want, we are always on the lookout of new softwares and we are always on those forums which may not be so much trustworthy and we just download those files and start installing them. That is a very bad scenario, right? So you have to be very careful what you are downloading from the internet, your antiviruses, your uh, anti-phishing uh, mechanisms, your threat intelligence mechanisms, uh, have those uh, mechanisms uh, installed and you want to uh, verify uh, where your downloads are coming from. Then your network connections. If it is a P2P connection, it is a local area network connection or a metropolitan area network. You have to verify whom, which devices are connected to your machines and you have to validate those connections before you want to trust those devices uh, and before you connect to them. If you are on a public Wi-Fi, you probably don't want to connect to a public Wi-Fi in the first place. Then comes email attachments. There are so many attachments that come across in today's world, most of them in a zip format or a RAR format. Uh, some of them come as document files where there are macros hidden within them. Macros are scripts that are recognized by Microsoft Office files, right? And then finally, there are these malicious advertisements that we uh, find online. 
right? Uh, let it be Facebook, let it be WhatsApp, let it be uh, any social media platform that you go or even your uh, search engines. Their job is to display ads. Their job is not to verify whether the ad is legit or not. It is for us as consumers to be careful and validate that ad and verify whether it is a genuine ad or not. So just don't start clicking on uh, any of the ad trusting uh, the uh, platform that you're on. Be, uh, be sure that you are investigating that ad. So these are the most common sources of malware. And the end user will always get infected by one of these mechanisms. Then moving on to question number five. How does email work? Now, this is a very, uh, can be a complex question, uh, but we have to keep it as simple as possible. And we have to identify that there are uh, two servers, where, uh, both of them either using SMTP, uh, where, which is a, a simple message transfer protocol, where uh, in this scenario, John wants to send an email. Thus, they've got an email client installed on their machine, which is connected to the mail exchange server which has a DNS server, which maps the routing and uh, which maps the exchange server and inboxes. So when John composes that message and clicks on send, John should be connected to a mail exchange server where the email is sent through that particular person's inbox. So, so John's inbox will then uh, be validated and that email will then be sent through the DNS server, uh, through the internet and will be received by the recipient mail server. So at this point in time, John also requires the recipient's email address. So in this case, this is Jack. So Jack at something.com would be uh, the email address. So while John is composing, uh, the to field will have Jack's email address. The from field will have John's email address. The subject field will have uh, whatever they want to convey as a message. The message body will have the message itself. And then when uh, John clicks on send, it will go to their exchange server. The exchange server will then validate the inbox and identify where that inbox is located for Jack. And then through the internet, it will be sent to the e uh, to the mail server of Jack. The mail server will then identify the proper inbox that it uh, that that email needs to be sent to, and it will store that email in that particular inbox. When Jack opens their computer and accesses their inbox, this email from John will be already waiting for them and they can respond to it the same way John had sent that email. Moving on to question number six, what is black box and white box testing? So when you are testing a software or you're testing your infrastructure, there are two different tests that you can conduct. The first one is a black box. The second one is a white box. In a black box test, there is no knowledge that is shared with the tester. So let's say you're an ethical hacker and you have been awarded a contract by an organization to test their current application that they have developed. Now, they are not going to give you any information. They are not going to tell you what the application is. They just probably give you an IP address and a port number where the application is hosted. And now you have to fire in your own queries and try to figure out what the application is, try to gather information, see what, uh, what information can be gathered in the first place. And based on that, you're going to figure out your way, identify vulnerabilities, and see if any of those vulnerabilities can lead to a security incident. So without any knowledge, zero knowledge of the IT infrastructure or the source code, that's a black box attack or a black box test. A white box test, on the other hand, is where full knowledge of the IT infrastructure or the source code is shared. So the ethical hacker has complete knowledge. And based on the knowledge, they are then going to test out the system to see if there are any flaws that they can identify, right? So why would these two audits be important? Because the first one, a black box audit, emulates the attack of a outsider, a external hacker sitting outside the organization trying to figure their way in. Whereas a white box attack can emulate the attack of an insider. So a disgruntled employee within that organization misusing their access controls or the access rights to make uh, unvalidated profits, right? So somebody who's corrupt, who has been bribed, who wants to sell out company secrets base. Uh, so they're going to try to find out vulnerabilities, try to steal data and try to sell it on the uh, gray market, right? So a white box would emulate an uh, internal attack. A black box would emulate an external attack. The next question is, 
what are the steps involved in hacking a server or a network so this is more of an ethical hacking question you're looking at devices and for uh, and the interviewer asks you uh, what kind of steps are involved what are the activities that you would do in hacking a server or a network now there are no specific steps that you would define because every hack is going to be unique but it has a, a hack can be classified in five different steps which are quite generic right so the first step will always always be the reconnaissance step also known as information gathering phase also known as footprinting or fingerprinting uh, depending on what exactly you're doing but in this phase the attacker gathers all the evidence all the information that is possible about the targets that they want to attack so here you're trying to get to know the victim so you can launch specific attacks towards them you want to identify what operating system they are utilizing what ip addresses mac addresses the versions of the operating systems and applications the patch levels find out vulnerabilities find out whatever information is possible find out the information about the uh, person who's using those computers so you can launch social engineering attacks and so on and so forth so the first step is all about gathering enough information based on which you can launch further attacks once you have that information comes the second phase which is known as the scanning phase this is more of a technical phase so you have uh, in the first step you've got your ip addresses domain names maybe even network maps and you have identified which devices are available now in the scanning phase you're going to identify live devices and then you're going to scan them for open ports processes protocols services you're going to identify vulnerabilities you're going to enumerate them to identify more information from them thus at this point in time you will have identified a certain set of vulnerabilities or a certain set of security loopholes that you can misuse once you have identified those you are going to the next step which is the gaining access step in this you are actually going to execute your attacks based on the vulnerabilities that you have found and you are either going to gain access to that particular system by installing a trojan or destroy the system by installing a virus or install a spyware or a keylogger whatever you wanted to achieve so in the gaining access phase you would have based on the knowledge that you have gained in the first and the second phase you are going to launch your attacks and you are going to try to gain access to that particular device then the next step is where you're going to maintain that access now that you have hacked into that device it is not necessary that you will always be able to get access to that device uh, suppose you have cracked the password of that particular user and the user changes that password after a few days your attack is worthless so what you're going to do here is you're going to maintain your access so this is where it is assumed that you want repeated access to that device and thus you're going to install a keylogger or a trojan or some mechanism which will still allow you to get access to that device without the knowledge or the authorization of that particular user and finally the last step is where you are going to cover your tracks so whatever activity that you have done so far will have created logs and will have created information based on which the victim will come to know that they have been compromised and may be able to trace that activity back to you so to prevent the user or the victim from realizing that they have been hacked and to prevent them to discover who has hacked them you want to cover your tracks by deleting logs and any references that point to that particular activity you are going to hide the files that you have created so you have installed a trojan or a keylogger these will create files and directories you are going to hide them so that they are not discovered you are going to hide processes that have been created you are going to try to hide all the activity that you have done so that to conceal the actual attack and preventing the user from realizing that they have been compromised so these are the five steps that will be involved in hacking a server network application or any computing device you will come across the next question refers to so what are the various sniffing tools now this is a network based attack where you are trying to capture uh, data packets that that are being transmitted over the network and then you are going to analyze them to see if you can capture any sensitive information like usernames passwords bank details or any anything of that sort now these tools will also depend on which operating system you are utilizing for example msn sniffer would work on microsoft uh, uh, operating systems etercab would be uh, based on linux and so on and so forth so on the screen you will see six different sniffing tools that work on different operating systems wireshark is uh, uh, something that is common both on windows and linux 
Uh, it is used to analyze network in detail. It is the de facto tool that you will come across in most of your ethical hacking trainings, in most of your organizations when they want to do uh, data captures. Now, data capturing or packet capturing is not only done by hackers to gather more information, but it is also a known troubleshooting technique used by administrators and net network administrators to analyze any issues that may be going on in the network, right? So well, the first tool you see on the screen is Wireshark, like we stated, is available for Windows, Linux uh, as well. Then there is TCP dump, which uh, again has the same capability of Wireshark, but is a command line version, whereas Wireshark also has a GUI, a graphical user interface. TCP dump is available on Linux. MSN sniffer, it's a very old tool. Uh, when we had MSN Messengers, uh, MSN Messenger is no longer there, but Microsoft does or did have a Microsoft Message Analyzer tool, uh, which they have stopped development since 2015. Uh, but that's another tool that is specific for Microsoft operating systems from Microsoft that can be installed to gather more information. Then you've got Etercap, which is a tool to launch man in the middle attacks, data capturing, and is, is essentially a, a Linux command line based tool. Then dsniff is another password and network capturing tool which can help you capture data packets prominently a Linux uh, tool. Same with Eterape. This is a graphical tool which will allow you to uh, capture data, data traffic and map protocols and identify which IP addresses have been communicating with what. Essentially all of the tools have similar functionality except that uh, some have additional functionality like launching man in the middle attacks or uh, capturing or having specific filters that will help you identify and troubleshoot some network issues that you may be facing. Question 9. What is SQL injection? SQL stands for a structured query language, which is a language that is used by most of your databases or your relational databases. Uh, the, the variations of your database would be MySQL, Microsoft SQL, Oracle SQL, you'll have IBM databases, all of these databases utilize the structured query languages to interact with the applications. Now, all of these databases have their own syntax, so you'll have to study most of these databases based on which applications and which databases you want to provide security for. But as the name suggests, SQL injection vulnerability or a structured query language injection vulnerability is where a user can maliciously inject a SQL input or a SQL statement in a query and send it to the database and evoke a response response out of it. So this vulnerability is not specifically to the database. It uh, the vulnerability lies more in the application and the coding of that application. So when the application receives a query which it needs to be forwarded to the SQL uh, database, we need to configure at the application level of what queries are allowed and what queries are not allowed. So there are different various aspects of how to manage a SQL injection vulnerability. But the basic flaw lies in the application where uh, invalidated input is accepted and sent forward to the database where the database might confuse it into an executable statement and thus create a response that was not warranted. There are various types of SQL injections uh, as shown on the screen in band SQL injection where you can look at an error based or a union based injection, a blind SQL injection where it is either Boolean based or a time based attack and then an out of bound SQL injection. Essentially, you're looking at databases and you're looking at application security uh, where you want to encourage secure coding practices. So in unvalidated input is mitigated. The next question is what is spoofing? Now in spoofing, you're basically assuming the identity of another person. So here the attacker pretends to be some other person or an organization and sends you an email that appears to be a legitimate email. It looks almost genuine. It has been constructed to replicate what a genuine email would have been. And it is very difficult to spot a, a fake one. There are different ways to identify whether an email is genuine or not. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Moving on to the next question, what is a distributed denial of service attack or a DDoS attack? Now, generally a denial of service attack is an attack where 
legitimate users are prevented access to the resources that they legitimately can access, right? So, for example, if it is a bandwidth-based attack, the attacker consumes the bandwidth of the network in such a way that there is no more bandwidth left for legitimate users to access the network. Now, a single device may not be able to generate that much amount of uh, traffic to consume the bandwidth of a huge server. Thus, the attacker will construct a botnet and through that botnet, they will launch a distributed denial of service attack to the target victim, right? So a botnet, uh, there are two uh, terms that we want to look at over here. The first term is a bot and the second one being the botnet itself. Bot is a software that once installed on a victim's machine allows the hacker to uh, send remote commands to that machine that will make it do uh, generate some activity. Once we have enough machines uh, on which such bots have been implemented, the collection of these machines would be known as a botnet. So an attacker would then instruct this entire botnet to start generating data traffic to be uh, to be sent to the targeted network or to the targeted server, which will then bog down the server, thus crashing it and preventing users from accessing that particular resource. The next question is how to avoid ARP poisoning or ARP. Now, first let's understand what ARP is. ARP stands for Address Resolution Protocol, which is a protocol used by computers to communicate over the network. Once your computer boots up, it starts a discovery process of identifying its neighbors. So if I'm in a particular subnet, my machine will proactively send out ARP requests and address resolution protocol to find out which other machines are within the same network and which are live. Once it sends out a query, a live machine will respond to that query along with its MAC address. This information is then stored in what is known as an ARP table or an ARP table on the machine's cache. So whenever my machine now wants to send out a packet to this particular machine, it will go to the ARP table, it will identify the IP address and the associated MAC address. It will print that onto the data packet as a destination uh, IP and destination MAC and send that uh, packet across to the switch. The switch will then identify the MAC address and uh, send the packet to the relevant machine that is connected to that particular switch. Now to confuse the switch, into sending it to a different machine, the R poisoning attack is created. This attack is generally launched to create a man in the middle attack. Now, to prevent this R poisoning from happening in the first place, there are three different aspects that we can utilize. First, we can use packet filtering, which will filter, filter out and block packets that are the same source address data. So you have identified some malicious IP addresses and you want to block out some IP addresses. So you're using a packet filter firewall where you have instructed the firewall to filter out certain packets originating from particular range of IP addresses. This firewall and this technique will then block those kind of packets coming in. Second, keeping away from trust relationships. Organizations will develop protocols that do not depend on trust relationships and thus you want to keep this protocol away from there. Once you have created a trust relationship, uh, these machines should not be sending out ARP requests to other machines in the first place. Since uh, the trust relationship has been, has been defined and these machines know whom to communicate with, such kind of protocols should then be disabled. Or you can use an ARP spoofing software. So there are some there are softwares out there that will look for ARP spoofing and prevent that from happening in the first place. So if somebody has sent out a spoofed ARP packet, that packet will be picked up by this software and it will be mitigated. Uh, network visualizers like Glasswire, antiviruses like Sophos, uh, they have inbuilt capabilities of identifying uh, ARP, uh, ARP spoofing attacks and mitigate them in the first place. In the next question, we are going to discuss what is ransomware. Now, ransomware is a type of malware that blocks victims to access personal files and demands ransom to regain access. There are three categories. Before we go into the categories, let's just revisit what ransomware is. Let's start with the word malware. Malware is a malicious software that poses as a legitimate software, but has a payload that will have a security impact on your machine. So in this instance, uh, viruses, Trojans, 
all of these can be classified under malware so can ransomware a trojan is a software that will give you a backdoor access to a uh, to a particular device a virus will do some destructive activity on that device a ransomware will basically encrypt the data of that particular user from on that particular machine thus rendering that my uh, that data inaccessible to the users themselves and in turn will demand a ransom to provide access to that particular data so the three types of ransomware the first one is scareware which uses social, social engineering to cause anxiety or the perception of a threat to manipulate users into buying unwanted software so this preys on the gullibility of humans where you can uh, see a pop up appearing on your screen which can scare you into believing that you may have been attacked or there is a virus on your machine and then instructs you to download a particular software to mitigate that particular virus now the malware will be in this software that you will be downloading and then a ransomware will be installed and your data will be encrypted screen lockers uh, where locking users computers by preventing them from logging in and displaying an official looking message you will see a screen saver once you boot up which prevents you from accessing the login page so it will not allow you to log into your own machine but it will give you a warning that your data has been encrypted and you need to connect to a particular email address and send bit send bitcoins over there uh, to get a decryption key to access your own data and then the encrypting so ransomware displays a message demanding payment in return for the private asymmetric key which is needed to de decrypt the symmetric keys for encrypted file so once your files have been encrypted you might just have a blank screen in front of you where you'll receive a warning message uh, where it instructs you to pay up a ransom in bitcoins or in some cryptocurrency to some particular digital e wallet which is not traceable and once you make that payment they will send you the decryption key and then you can access your data then talking about the uh, next question what is the difference between an active and a passive cyber attack now when we talk about cyber attacks cyber attack is a uh, activity that is caused by a malicious user who wants to try to get access or do some security incidents on the victim's devices so there are two ways that can happen it's either in an active manner or a passive manner in an active manner the intruder attempts to disrupt a network's normalcy modifies data and tries to alter the system's resources so this is more active where the attacker will proactively uh, try to destroy the network so that communications fail or they might try to modify the data where uh, we're using a ransom where they can encrypt it or they might delete that data using a virus or steal that data using a trojan or they might even alter the data uh, so that it is no longer trustworthy whereas in a passive attack the intruder intercepts data traveling through a network here the intruder eavesdrops but does not modify the message so they're just listening in they're just uh, observing what is going on they are not manipulating the data they are not stealing anything it's just that they are monitoring the activity that's going on then the next question what is a social engineering attack now social engineering attack is a people based attack the victim here is the human by itself the vulnerability also lies in the human it may be executed through a computer but end of the day the gullibility is of the human so it is the art of manipulating people so that they end up giving up confidential information now we always read in the papers where somebody got manipulated their passwords got hacked and somebody's life savings got wiped out right because they shared the otp with someone or they shared up uh, the password with someone now creating a scenario where these people will fall prey to this attack and share this kind of personal information to unknown people that is where the social engineering attack comes in creating that scenario which will ensure that these people give out this confidential information now there are three categories in this attack well, the first one is a phishing attack second is a spear phishing attack and a third is a veiling attack now phishing attack is basically a generic attack it is targeted to the uh, world at large whoever falls prey to that attack will be a victim whereas a spear phishing attack is a targeted attack towards a specific individual or a group of individuals or towards an organization so there is a lot more research that goes into spear phishing where you analyze the victim you try to figure out what their vulnerabilities are and you tailor make or you customize the attack to that particular vulnerability once you have that attack you launch it against those people those people will then fall prey to this attack and a veiling attack is where you're attacking 
uh, top level executives so the c level executives of an organization politicians movie stars wealthy and powerful people uh, so any of these people when they're attacked it will be known as a wailing attack next question what is man in the middle attack now this is something that we had touched base when we talked about arp where the arp poisoning attack needs to be executed to leverage a man in the middle attack now in the man in the middle attack the attacker attacking computer takes the ip address of the client unaware of this the server continues to communicate with the attacker now if you remember uh, in a previous question we have also talked about spoofing so in this scenario uh, attacker has spoofed their ip address to replicate themselves as a genuine client and now with that spoofing in mind they might either through a r poisoning attack or just because of the spoofed ip address become a man in the middle that means that they are now eavesdropping on the conversation between the actual client and the server by posing themselves as a server. In this scenario, the attacker is now a go between between the client and the server and can eavesdrop and can copy the data. If they want, they can modify the data as well. So as you, as you can see on the screen, the attacker becomes man in the middle, which means that they are now eavesdropping on the conversation that is happening between the client and the server. The next question, who are black hat hackers and white hat hackers? The main thing is the differentiation between a black hat hacker and a white hat hacker. Now a black hat hackers are skilled individuals who illegally hack into a system. The motive behind such an attack is mostly for monetary gain. These individuals are known, also known as security crackers. Now if you look at your criminal hackers, those who have malicious intent, those who do hacking for the intent of personal gain, or for the ma a matter of disruption. The main thing that black hat hackers lack is authorization. They are not authorized to do the activity that they are about to do, and they're going to get unauthorized access to devices or to data, which is going to cause losses to the organization involved. Whereas on the other side, a white hat hacker are, are also known as ethical hackers. These are the individuals who discover vulnerabilities in a computer network and they help the organizations mitigate these vulnerabilities. They help the organizations defend themselves from black hat hackers. So the main difference between these two types of hackers, a black hat and a white hat, is the intent and the authorization. So black hat hackers will have malicious intent. They will try to personally gain from that attack from by finding out vulnerabilities. They also will not have authorization to conduct whatever activity they are doing. Whereas on the other side, white hat hackers will be hired by organizations. They will be provide authorization for certain activity that the white hat hacker can do to find out those vulnerabilities. Once those vulnerabilities have been find out, found out by the white hat hacker, they will report it to the management and guide them in implementing security controls to mitigate those vulnerabilities. The main difference between a black hat and a white hat is the authorization and the intent. The next question, what are honeypots? Now honeypots are a very interesting device that can be introduced in a network. Uh, these basically are decoy servers that are implemented in a network to attract the attention of an attacker. It is there to lure an attacker uh, into uh, attacking that particular device, thus creating a security blanket, blanket for the rest of the devices. So if an attacker has been able to bypass a firewall and is now trying to scan a particular network, when they scan, they will come across various devices that are there in the network. They will then proceed to do a vulnerability scan on these devices. The honeypot at that point in time will provide as an, uh, or prove as an attraction to these attackers because it will demonstrate some vulnerabilities to the hacker, which will divert their attention. So these vulnerabilities are simulated on these devices. These actually do not exist. But the moment the attacker then starts interacting with the honeypot, the honeypot will identify that as a malicious traffic and will warn the, warn the administrator about a possible attack that is going on. The administrator will then investigate through the honeypot of what activity is going on and then reconfigure their security controls to block the attacker or mitigate the attack itself. Right. So it is more of a decoy server uh, that will showcase or simulate some vulnerabilities to an attacker, thus to lure them and safeguard the rest of the network. Moving on to the next question, define cryptography, encryption and decryption. Now cryptography is used by security professionals to scramble data 
into non-readable format, uh, which is used in securing that information. So it involves converting data from a readable format into a non-readable format and then reversing it back to readable format again. For example, the word computer is now scrambled into looking like an unreadable format. Now, if you look at this word that it has been scrambled into, it would be very difficult for a human to figure out what the actual word was. Now, in this scenario, we have taken an algorithm where we have made a shift of the alphabet where we have added two alphabets the current one so c plus 2 becomes e o plus 2 becomes q m plus 2 becomes o so we have done a shift of two and thus the key over here for this algorithm is the alphabet plus two so any person who figures that out will be able to unscramble this and convert this back into readable text the fact of scrambling a readable text data into something that is unreadable by using a particular key is what cryptography is all about. Now, as we discussed, the decryption again is uh, replacing the alphabet and taking it further back by two characters. So E minus two becomes C, Q minus two becomes O, O minus two becomes M and so on and so forth. So anybody who knows this key, uh, the shift key, anybody will able to decrypt this particular character. So this depends on the user. If I want to utilize alphabet plus five, then the spacing, the shifting of that character will be the fifth character from that particular character and so on and so forth. And now the last question, what is the difference between ciphertext and clear text? Ciphertext refers to the text which is encrypted and totally undecipherable. The message received after decryption is known as clear text this text is comprehensible. So the word computer is clear text. That means that it has not been treated to any cryptographic measures. It does what it is intended to be. However, if the moment we encrypt it, that means we scramble it into unreadable text by using any of the algorithms that we'll be looking at, that text is known as a cipher text. And without the key, this becomes unreadable. The clear text as discussed is the plain word that we have utilized. We are using the English language in this instance. So the plain word computer is the clear text. Once we add the encryption layer to it, uh, we get the cipher text to it. Hope you all enjoyed learning about ethical hackers and the lucrative profession. If there are any queries based on this topic, feel free to let us know in the comment section below and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Subscribe to our channel for more informative videos like this and thank you for watching. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.